The House Committee on uh, Health Care Reform will come to order. Uh, please call the roll. Hayden? Here. Stinnett? Here. Lewis? Present. Boggs? Buckeye Courtway? Here. Vogel? Here. Craig? Here. Keithley? Nixon Clark? Present. Boucher? Present. Seitz? Here. Thomas? Here. Tolson Reich? Here. Unsicker. Okay, 11 present. We have a quorum. Of course, for hearings, we don't need a quorum. Uh, just a little decorum for what we're going to hear today. We're going to hear uh, two bills simultaneously. They contain, one is actually contained in the other, has potential. So we're going to hear 271. And Benny, your other bill is 320. Is that correct? I've got it right in front of me. 330. We're going to hear them. Uh, we'll have both representatives come up and present their bills. We will take testimony on those two bills. Uh, floor rules, uh, none of us want to be here to sunrise, okay? And anything after probably two and a half, two, two and a half hours, nobody's listening anyway. So we would make every effort to be fair, have equal representation. Uh, we're going to have the, the presenters give theirs first. Then we will have key fax people from each side will have three to five minutes then we're going to go to two minute testimonies and i know some of you are doing it a long way i don't want to uh not have you if you're if you're in the middle of a lot of facts that we don't have you may get leeway on that if not i'll probably have to gavel you out and uh the committee i ask them to be respectful ask serious questions, and also we're trying to get, I feel like Solomon when they split the baby, you know, uh, except there's not one mother, there's a whole bunch of mothers in this deal and not just one. So we're trying to get at the best facts we can get at. Uh, those of us on the committee appreciate facts, brevity, and when you, if someone has given testimony that you already coincide with or you support, Please say, I agree, I'm in support of the bill, I'm opposed to the bill, and if somebody's covered those facts, we probably don't need to have more discussion. Again, I'd like for this hearing to be facts-centered, and I know there's a lot of emotion I've, based on the emails I'm getting and the committee got. I think we'd all agree, that, but we need to be very facts-centered and try to get to as much information for the members of the committee as we can get as to what is occurring in these issues. Okay. Uh, roughly how many are going to testify in favor of the two, uh, Representative Riley and Representative Cooks, the first two bills are going to, how many in favor? Somebody count for me. All right. And this, this is on. 329, right? No, 271. All right. Yeah. All right. Good. Because I had another list that had a lot more than that on. So there's 10. All right. I guess we need to check in overflow how many is going to testify for and against. All right. How many are, are going to op uh, oppose uh, 271 and 330? How many? Two? All right. All right, we're going to alternate back and forth, and again, try to keep it as close on time as we can keep it. I think back and forth is the fairest so that we don't remember one side or the other longer than, than when we get through. Okay, uh, with that, let's, uh, let's start. Representative Riley, you want to present your bill, then we have Benny, uh, Representative Cook present his, and then... Uh, then we'll start the alternating. And we, after Representative Riley presents, we will ask him questions. And we are presenting because many of you are aware, uh, as we try to put possibly put bills together this time, we need, to, we need some type of understanding of bills that have similarity. And that's why we're hearing these two together. So Representative Riley. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Alex Riley. I'm the state representative from the 134th District, which covers parts of Southwest Springfield, the city of Battlefield, and Greene County. Thank you for allowing me to present House Bill 271 to you this evening. This is the Regulatory Reduction Act for APRNs. At a high level, this bill is designed to improve access to care and reduce the cost of care for patients in our state. I think those are two items that all of us in the legislature are extremely focused on, and, um, and, and this is a, a, a possible tool in the toolbox that we have to do that. The way the bill does this is, um, broadly speaking, it, it removes a series of government-imposed regulations on a number of medical providers in our, in our state, and these are um, APRNs, Advanced Practice Registered Nurses. These are folks who have a great deal of training, and they are able, they are trained to do a lot more things than the state of Missouri currently allows them to do. The way the bill operates is it removes a series of regulations that prohibit APRNs from practicing to the full extent of their training. Um, and, and just briefly, the, the items that it removes are it, it uh, allows the State Board of Nursing to provide APRNs in Missouri a state license to practice versus a document of recognition. And we've got a number of folks here who actually practice, and, and they'll be able to tell you why they think that is important. Um, Importantly, it also removes a series of artificial and outdated barriers to practice, and a number of these were waived during the COVID uh, emergency a couple years ago. Um, and what we found out when those rules were waived is there were no reports of abuses um, and, and, and the system functioned well. A couple of these things that were waived that would help our, uh, our APRNs practice more to their full ability would include removing mileage restrictions. So right now, they're required to be within 75 miles of a supervising physician um, and remove some, some chart review requirements as well where the law cur currently requires physicians to conduct chart reviews on occasion. Um, and these are all things that the APRN say uh, inhibits their ability to practice fully and, and provide more care and um, opportunities to care for their patients. And then finally, um, it would allow APRNs to practice to their full extent of their education and training by removing a requirement for a collaborative practice arrangement with a physician. And you'll hear a lot about collaborative practice agreements from from the medical providers themselves on all sides of this issue. Um, but this, is, uh, this is, has been a big barrier to our APRNs being able to practice to their full abilities. Um, there's a clear trend in the country right now going in the direction of House Bill 271 and opening up the scope of practice for um, for APRNs. And if you haven't seen it yet, I'm sure there probably will be something coming around at some point that will show you the number of states that now have full, um, full scope of practice for APRNs. And this isn't a red state issue. This isn't a blue state issue. You, you can look at the map, but you'll see you have West Coast states like Washington and Oregon that have gone in the direction that we're trying to go with House Bill 271. You've got almost all of the New England states that have gone in this direction, as well as a number of states surrounding Missouri, like Iowa and Kansas. And what we've seen in those states is there's, no been, there's not been any data suggesting that you're seeing um, increased harm to patients. There, there hasn't been any data showing um, any harm for that matter. And one of the things that I've been especially interested in over the past couple years before I decided to carry this bill was, you know, we'll hear, we'll hear a lot of testimony today saying that this is going to harm patients and it's going to put patients in danger if we open up scope of practice for APRNs. And I've been asking for specific numbers, specific data for years now that show that this will harm patients. And I will say, if I saw those numbers, I would not have carried this bill. I would have had no interest in doing that. But I haven't. None of those numbers have been provided to me 
for over the years now and and I, I i i my only conclusion is is it's because they they don't exist so um as as you're hearing the testimony from all sides um i, I would keep that in mind and also um, it, I think it would be good for the committee to try and get those numbers so we can actually look and see if there is proof of harm to patients. Um, with that, I could comment on a number of other things, but I suppose that's enough for now. I know we've got a lot of people that want to talk. So I'll open myself up to questions here in a moment. Um, but I, I would also note, I'll be able to comment on some things, but I know that we have a lot of medical providers here on both sides of the issue who will be able to dive into the technicalities of why these things really matter to them on both sides. So um, again, happy to answer any questions, but on those more technical pieces, uh, I'll probably ask you to ask some of those to the medical providers themselves because they'll be able to give you a better, more full answer. Okay, questions? Representative Sykes. Yes, thank you. To inquire? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, hopefully this is not a too technical question, but are our AR, APRNs traditionally supervised by an attending physician or do they by and large operate independently of that physician? So right now they are required to have some degree of supervision. Um, and, and the idea here is they are trained to do a lot more things than we currently allow them to do under state law, um, and, and we would like to remove some of those supervisory requirements. Okay, and are nurse practitioners considered APRNs? They are. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you, Representative. Yes, Representative Einziger. Thank you, Mr. Chair, to inquire. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a couple questions. Um, first of all, there's a lot of different medical providers. I looked through this bill and noticed, let's see, there's APRNs, physicians assistants, assistant physicians, registered professional nurses, and licensed practical nurses. Um, do you know the difference in these categories? And if not, I hope somebody else will explain. I am sure somebody can walk through those, but I, I, uh, I could give you a, a rough summary of my understanding, but... There's probably someone who can articulate it much better. Yeah, I would like to know the difference between those categories and what the educational yeah. and um, practical requirements are for Absolutely. Um, and then does your bill address anything about revoking a license? Uh, I don't think it does. For example, if somebody is convicted of a felony, um, you know, can we revoke their license? That would be something to yeah. look at. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Other questions? Representative Thomas. To inquire, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, do you know in the uh, current law where it makes any limitations on um, APRNs practicing to the full extent of their license, their, their training, their expertise, their education? Um, wh where is that language that's limiting them and what are you replacing that with? Yeah, so I, I think the language that at least the APRNs feel limits them is the language in front of you today, especially the collaborative practice piece. Um, and and I, I think that there would be some people here who would be able to speak to what it, exactly in there they think limits them to do certain things. And, and I'll defer to them because I wouldn't want to put words in their mouth. So uh, again, we'll definitely talk more about that. But so to the best of your understanding, it's not a matter of particular uh, skills or practices or techniques that they're not allowed to do. It's just the fact that they require supervision. I mean, I th again, I th that's I th your understanding? I think, I think that's a piece of it, but again, I don't want to put words in their mouth. Okay, because I think that needs clarification, because I don't know that there's anything that actually limits the skills and abilities, um, but within a network of provider supervision, um, which is the collaborative practice arrangement. But okay, thank you. I'll ask uh, another individual. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Other questions? If not, I, I have a couple. Uh, you are an attorney, correct? Correct. You are a licensed attorney. Correct. Uh, let's look at what's good for the goose is good for the gander. What if we took and that we could read law again and practice law without a license? without or with a license but not a law license but similar how would you feel about that bill uh 
So to be honest, I would actually be in support of a lot of rules and changes along those lines as well. So I, I, I appreciate where you're going with that line of inquiry, but... Well, let's um, ask an, another specific thing in relation to law. Would you be opposed to removing the Missouri plan for Supreme Court justices in, where the bar only gives certain numbers of members to the governor? Are you, would you be opposed to limiting that? I have a lot of concerns with the Missouri court plan okay. and would like I, there to be some significant I, reforms made. I, I'm, wanting to, I'm wanting to get a standard. We have, as a legislature, we have bills on allowing uh, physical therapists more leeway. We have bills allowing ortho, uh, uh, chiropractors to do work on horses without a veterinarian present. We have all kinds of bills that are eliminating what we have historically under worked under as practice acts. And my question is, your intention or you think that'd be all right for any of those to be challenged in that way? Well, I think... Every, by the way, when I ask those questions, these aren't choosing a side. I'm just trying to get a perspective of yeah, where you're coming and I, from. Yeah, and I appreciate that. And I think every category should be debated on its own merits. I think in some respects, in some areas, it, it makes sense. And I think in others, it probably doesn't. So, you know, I, uh, for me, I've looked at the data coming in from around the country, and I and 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 it seems pretty clear on on the proper direction to go here. And, and for that reason, I'm supporting and have filed this bill to expand scope of practice for APRNs. But but, you know, some of those other bills you mentioned I like probably better than others, and some I may not be as excited about. Um, but I think each one of those bills should rise and fall on their own merits. I don't think we can lump them all in together in one category. How do uh, – what type of research have you done on data, either research that's been presented to you or other research as you looked at this that you have personally looked at in preparation for this? Uh, and their question, here's the question. In the last week, as a committee, we have got substantial data. Is reams fair for the committee? We have reams of data that appears to be contradictory. Yeah. And one of the things I hope to get out of this committee hearing is, is data, is it subjective, is it objective, or is it hard studies of here is data and where it's presented from? And so in your research getting ready for this, what data have you looked at and from what sources to lead you to believe that there has been, there's no difference in outcomes? Uh, so I would say I've probably seen all the same data that has been presented to this committee over the past few weeks. Um, I, I sat on a committee called Professional Registration in the past two years where these bills have gone through previously. So as a committee member, I listened to the arguments on all sides, um, looked at all the data presented as a member of the committee analyzing the, these bills, and then as I was uh, looking and considering whether to file it myself, looked at that again, and including data from all sides. I, I've, I reached out to the folks opposing this bill to let them know, hey, I'm looking at filing this. I'd be interested in, in visiting with you about that, asked for information, asked for data, reviewed what they provided. Um, so I, I, can, I can compile a list and provide it to you at some point if you would like, but it is, it is voluminous and probably the same reams of data that you all on this committee have been inundated with over the past few weeks. And our committee historically is short, but they have been very good on studying what's presented to them. Yep. I don't know if any of us could have studied all of the data that's been presented to us on this one because it has been huge. So, uh, th thank you. Other questions? Yes. Representative Tennant. To inquire. Go ahead. Do you know if APRNs are currently able to serve as a primary care provider? I don't know that I do know the answer to that question. Some, I'm sure somebody else can probably yeah. answer that. I think that's um, an important distinction. I also wanted to ask you a couple questions just on a couple points. On page 25, you have some mark out related to certified registered nurse anesthetists. Is that... So the only um, portion of this bill that deals with the... CR, CRNA piece is dealing with that allowing the State Board of Nursing to provide 
the state license versus a document of recognition. Um, nothing else in this bill addresses the CRNA okay. aspect of it, uh, and that's not my intent. I think there's another bill you'll be hearing here shortly that's the CRNA piece. Okay. And then on, on page 32, there's a reference to section 335.176, which we talked earlier, actually references to page 50. Um, in that, we're talking about the ability to prescribe drugs, and there's no, there's, there's mention of obtaining a reliable medical history, physical exam, dialogue with the patient, um, would you be open to adding something where they're required to at least attempt to provide or, or find out if there are other providers who have previously been prescribing medications, basically a consultation with any other providers? Yeah, I'd be happy to take a look at that. I think, okay. I think this bill is very much a, a work in prog progress, and I'm open to discussions over any sure. aspect of it. Sure. Um. And then my only other questions on page 42, uh, line 28, says the Board of Nursing may grant a certificate of controlled substance prescriptive authority. Is that something they're already doing for this? I'm sorry, Representative, would you repeat the yeah. page number? 42, line 28. Okay. Are they on the spot now? Could you re-ask the yeah, question? Yeah, absolutely. Thank so you. are they so the Board of Nursing may grant a certificate of controlled substance prescriptive authority for APRNs. Is that something they're already doing or is this new? Completely uh, new to the Board of Nursing? My, my belief is this would be new, but I'm gonna have someone clarify okay. behind me who knows better than I do on that sure. item. And if no one knows, I will find you an answer. Sounds good. Thank you. Other questions? If not, I yes, please, Doctor or Representative Thomas. Uh, yes, to inquire, please. Uh, there, there has been a tremendous amount of, of information brought forth, and uh, just some of those bits of data do contradict, as uh, uh, Chairman Hayden was saying, uh, the information you're testifying to that there's not a difference, or um, that that well. Let me explain. Um, are you aware that in states where there's been an expansion of scope of practice, and I'm just going to read you the numbers here, it's easier, um, that x-ray ordering has increased 441% among non-physicians. Uh, non-physicians needed two times the number of biopsies to screen for skin cancer. Uh, patients were 15 times more likely to receive an antibiotic uh, for an infection that was viral that didn't need an antibiotic if it was a non-physician prescriber. 6.3% um, of nurse practitioners prescribed opiates uh, to over half of their patients uh, compared to only 1.3% of physicians. Um, um, one of the leading ACOs, accountable care organizations, um, that used non-physician primary care providers showed that they have an increase of $43 per month in their average cost, which translates over time to a $10.3 million uh, difference in annual spending. So nurse practitioners are actually, and non-physicians are causing higher cost of, of care, um, ordering more tests, prescribing inappropriately in some cases. Um, I, I certainly would vehemently disagree that there's not data out there. And have, have you come across any of these statistics? Uh, I, I was looking at the page you were holding there, and it looked like something mm -hmm. I had seen before. Okay. Yeah. So uh, again, I I I think this is one of those items where you have uh, folks on both sides that have an opinion on it, and I think that's one of the values of this hearing is you're going to be able to hear from all the, all sides and inquire and and form your own conclusions based on the data and facts and information provided. Other okay. questions? Thank you. Yes, Representative Nixon. Fire. Go ahead. Um, so you've heard uh, or sponsored this bill in previous committee, correct? This is my first year sponsoring it. I've, I've heard it before as a member of the committee, but, but the prior representative who had worked on this issue is no longer in the House, so I, I picked it up. Okay. And with all the information and uh, data that we received, um, we 
have received emails on top of emails. And so uh, you stated that you are, in fact, um, an attorney, correct? Correct. Okay. And I just want to know what's your inspiration for this bill to pass this particular bill uh, without the data or without the knowledge of being able to answer any of the questions that have been asked? So I think my inspiration for trying to work on this bill is... I'm trying to work to improve access to care in the state, um, reduce cost where I where we can, and you're going to hear a lot of information that is going to back up the position that this will do that. And I've found that evidence to be compelling, and and I've brought this bill forward because I found it to be compelling. But um, again, I'm not going. I'm not going to tell you what you should do. I think you should listen to everybody and come to your own conclusions, and then and then vote based on the way you think the facts and data show you. Other questions? I. Oh, Representative Lewis, I'm not ignoring you, just out of my field of vision. I'm sorry. But... <laughs> to inquire. Go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. Or Good evening. Afternoon. Or whatever. Almost evening. Um, thank you for, for being here today. Um, I just, I just um, want to point out all the data that we've been presented. Um, I was looking at what you were we're, give, we're referencing, and then some other outcomes. I think also there's one in favor of um, this bill that you're sponsoring that we have received that has footnotes um, that, that references that the outcomes have been positive in the 26 other states who have uh, adopted similar language. So when we look at um, information that's given to us, I think we should also, you know, look and make sure that, you know, it's been referenced and it's not just like someone saying, you know, the sky is falling or something. So anyway, um, just I appreciate you bringing this bill forward. Uh, you obviously know I support it because I did uh, co-sponsor it. So thank you so much. Thank you, Representative. Further questions? If not, we're going to use a rule of one with questioning from the, from the members, but I'm going to break that because I'm the chairman, okay? So... <laughs> Because you're a, because you're an attorney, do you do any malpractice law? I do. I've actually done um, quite a bit of medical malpractice defense, so def defending doctors, nurses, hospitals when they get sued. That was where I um, where I started. The first three years of my practice was almost devoted fully to that. And my first um, my first most of my first trials were defending doctors in medical malpractice lawsuits. Good. I have a question. If we take as I as I see it, what your bill basically does is that we'll have three groups of people who practice in Missouri. We'll have MDs, DOs, and nurse practitioners. Am I correct in that understanding your bill, in essence, presents that position? I think that's a, a fairly accurate All right. representation. If you have that in your experience, because you are you have experience, what will happen with malpractice insurance? Most some are covered by the hospitals they work for. Some are covered. Uh, several have told me they have their own malpractice. Uh, some are covered by the doctors they work for. Yeah. What's going to happen to malpractice insurance in this case? Now, some have told me their their insurance for Kansas is cheaper than Missouri, and I would contend that Missouri is a much more litigious state. That is correct. And if people come to Missouri to sue because we have better juries for settlement, correct? That is also correct. All right. So what's going to happen to our malpractice insurance for nurse practitioners if they practice basically without physician authority in the in the situation? I don't know the answer to this. I'm 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 I want to know what you think. Yeah. Uh, no one is, has come to me and told me that they think that this would increase the cost of malpractice insurance. If if people do think that, I'd certainly like to know. Um, but but I, I appreciate the question. I, I think that all that we're doing in this bill is is removing some government restrictions that are in place. There there wouldn't be anything that we're doing here that would prohibit a hospital, for example 
to require a collaborative practice agreement. For example, if, if Cox Hospital or Mercy Hospital, where I'm from in Springfield, wanted to require collaborative practice or have some of these restrictions in place, they could still do that. So if they felt that if, if you have providers, for example, from, from Cox Hospital, which uh, t is, is self-insured, you know, if, if they think, well, that'd be a bad example. Let me go with Mercy Hospital. You know, if, if, if Mercy feels like this would be a situation where not requiring collaborative practice could potentially escalate their uh, malpractice insurance, they could still require anyone that falls under that mercy umbrella to still have collaborative practice. All we're doing with this bill is requiring, or it would be eliminating the state-imposed regulations. So Washington University in St. Louis could still have something. Uh, you know, any, any medical facility group, whatever, in the state could still impose that on itself all we're doing with this bill is eliminating the, the government mandated, the state mandated requirement. Okay. Thank you. Representative Courtway, Buckeye Courtway. To inquire? Go ahead. Thank you. So my question is if we would allow a nurse practitioner to be able to do the same thing as a doctor, why would anyone want to go to become a doctor? Because I'm assuming they have to go to more years of schooling, more expensive costs for them. What would be um, what would be an incentive for someone to go be a doctor versus a nurse practitioner? Well, I, I think there's a few pieces to that. Um, I, I don't think the the bill says that they can do all the same things as a doctor. I think what it says is they can do the things that they are trained to do. So there there would still be a number of things that I, I don't think that they could that they could do. You know, I don't think you're going to have nurse practitioners running around doing brain surgery on people. I don't think we're going to see that. Um, but I still think that it, it is it's a, it is still a different job. Even if you we allow them to do all the things that in their years of training they are trained to do, you're still going to have people who um, will want the increased earning potential that some that some MDs have that various APRNs don't have. I, I think there's a number of things that would encourage people to still um, go on to medical school. I, I don't know, I, and, and looking at the numbers, and, and if someone knows and can correct me, I'm, I certainly welcome them, them to do so. But I don't think you're seeing situations in Washington and Oregon and New York State and Massachusetts and a lot of these places that have extremely well-regarded medical institutions of people saying, well, I'm not going to go to medical school. I'm just going to go be an NP instead. I don't think we see that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Further questions? If not, uh, I think we're going to move to Representative Cook. He's going to explain his bill, which is, has some similarities, and uh, we're moving that progress. Representative Cook, you're, you're on the show. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, committee. Uh, appreciate you hearing this, uh, this simple bill. Uh, this is House Bill 330, the APRN licensure component, which is in Representative Riley's bill already. So you've already, you already have this in front of you. It's very... Uh, again, I'm just going to say it is simple. Really, it is. Um, APRNs uh, get a document of recognition from the Board of Nursing permitting them to practice. Uh, this is a simple paper change uh, from a document of recognition to a license. Uh, it's very basic. I could try to answer a few questions, but we have several folks behind us that want to get up here and, and talk to you. So I, I feel it would be great to have them come up here and go through uh, uh, both of these pieces of legislation and give you additional knowledge on the subject. Okay. Representative Fogel. Just to clarify, the entirety of your bill is in Representative Riley's bill. There's nothing different. No, mine is in his bill already. Okay. Okay. Other questions? If not, uh, I don't see any, am I missing anybody? If not, we're going to proceed and let's have the first pro Position. And I think this is a position that brings uh, some data and expertise, as I understand from the election, from the deal. Please fill out your your uh, testimony forms. Tell us who you are, what you represent, and a little bit about your experience. So, my name is 
Is your is your mic on? I don't know. I may be there. Yeah, I think you, it is. You may okay. have to speak into it. Okay. My name is Lila Pennington. I am a family, a board certified family and gerontologic nurse practitioner. I have two certifications. I have been practicing in the state of Missouri as a nurse practitioner since 1977. I have, I practiced for 19 and a half years in uh, public health where I uh, did clinics that physicians hardly ever, if ever, came to. Um, we did, I did both baby clinics, I did family planning clinics, women's health clinics, um, prenatal clinics, um, and uh, uh, STD clinics. So uh, I had that experience. Then I also uh, taught uh, for 20 years, um, or 21 years, at the uh, MU Sinclair School of Nursing, where I, uh, for the last several of those years, coordinated the family nurse practitioner pro uh, area of study. So I'm very familiar with the education that advanced practice nurses have to go through. Um, I just want to hit a few highlights. I have submitted written testimony, which goes into more detail, but I have uh, some highlights that I want to no, because I know your time is short, and I want to be respectful of that. Um, I know you'll be presented with more information on this, but there is a severe primary care provider shortage in Missouri, especially in rural counties. Uh, the current restrictions that we have, having to be within a 75-mile radius of the physician we collaborate with, uh, and numerous others, um, inhibit our ability to actually go and help answer those access problems in those counties. Uh, that currently don't have primary care. There's been some question about do nurse practitioners go into rural counties? And uh, there is a study from John Hopkins, a, a School of Public Health and Economics, that, sh that looked at nine states before they had, bef while they had a collaborative practice agreement and then looked at the same nine states after the collaborative practice agreement requirement was removed. Their percentage of nurse practitioners that went to rural areas increased substantially. Um, so we are willing to go into underserved areas. And all of my clinical practice has been in underserved, with underserved populations. So actually, I've been here before the law and since the, the law requiring a collaborative practice agreement has been in place. We had access issues when the law was pa passed. Since that time, the access to primary care in Missouri has decreased. It hasn't gotten better. It's gotten worse. And part of that is because of the requirement of the collaborative practice agreement, which inhibits APRNs from doing what they can do. Health outcomes. Currently, we rank, depending on the study uh, which source you look at, we rank anywhere from 42nd to 43rd in health, general health outcomes as a state. That means there aren't that many states that rank below us. And if you look at that list, all the states that rank, rank below us are restrictive, like Missouri. They're all the 26 states that, have, that do not require collaborative practice all have better health outcomes than in Missouri. Um, there are, so there are 40 years, there's over 40, about 50 years of research on nurse practitioners and other APRNs and the quality of care that they give. And they have found, I, in fact, you were asking about research, I have a eight page annotated bibliography and that's only a few of the studies. Some of those studies are, okay. Uh, so anyway, we have, um, yes, so we can improve, and we can improve the Medicare uh, access to Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries. We, have, we can decrease hospitalizations and re-hospitalization. That's according to a study that I participated in. Uh, the Missouri, as far as cost, the Missouri Foundation for Health indicates that fully utilizing APRNs, such as NPs, would result in substantial health care savings of $1.6 billion over 10 years. So we're not talking with more uh, study that has been done on that. I think one thing that rarely gets mentioned is that physicians receive pay for collaborating. Most physicians receive extra pay for collaborating with nurse practitioners, and that increases the cost of health care. 
Finally, I'd like to address our education. We are not educated as physicians. We are educated at the highest level of nursing practice, advanced practice nursing. We are nurses. Do we do some of the same things physicians do? Yes. But that has been the way throughout history. At one time, only nurses provided, the nurses were the first people to provide anesthesia. So it doesn't, that's not unusual. APRNs have to be a registered nurse first. So they have to have their RN education from which they, from day one, they're in clinical, uh, uh, they're in, uh, in cl do clinicals from day one. And on top of that RN education, then we add the APRN education on top of that. And so by the time that the APRN comes into her, uh, pre her uh, educational program, she's got years of experience as a nursing student and as a registered nurse. Uh, so medical students are not required to have any uh, experience prior to coming into medical school. They don't have to have any health care experience. They may have, some do, but they are not required to. Uh, our six to eight years of education, depending on whether we're masters or doctorally prepared, is, uh, compares favorably with optometrists, optom uh, pharmacists, dentists, and lawyers. And all of those practice without a collaborative practice agreement with a different profession. We talk, you talk, you mentioned paralegals and legal and, and lawyers. A better, paralegals don't have nearly the education of an advanced practice nurse. An advanced practice nurse's years of education actually get closer to a lawyers. And if you want to look at a better comparison, look at optometrists who do, who, uh, do a lot of the things that an ophthalmologist does, but they practice Separately, they do not require, they are not required to have a collaborative practice agreement with an ophthalmologist. They will, if a patient needs, uh, in fact, you, your, your eye doctor may have been an optometrist all your life, uh, an optometrist all your life, if, unless you had an eye disease or required surgery, and that, re that requires an ophthalmologist. We're a separate profession from physicians. We are not the same as physicians. You mentioned controlled substances. The information, for, currently we can uh, prescribe controlled substances, but the amount that we can prescribe and what we can prescribe is limited, and it has to be written into the collaborative practice agreement. And if the physician doesn't want to write it in there, then we can't. Now, I heard what some of the data you had, but if you look at the, nurse, the, the National Practitioner Database, which looks at complaints against physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, uh, PAs, a wide variety of healthcare professions. Complaints against nurses are minimal on narcotics. Uh, probably, and, and most of the studies actually show that we prescribe fewer narcotics, probably because as nurses, we have been taught many ways to relieve a patient's pain that doesn't, that, without using medication. Uh, so, I just, you know, that was one question that came up I wanted to answer. Um, we do not want to practice as physicians. There are many things we don't do or don't plan to do that a physician does. We won't be practicing surgery. Uh, we specialize the minute we get into our APRN program. And uh, so I can't go beyond the scope. I, I have to say with the population of family. Uh, and that's a primary care specialty. Yes. So, I have uh, more information. If you mind asking questions, I'm done. Questions? Uh, Representative Seitz. Thank you. To inquire? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, changing the mileage piece and residency requirement seems like a no-brainer because we're doing that with other occupations such as policing so that we can get qualified people into those areas and they may not actually live there with, say, in a 75-mile radius. Do you think Missourians would be better served if we change the mileage requirement like this bill is trying to do? I don't think um, this bill would remove any mileage because it would remove collaborative practice, mandated collaborative practice agreements. I don't think it would help because some physicians don't want to be 75 miles away from somebody that they supervise. If they don't want to be 75 miles away, they aren't going to want to be 200 miles away. 
So I don't see how that's going to change things in a rural area. Okay, thank you. Representative Keithley. To inquire. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I, I, I have a, I guess I'm, I'm interested in exploring how these contracts work. It sounds like you've been involved with collaborative practice for a while. Um, I'm assuming that then you're familiar with the, the contractual requirements, obligations, yes. how these work. Yes. And uh, some of the things, I guess I'll probably have some follow-ups too with it, but I guess just a place to start with it is is. How are these contracts formed in? Do, do, does a nurse practitioner approach a physician? Is it the other way around? And, uh, at, and, and how is payment received? Is it a per patient? Is it a per work done by the doctor? It and what do these contracts look yeah. like generally? That depends on where the nurse practitioner is working. Uh, if the nurse practitioner is working within a system of clinics that a hospital owns, the hospital will... Um, negotiate the collaborative practice agreements. They'll find the physicians to practice with the collaborative practice nurses, and they will pay them substantially, a substantial amount to collaborate with uh, nurse practitioners or advanced practice nurses. Uh, if um, I know in the past, I've heard from some uh, APRNs who, had, who owned their own clinics, and their collaborate, collaborator might charge them up to thirty to $40,000 a year just to sign that collaborative practice agreement so they could operate a clinic in an underserved area. So when, so, so is that, that's, that's, is that, that, that's like a, a, a flat fee that gets paid out. It's not rated per patient. Do they take no. into account what the practice is like? I think, um, I think volume, it, anything yeah. like that. How much work? I, I assume in collaboration that, that depends. That's it's different to, with every say, physician. Yeah, that's going to depend on, on every physician. The collaborative practices I've been in, um, in the health department, most of the physicians, because we saw patient, patients who couldn't pay, and uh, th most of the physicians did not charge uh, much, if anything, for that. But then they didn't do much of anything either. They reviewed, they didn't, the public health um, has an exemption in the collaborative practice agreement, and the physicians don't have to review as many charts. They don't have to be present at the clinic at any time. Um, so they're responsibility is a great deal less. And the, uh, as a nurse practitioner of public health clinic, uh, I was a very independent, except I could only prescribe certain medications depending on my collaborative practice agreement. Um, I have been taught, and I taught my students, to, to um, how to prescribe medication appropriately. I taught the advanced pharmacology class at MU for several years. Um, and I taught... And in the advanced assessment class, I taught them how to do differential diagnosis and what to do with that differential diagnosis. So I, APRNs learn to do diagnosis and, uh, and learn to prescribe. And, uh, but in Missouri, we can't do that without a collaborative practice agreement. Whereas as in those 26 other states, they, do not rec they can prescribe medications and provide treatments that were within their scope of practice without a collaborative practice, a written collaborative practice agreement. So does does this? How does this change that collaboration? So in, in your practice, for example, you know how how you do it. What would this if if, if this bill were passed as is right now? This meant that in my uh, I'm I'm semi retired right now, and, I'm, and the job I currently have is uh, doing Medicare home assessments, which does not require collaborative practice agreement because I'm not prescribing. Uh, and I'm not diagnosing new diagnoses. Um, however, in my public health clinic, I saw a lot of patients who did not have a primary care physician or primary care nurse practitioner even. They had no one except the clinic there. And I caught, in, in my women's health clinic, I caught people with diabetes, with um, high blood pressure, and uh, with m numerous other health problems that had there been no requirement for had this bill been passed, I could have we could have expanded our hours in the public health department, and I could have provided care for those patients. Whereas what I had to do was I had to refer them to another clinic several miles away and hope that they went. So why did why 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 what was the point of that referral? Is that to get within a seventy five mile radius? No, it was to because in public health there was an exemption. Uh, the public health exemption requires only certain things be done in the clinic. So I couldn't do primary care. I could do women's health, which is a type of primary care. I could do I could do uh, birth control. I could do uh, uh, 
breast and cervical cancer screening, I could prescribe certain limited medications, but it had to be a public health considered service, uh, a population-based service. And primary care is not considered a population-based service. Therefore, I couldn't do that because my collaborating physician could not meet all the requirements of the collaborative practice agreement uh, because, uh, you know, he didn't have the time. And I'm, so public health kind of got, I could have done so much more for my patients in public health had I not had a collaborative practice agreement. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Representative Thomas. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm really confused. I thought you were saying just a few moments ago that it wasn't the collaborative practice arrangement that, that limited you, but it was being in the uh, health department yeah. that limited you, that you yeah. said if you hadn't been in the public health system, you could have done so much more, which has nothing to do with the collaborative no. practice arrangement. So please uh, educate me. Yeah. The difference is that the collaborative practice arrangement was much simpler in public health. Therefore, it limited what I could do in public health. I also practiced in a federally qualified health center, uh, doing primary care there, seeing anything that came in the door from a baby, four-week-old baby to a, a 90-year-old woman. I, I diagnosed everything from ehrlichiosis to pneumonia to uh, the common cold. Um, there, I had a more extensive collaborative practice agreement, and uh, but the physician was on that in that clinic. There was a physician on site. In many clinics, there can't be a physician on site. That's a problem. And and I'd, I'd like to follow up since since you're actually someone who was in the field and working back to the issue of malpractice coverage mm -hmm. because in a collaborative practice arrangement, you're not the person where the buck stops. It goes to your collaborator. So. I have a hard time understanding how if there was no collaborative practice arrangement anymore and the buck did stop at your desk, that your malpractice wouldn't suddenly jump dramatically because you suddenly become the deep pocket. There's no one to pass that off to. There and there are limits, the one million, three million, for example, that most people cover mm -hmm. at this point. Would your insurance jump to, to cover those mm -hmm. rates? No. That I pay insurance as a family nurse practitioner it doesn't matter where I'm practicing. Now, I, I, I can answer that question because uh, at a previous hearing on a similar bill, I was asked, you know, was malpractice insurance higher in the states, on the 26 states that allowed uh, full practice authority? No, it is not. I actually <clears throat> applied uh, to my malpractice, my own Missouri malpractice insurance company for uh, a spot in the District of Columbia, which has a very high population of, uh, of uh, uh, urban underserved population, as well as that's where all, of course, the senators and the representatives and, and are. Uh, they ha the District of Columbia is one of the full practice areas. It's 26 states plus the District of Columbia. My malpractice insurance in the District of Columbia, where I could have practiced without a malpractice, without a collaborative practice agreement, was actually have been less, about $500 a year less than it was in Missouri. So, and the other thing is, if you, uh, lawyers will sue whoever has contact with the patient. So not only will the physician have, get sued with a collaborative practice agreement, but I will be sued and anybody else that had co contact with that patient. Uh, I don't have a problem. I, I've not seen the malpractice uh, rates go up in the states to have full practice authority. It just hasn't. Well, as was mentioned earlier, Missouri is cherry-picked as very, very friendly to, uh, to defendants and, and for big and, jury awards. So it's very difficult to compare Missouri to, to another state because that's, again... That may, that, that may be, but surely out of 26 states and the District of Columbia, there'd be one other state that was as uh, litigious as Missouri. And the malpractice rates are, are not changed by state. I, not I'm for, not curious. For okay, and I, I'll, I'll take you at your word. I have some questions about that. Um, but back then also to education. Mm -hmm. um, in, in no way are nurse practitioners comparable to, to physicians. I mean, there's no residency. I mean, you have hundreds of hours of training, but there's thousands, up to ten and 20,000 hours of training for physicians. Um, again, the statistics I see are that 
upwards of 60% of nurse practitioner programs are either fully or significantly online. That's not hands-on. And the, uh, the, the pra uh, okay. practicum work is not necessarily with people that are part of the program. They're not necessarily uh, medical educators. There's not a standard of care there. So could you possibly address any of that? Yes, I can, because uh, there is a standard of care. Uh, nursing schools are accredited by two, there are two different accrediting organizations for schools of nursing. And uh, school nursing, uh, an APRM program is accredited by one of those two. They have standards. They have who can be preceptors, who cannot be preceptors, and how often uh, you need to meet with a preceptor. We would develop preceptor manuals for our preceptors. Uh, you know, a lot of physician training is not necessarily uh, done in the medical school where they are. I know medical students who have gone off to uh, train with a physician. I, the physician I practiced with in my uh, fairly qualified health center used to have medical students come in and follow him around and uh, get part of their clinical experience there. He wasn't on faculty anywhere. Uh, in fact, he sent, sometimes he would send them with me to see patients. Um, but uh, so, you know, the, but you're, you're trying to compare apples and oranges. We're addressing advanced practice nurses. And so, yes, we have, we have to keep contact with our preceptors. As a coordinator of a family nurse practitioner program, have we chosen to eliminate certain preceptors? We have. If we found that the preceptor was not doing what was appropriate or not giving appropriate care, and we did monitor that, then we no longer would send students to that preceptor. Most of our, uh, and then you're, when you're talking about all these thousands of hours, there's a couple of things there. Again, RN education has a lot of clinical hours. Plus, most nurse practitioners are practice as an RN. The person caring for you, if you're critical in an ICU, is an RN. There's not a physician standing over her shoulder all the time. You're under her care. That person is like, may decide to become a nurse practitioner. Then she needs more clinical hours, but she's already got hours and hours of clinical. And sometimes what's forgotten on, in the residencies, residencies do have a lot of clinical hours, but they also count the hours that they're on call, which means that sometimes the intern is in uh, the uh, intern's sleeping room, sleeping, and I know that from working at a hospital. Rarely from my own experience, but yeah, no, it would I, have been nice to get some shut eye. Didn't happen. Well, but. <laughs> maybe it didn't happen. Yeah, and sometimes that didn't happen, but it did happen. I in yeah in our where I was practicing in hospitals. So, all right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, to go back to the um, malpractice. You said that malpractice rates did not go up for uh, that. Advanced practice registered nurses in any of the states where they passed it? Not to my knowledge. Not to my knowledge. Okay. It has, I've, uh, I, tr um, I went online ex anticipating that question and tried to look that up last night. A lot of the studies that compared the states with uh, collaborative practice and states without collaborative practice uh, and their malpractice insurance rates uh, seemed to stop about the time the mm -hmm. pandemic <laughs> Yet. So, uh, but the studies prior to that did not show any, any rate differential much at all. The rate differential comes in what kind of a nurse practitioner you are. Uh, if you're uh, an acute care nurse practitioner, your rates might be higher. If you're a highly specialized dermatologic nurse practitioner, your rates might be higher. Uh, family, I'm a family nurse practitioner, so I know what the rates are for, for me. Um, um, yeah, and there was a mention that um, Missouri is a more litigious state, so that might cause rates to go up. Um, I did a search, actually, for litigious states, um, and I wonder if any of these places are um, in the list of places that have already expanded the scope of practice. Um, California? No, they have not. They have not. New York? They have. They have. Georgia? They have not. Um, it says, the Philadelphia Court of Common Pleas and the Pennsylvania Support Supreme Court. I don't believe, if Pennsylvania's, I don't think they have yet. Okay. What about Illinois? Illinois, you, 
you can transition into full practice in Illinois. Okay. And uh, in Illinois, uh, you have to spend so many hours in a collaborative, or so many hours or years in a collaborative practice prior to becoming full practice, but you can transition. Okay, so, and the rates there have not gone up to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay, those were the top five listed, so thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, so let's start with the, the malpractice question uh, because I'm, I'm a little... Uh, well, I want I want to thank everyone that came by my office today. I've learned a lot, and I've it's it's been a great experience. And I'm now out of water in my office. If anybody didn't come by my office, you're welcome to come by later. So, uh, no, I had a great time. Thank you all. So, the malpractice. So, mm -hmm. it's my understanding this law does not make nurses do a, a different job than they're doing now. So, why would malpractice be a problem? Exactly. There were. We would be doing the same thing we're doing now. We just wouldn't have to have a mandated agreement from another profession so, to do it. So just, just minus a phone call, is that, I mean, is that a the Boggs way of putting it, just, just minus the collaboration? So so with the phone call, so we're, we're uh, and, I, and I'm trying to understand. So so just I'm taking everything I've gleaned in, over the last couple weeks. And uh, so with, uh, I believe, to... to Keithley's question there as far as the uh he almost answered it but so let's just say I'm the doctor you're the nurse and and I say uh you got to pay me a hundred thousand dollars that I love that idea but you got to pay me a hundred thousand dollars to to give you permission to do what you do every day but you've got so you've got to have a doctor's signature or whatever you call it. So I'm the collaborator. So you have to call me. You get permission from me, and that's that's going to cost you a hundred thousand more dollars as a as a practice. Let's so say you have, you know, uh, a, a short amount of patients, and so let's just say that's a hundred dollars a patient. So you're not going to pay that. You're going to pass that on correctly. If so, I, I've not practiced, uh, I have not owned my own clinic, but yes, but, but you I mean, have as to, a business yes, person, I mean, isn't you, that how it works you, as a business? Yes, yes, and so that increases health I mean, It makes costs. sense to me because if you're going to take that loss, then you've got to look at your end and see if that's going to work in your budget or not. Exactly. Or, and, or, and it will increase the cost of health So me as a builder, whenever materials go up, I mm -hmm. the building costs more. Yeah. And the building we're talking about is the patient that yes. comes through our doors and, and they leave with the so care that they're looking that, for. That's one factor in the in, in increased costs. Anybody Sorry, is, it's got to bring buildings into it. Too, no. but, but, I mean, everybody's heard everything from farming and everything else, but we're, we're getting there. But, and, I, and I appreciate them bringing this forward because uh, I've learned so much. And, and, you know, I can't believe that some of these things exist, but in a rural area, so I think I need to lay the foundation. First of all, I'm in a rural area. I have people leaving my area going to Joplin Springfield because, you know, there's better jobs and I'm right in the middle of them. And it's it's not a huge deal because we can get there in 40 minutes, but we don't need to lose anything else. So so a pullback, but but for the malpractice side, if I understand it correctly, you're not getting permission to just do anything you want to do. You're going to do what you've done this with permission. Right. This bill would only give us permission to, if we, without, you know, to practice what we have been educated to, pra to do. It, nothing past that. So you, you know your limitations. You yes. know what you're able yes. to do. And you know what you've been doing. Right. And, and we refer to physicians all the time. I referred to cardiologists. I referred to dermatologists. I so, referred patients to, I, I referred to physicians all the time because I know what my, what, when something is beyond my limit. But if you're stumped, you you know, you know that you're going to reach out to some. You're yes. not just going to go. Let's see if because it's it's yeah. it's a loved one's life. It may be my loved one, yeah. but you're not doing something other than what you normally do. And I and that was what I wanted to clarify. So yes, in my thinking, pardon me if I'm wrong, the malpractice is going to be the same as it is today. It might be in the hands of someone different. I don't know about that, but it shouldn't raise. I mean, maybe it will at the beginning whenever people's figuring out. What, but once you learn, I mean, you know your limitations. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. I believe that answered my question. Other questions? I I do have one quick one in relation to malpractice. Yes. Uh, what Do you know what your limit is? What my you limit is? What's your limit? Is it a million, three millions? What's your limit? I believe it's... Um... 
I believe it's a, 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 million, a million per episode, up to six million per year. And that would determine the level you have, determine what the malpractice rate is. Yes. And the insurance I could, people. If I, that, yeah, that if I, I wanted to go for a lower malpractice rate, I could. You could go for a lower. Mm-hmm. Uh, insurance people I talk to say that, hey, the reason your rate is lower because you're either working in a collaborative or you're working for a hospital. And if you take that away as an insurance, their risk benefit ratio goes up and they would charge you a higher rate and that most of the physicians are at a uh, 3 million or higher rate. So when that happens, your insurance is going to go up to be at the same level of risk that he is. Does that make sense? That makes sense. But so far we haven't seen it in any of the states with full practice authority. All right. And, And again, my question is, and a lot of those nurse practitioners are not practicing with a collaborative practice agreement. And my, answer, my, my question is, with St. Louis particularly, where it is, people try to get into St. Louis jurisdiction because of what lawsuits are scheduled and, and at what rate. That is a question I have, different than some of your others. I mean, I think we're known nationally for our uh, settlements have been... Uh, that, that, that's, that's the question. So That's a right. Missouri problem. <laughs> uh, and your your testimony is... What percent of nurse practitioners training is online? Okay. The online the online component, because I taught both classroom and online. Uh, and I will tell you the difference. The difference was Can you give me a percentage? I, I no, because the didactic, the the book learning part was online. And the clinical is done with another Preferably another APRN. We, most schools require that most of their uh, uh, APRNs practice, uh, do clinical uh, hours with another APRN, although they can do it with a physician if they can't find an APRN to do it with. Um, so so how, of, how competitive is that? How competitive is that? Yeah, I mean, like competitive as compared to competitiveness for medical school, DO school, how competitive is that? To find a, a, find a collaborative practice? No, how competitive is your studies? In other words, are you graded on the curve? Are you graded on performance? Does we are, everybody pass? What, what's, how competitive is that? We are, uh, at the school where I taught, we were graded on a strict A, B, C, D scale. If you made a C in a clinical course, you had to repeat it. If you made a C more than once in a clinical course, you were gone. Okay, that was answering my question. All right, other questions? If not, thank you very much. Uh, the next person would be a, uh, an, a four uh, against who, is, who has a significant amount of data. Who might that be? Okay, give your name, sign the, the, uh, sign the roll, sign in, yep. and uh, tell us about your testimony. Thank you. I'm uh, Dr. George Haruza. I'm a dermatologist specializing in skin cancer treatment, former president of Missouri State Medical Association, St. Louis Metropolitan Medical Society, and the American Academy of Dermatology, and adjunct professor of dermatology at St. Louis University School of Medicine. So thank you for allowing me to testify on these three bills. Actually, two bills, I understand. Sorry. Um, So I'm testifying in opposition to those bills. I speak on behalf of the Missouri State Medical Association that represents thousands of physicians in Missouri in strong opposition to these bills. Patient safety of Missouri residents, your constituents, should be top of mind when considering changes to Missouri health care laws. Any proposed health care legislation should be assessed to whether it advances high quality, affordable, accessible health care for Missouri residents. These bills earn an F on all counts. Malcolm Gladwell estimates that it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert in a discipline. How do nurse practitioners and physicians compare? Nurse practitioners have two to three years of post-college education versus four years for physicians. Nurse practitioners have no residencies but 500 to 720 hours of preceptorships, while physicians have 12,000 to 16,000, that's for dermatologists, of direct patient care through residencies and fellowships. That's in addition to the previous two years during medical school where they have clinical uh, 
training as well. And even more concerning is that 60% of, as uh, Dr. Thomas mentioned, of nurse practitioner programs are 100% virtual. And then, the, then they do the 500 hours of clinical training outside that. And we all know the disaster virtual education had on our K-12 students. So do you want to have someone who has been virtual training, or learning, to be able to, 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 work, to work on you? Finally, physician training is multiple years of gradually increasing responsibility and independence with rigorous understanding of differential diagnosis in residencies accredited by the ACGB. A APRN tra clinical training is through mostly observational preceptorships with variable quality control. In medicine, such preceptorships were replaced by residencies almost 100 years ago due to the inadequate training preceptorship offered for independent practice. The evidence in practice is also compelling. In my specialty of dermatologists, nurse practitioners perform twice as many biopsies to find a skin cancer than a dermatologist. Nurse practitioners prescribe opioids to more patients than physicians, which is concerning at a time of the opioid crisis we are experiencing in Missouri. Really, we don't need to be prescribing more opioids. They order many more laboratory tests and imaging studies and prescribe more antibiotics than physicians. In the emergency room, patients treated by nurse practitioners without physician involvement have worse outcomes, especially for complex cases. This suggests that nurse practitioners are less certain of their clinical diagnosis, evaluation, treatment plan than physicians. Also, what about consumer protections? It's, I mean, liability insurance has been mentioned and bandied about, but it's really about protecting the patient. Where are the deep pockets going to be? Affordabilities. Th these issues of actually some uncertainty leads to significantly higher costs due to unnecessary tests to the healthcare system and to patients with many now having high deductible plans, so they have more out-of-pocket costs. Unnecessary tests also have negative consequences for patients. For example, unnecessary skin biopsies lead to more painful scars, risk of bleeding and infection. Studies in hospitals, emergency rooms, and accountable care organizations have demonstrated that nurse practitioners operating without physician involvement give rise to significantly higher health care costs. So do nurse practitioners improve access to uh, rural care? That is uh, proposed as, as being uh, useful, uh, would be very helpful. Actually, they do not. Nurse practitioners practice in exactly the same geographic areas as physicians, desirable suburban locations. 9% of nurse practitioners practice in rural areas, and only 2% 2 practice, 2 practice in federally qualified health centers. There is no causal link between independent practice and a mass migration of nurse practitioners to rural areas. This has not occurred in other states. An independent practice will not help to solve the access problem in underserved areas in Missouri. There are other ways to deal with So in conclusion, what do your constituents think about an independent nurse practice? 95% of patients say it is important for a physician to be involved in their diagnosis and treatment. Three quarters would wait longer and pay more to be treated by a physician. 91% say a physician's education and training are vital for optimal care. Nurse practitioners are very valuable members of the healthcare team. I have several in my practice, and a physician's led healthcare team is the high quality, cost effective care that our misery physicians deserve. Thank you so much. Did my five minutes, I think. I'm sorry. I, I'll, I'll try to give you when you're getting short. And, and, Thank uh, you. I, I'm sorry. All right. Uh, Representative Fogel. To inquire. Go ahead. Thank you. Can you walk me through in a typical collaborative practice agreement? And I don't know if this is de defined by the agreement, by statute, by something else. But at what point do you, as a doctor, review the charts of your nurse practitioner who's working underneath you. Can you walk me through the timeline of that process? So myself, I actually work with a physician assistant and I review all their charts, every single one. Nurse practitioner I work with, I review every single chart. So I'm maybe an outlier, but I feel it is really important for me to be involved because it is also my license on the line of course. when my nurse practitioner takes care of patients. Can, what is the requirement, though? Is it two weeks? Is it 30 days? I would imagine that's defined somewhere that 
the doctor has to review the charts within a certain timeline. Do you know what that timeline is? I do not. Okay. Because my question is a lot of the the concerns that you brought up are related to um, cost of healthcare, over, over ordering tests, and it just seems like a lot of the physicians I know maybe are reviewing those charts after the patient's already left, so they're already ordered whatever they were going to order anyway, so it doesn't really matter if the provider has a collaborative agreement or not because they've already made the choice of what they're going to do in that visit. The provider is not holding their hand in the time that they're in the exam room. Is that fair to say, or would you say that's well, off I, base? I would hope that uh, a collaborative agreement is not just a piece of paper. It is a setting where the physician is available to the nurse practitioner so that when she sees a patient that she has some questions, she's a little bit uncertain possibly, hasn't seen that before, she will contact her collaborating physician so that they can uh, have a kind of curbside consult and address the issue. So yeah. that is how you would reduce the and problem. I, I want all, all of us to be aware that there are male inpatient and level providers, and they're female doctors. We're all, uh, everyone in this room has used kind of gendered language, so I want to point that out. Um, so if someone, sub, a subsequent testifier, could explain that to me, I want to understand what that process looks like, because I know, you know, physicians oftentimes, or at least the physicians I know, aren't review, aren't even looking at that chart until two weeks after the visit, and if that's the case, I just don't think that your concerns will change one way or the other based on whether or not there's a collaborative practice agreement. So I would just like to understand that for someone who's coming up next. I totally agree. Thank you. My second question, um, what was the statistic you listed about FQHCs? Because that seemed really low to me. That only that 2%, 2 of nurse practitioners across the whole country. That is from the, uh, I actually have a packet here of uh, references that I have uh, for the, for everybody. Okay, I would to, love to, to look at that. That so number just seemed those. particularly low, yeah. um, just based on the FQHCs sure. I know in Missouri. So if someone has any counter evidence, I would like to hear that as well. Thank you. Questions? Representative Lewis. Inquire. Go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Um, I just um, had a question based on what the previous witness said and, and what you're, you're saying with your collaborative practice. So I think um, I was very intrigued by the, the financial, um, you know, to enter a, collaborate, a collaboration that it can cost like 30 to 40K or something. So, um, and then also, um, I guess from your experience, you, you work with um, nurse practitioners. What is your financial, like, agreement to collaborate with, with right. them? Well, what, what we have in our, in our practice is that the nurse practitioner gets a salary or, or, or a percentage of productivity if they are billing under, under their name, and the supervising physician usually gets a monthly stipend not related to their productivity one way or the other. I believe in our practice it's about $2,000 a month. Okay. And then is there... Um a financial incentive for like signing charts, you get additional money for chart reviews or no. Thank you. Further questions? Representative Seitz. Yes, to inquire. Go ahead. Yes. Um, I think you suggested that most nurse practitioners practice currently in a suburban setting. Do you think that it's because they practice in a more urban setting because of the restrictions that this bill is trying to alleviate. So really, if, if this bill passes and becomes law, wouldn't more nurse practitioners begin to practice in rural areas where there might not be the health care opportunities that we have in the larger cities? That's certainly not been the experience of states where nurse practitioners gained independent practice. I do have an example of Oregon is a state which has been looked at, and there's, it's going to be in, in this handout, which shows that physicians and nurse practitioners are exactly in the same locations before and after the law. So there hasn't been no movement of nurse practitioners to rural areas because of the independent practice that they gain. Okay. Have you ever practiced in a rural setting? I have not, but some, other, some of the physicians in my... Um, uh, practice of a single specialty dermatology practice do practice in a rural area in Illinois in Mount Vernon. Okay, thank you.
Representative Boggs. To inquire. Go ahead. So I just want to get something straight in my mind uh, because, you know, from the document you read, it sounds like that there's a lot more oversight. But whenever I think about collaborating, I think about someone being at one location and someone else being at another location. So let's just say, for instance, I'm the you're the doctor. I'm the collaborator. I call you. I've got the patient there and I'm telling you what I see. You're not seeing the patient, right? Uh, well, it depends on the setup you have. You certainly can nowadays. It's very easy to sure, see yeah. and, the patient. Sure, and, I, and I, I get that too. So, so yeah, that's that's maybe a piece and another question. But most of the time, if we're if if I'm if we're collaborating, you're making a decision based on what I present. Is that is that a correct assumption? That would be how it, and that's how it actually works when you're training in residency. You present you as a medical student or an intern president to the higher up person, the case. Yeah. And often that's actually done off-site as well. So so then there's, there's a trust built in between. So that person is really not doing anything above, I hate to use pay grade, but what, what they're trained for. So they're not, so you're not giving them permission to do something that they are not trained to do, correct? So if correct. I collaborated with you and said, hey, uh, I, I don't even know a situation, but say I've got training to hear, you can't give me permission to do here, correct? It's, I, I've still got my limitations. This law does not broaden my limitations, I guess is the way I should ask that question. As, as far as what you can do, something someone mentioned uh, doing brain surgery, and you yep. certainly, this law actually is silent on that. So, Just so this, like the medical practice law is silent on that. I'm a physician and surgeon, and uh, there is no restriction on what I do, so it will be the same for nurse practitioner. So it will be what they feel that they are able and ready to do. And so, and there is nothing saying that they can or cannot do dermatology or uh, obstetrics gynecology because the th law only says they're advanced nurse practitioner and the scope is, is whatever their training is and there is actually no restriction on it. So this uh, removes any kind of checks and balances. Okay, I think I'm confused. Sorry. Thank you, no. Chairman. Sorry. <laughs> Questions? Representative Courtway. To inquire. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, just a real quick question. In your practice, you said that you check all your charts of the nurse practitioner and um, the advanced uh, physician. So what is your percentage basically each day or week of how much you actually get to see patients on your own if you're always basically checking over everyone else's work? Well, so I, I spend, I do it, uh, 40 hours a week of uh, seeing patients and I do skin cancer surgery. And uh, at the end of the day, I review the charts. I review most all the charts that I dealt with and the nurse practitioners and the physician assistance chart that we have in the practice. It, it actually does not take a lot of time. The one benefit of some of these electronic records is that they are kind of formalized, very formalized, so you can very quickly get through to make sure that everything is okay. So if you work your normal 40 hours doing your patients in surgery, then roughly what is your amount of hours you put in total per week then with that extra? It's probably about five hours a week. Okay, thank you. Representative Keithley. To inquire. Go ahead. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and um, do you have any collaboration um, agreements or anything outside of anyone who's on location at, at your practice or your office? So I myself do not, and our other physicians all have their collaborating agreements with nurse practitioners in their setting. So, they, so we do not have off-site, so like the 75-mile type of thing. We do not have any of that. We uh, have everybody's on site, and they are most of the time directly supervised, really, because there's a physician there at all times. Okay, thank you, Representative Hunziker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you were talking about reviewing charts and how you can do it fairly quickly. And uh, what is 
the purpose of reviewing charts? Is to make sure that we don't have any 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 surprising outliers, because you know the dermatology is a very visual field, so we have mm -hmm. pictures in there. Mm. So I will I will look at the picture and make sure that the diagnosis matches, and then also look at the, if they have a diagnosis, if the treatment matches. Also, we generally do not have nurse practitioners seeing patients as a new patient, you usually see them as established patients. So they already have an established diagnosis. We do not have them actually do the original diagnosis. So, so you're making sure the treatment matches with the diagnosis that you gave them, the patient, is that right? Originally, and of course there can be changes because it's an established patient, sometimes new things come up. Of course. Um, and you review your own charts too. Uh, yes. Is it is the review the process the same for your chart as the nurse practitioner's chart? Mine may be a little faster because I saw the actually saw the patient, so I I remember the patient, and so I can that that that, that goes faster. So you look at it and say, "Yeah, it, I saw yes, the patient, it, and I put down what I thought I what I thought yes, was yes. at the time." Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Gregg. Inquire. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, so you said you do have some APRNs Correct. on site. Yes. Okay. How many do you have? Well, in my in my setting, I have one, mm -hmm. and then in our other upstairs in the same building, we have one now, and then in our Illinois office, we have two, and we have another Illinois office. We will be getting another one. So we have a total of about four or five. But different physicians are supervising those. Sure, sure, okay. Um, how often do you find errors in their recordings? Fortunately, the one the, the ones that I have had that have been with me for the world, my physician assistant has been with me for uh, seven years, mm -hmm. and I find those quite rarely. In the beginning, did you find many? But in the beginning, I found uh, find a lot more, and that's where we, that's where, the, in my mind, the collaboration comes in when we discuss cases and talk about how we might want to handle them differently and what uh, what would be a good way to to manage the case. Okay. And you and you said you've got about how many? Uh, how oh, much time do you spend uh, checking uh, over? It, uh, it's about about five hours a week. So five hours a week for the one that you've got. For the well, yes, for the for the one that I've got, yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Actually, I'm sorry, I misspoke. I have two because I also have. A, I, I do. I do. Do now have actually a second one. So and both I'm on so site sorry. then still. Both on site. Yeah. Both on site. So I apologize. I didn't want to. Representative Sites, is this your second time on this on this person or not? Uh, yes, as a chairman of tourism, I think that uh, allows me to ask two questions. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, you're not the chairman of this committee. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I, I, you, I give you permission, but again, in <laughs> sake of time, and I, I abused that while ago, and I apologize, but in sake of time, make her quick. Okay, thank you very much. All right, um, you inferred while speaking to Representative Boggs that uh, APRNs would be able to treat possibly outside of their training, and I'm looking at the bill that it says, uh, page 40, line 45, practice of advanced practice nursing the performances for compensation of activities services consistent with the required education training certification demonstrated competencies and experiences of an advanced practice registered nurse so i'm seeing right here in the bill that i don't think they would be able to treat patients outside of their training that would be part of the law should this bill pass so the, the, the reason I mentioned that there would be no more checks and balances is because uh, the Board of Nursing determines the scope of practice for advanced practice uh, nurses. And uh, at least so far, they don't seem to find any restriction in their opinion. So, that's the, so that is why I was referring to that. So right now, you have you still have the physician that's that's involved in the care, so that to 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 make sure that there's nothing that happens beyond where it should be. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair, for your indulgence, and I owe you one. 
Sorry. When I come to when I come to uh, tourism, I, I I'm one up. So, all right, Dr. Thomas, Representative Thomas, I'm sorry. Brief inquiry, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank you also for being here and uh, to comment that it, it would make perfect sense that at this point, because you're in a collaborative practice arrangement, that you wouldn't be finding a lot of errors because what you're reviewing in the chart, if I would understand correctly, would be um, if there had been questions about a particular diagnosis or an intervention or something that needed to be done, you've already worked with, with your collaborator um, and that person probably would have been contacting you and working that out before the patient visit was over and before the documentation was done so that one would expect that you have a good ebb and flow in, in your working relationship and that ultimate documentation is the collaboration between you and your nurse practitioner and there should be minimal errors at this point that shows the effectiveness of ongoing collaboration. Would, would that be a fair assessment? Exactly, and, and you know, every day I have my uh, work with my, uh, they call me over to, to, with, a, with a patient that actually comes within those five hours of my supervision. So I go, go over and uh, they have a question about a patient, about something uh, that, that, that they want help with, and we help her with a physician assistant. It more often is because she helps me with closing, suturing up, and it's because she has a finger in the dike and there's some bleeder that she needs assistance with. So. So that to me is the collaboration part of it. It's that we work together, and the close collaboration I think is the key to optimal care. Thank you. Other questions? I, I have one real quick one. As former president of the Missouri Medical Association, what's the average cost to get through uh, medical school, through, through medical school, not residency? Do you know that number? It is uh, north of $200,000. To do that now, that is at a private medical school. If you go to state school, it might be less than half that. Well, Unless you go a father, to a father, somebody's been through there. I wish we'd got through in two hundred thousand dollars because I we, that was fairly reason we didn't. I, we don't know what the average is. Well, the, well, the average. So as I said, private schools are north of two hundred thousand. Uh, the uh, and and actually can go all, all two fifty, two sixty. Public schools are going to be uh, in the in the fifty to hundred thousand range, the much uh, much lower range in state schools. Tuition. Talking about it, four years or a year. That's four year medical school. Now, of course, you have four years of of, of uh, college That's before then too. Right. So that will add some more. Except if you go to my alma mater, which is New York University, which actually eliminated tuition for medical school uh, a and few years ago. You're talking tuition only, not room board. Yes. Books. Okay. And, of course, it was after I graduated, so I wasn't too happy. Sorry. So could that amount of debt, what would that, if you're competing with that amount of debt for medical school, could that inhibit people from going? I'm a rural area. I'm in a, I'm in a medical desert. Some of you in this room know what I'm talking about, a real medical desert, Boston Hospital. Could that prevent physicians to going into areas because they can't compete with somebody who's a much cheaper education to go back. My fear, and this is a fear, is that we very well could be starving our communities of physicians because of the difference in debt of education. I think that is that really applies especially to primary care specialties. Pediatrics is 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 the lowest paid specialty. So no, it's not just the two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars of of debt plus another fifty or hundred from the from college. It's also the extra years that you're going to commit to this, and the many hours and sleepless nights, including sleeping or not sleeping at, in the um, you know in the in the on call room. So, I know th quite a few many physicians actually recommend to their children not to go into medicine and to go into physician assistant school or, or, or nurse practitioner because it is also a well-paid specialty. You can take care of patients. You do provide good care. So it's very rewarding both financially and um, emotionally or feeling per a sense of purpose. So I, I do agree with you. I think that's a concern that, it, that it, it could certainly reduce that, especially for primary care, which is where the shortage is the, is the greatest. Well, I know 
as a veterinarian, return to capital employed, people don't go to rural areas because return to capital employed is not adequate. I don't know if that's the situation. I have a real fear that we could be completely starved and only be nurse practitioners in rural Missouri. Now, it may be anyway. That may be, that may be the fate we're going to see, but I have a... Uh, I have a fear of looking at the debt load. Can they can they go back with that debt load and be competing with somebody doing the same things at a at a much lower cost of education? I don't know that. Uh, I am toying with that idea. So, uh, other questions? If not, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, our I next, our, you you're going to give these. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and you you have those. You have your statistics footnoted. I hope. Good. Uh, if if you have statistics, please make sure they're footnoted, or we we're just assuming where they came from. And I, I would rather not assume. I'd rather know where the study came from and make sure it's uh, footnoted. So, with that, uh, in opposition, then you would have oh four. four. I'm, it's okay. Four. 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 I, I am confused already, and it's, okay. it's only six o'clock. It could be twelve. It uh, has been a long day, it, it, right? Not yet. It hasn't. <laughs> <laughs> Hang in there. So. Uh, I would like for you to, to go ahead and again, uh, about three minutes, I will give you uh, one when you got one minute left and try to wrap it up. All right. And again, I, I'm not being picky, but we're all seeing how long it's going to take and it looks like it could be a long time. It could be so, a long night. So yes. well, go ahead. Thank, thank, thank you all very much. Uh, my name is Karen White. I'm the CEO of Missouri Highlands Healthcare. I, uh, I have the distinct honor of serving at a federally qualified health center where we employ eight physicians and 25 APRNs. Um, we have long been known in the rural areas of utilizing APRNs to fill the void uh, because that's been the one thing I don't think has been uh, addressed fully is access to care in rural areas. Physicians are not knocking down our doors to come to work for us. And so with the uh, limitations of the APRNs, we really have to be very strategic as we place our APRNs throughout our seven counties. Um, 75 miles, it won't even get me halfway across the coverage area I have. So I am limited uh, on the number and the location of my APRNs in conjunction with the physicians that I have employed. Um, again, I have eight physicians, 25 APRNs, uh, practicing at 12 locations. Uh, it, is a, uh, it is a nightmare some days to staff and make sure that patients can be seen. But access to care is what we do. We have to ensure that our constituents, your constituents, my patients, have access to care in rural areas. Uh, we lost two hospitals, one in 2016 and another in 2018, leaving us to provide care in three counties that have no other services. We're it. Um, there isn't enough physicians coming out of medical school wanting to go into rural areas to practice medicine. We have utilized nurse practitioners uh, for a very long time. I have the distinct honor when I came to work at Missouri Highlands of working with one of the very first nurse practitioners in the United States. Um, she had some wonderful stories to tell, and she uh, was able to provide care. So I think it's been mentioned, you know, what uh, what is it that an APRN does that's different than a provider? And again, it comes down to scope of practice. Um, my nurse practitioners, my APRNs, provide the same uh, care in, a, in the rural areas. Uh, most of the, uh, the patients that come in the door don't know the difference. Uh, all they know is that there is a care team surrounding them and that their needs are being met. So I do want to, um, again, focus on the access to care issue as being one of the big things that this bill would address, especially, like I said, in rural areas. Just an aside, mm -hmm. just today I had your one of your groups listed as how we should do rural medicine uh, at Piedmont. So oh, yes. you need to be very proud of. I am very that, proud of the Tonys. That, that is a re re someone they refer to a lot and mm -hmm. is coming. So this is how 
we should do rural medicine, and it works. So. And it works. The Tonys, uh, father and son, uh, have practiced medicine in Piedmont in Wayne County for quite some time. Uh, the younger Dr. Tony uh, is, of course, very passionate around addiction medicine and uh, has really led our organization and the APRNs um, along the way to really expand that type of care and to make sure that it is delivered at the rural clinic. Uh, no more uh, stigma is attached to uh, seeking medically assisted treatment for substance use disorder. And uh, But he's limited. He can only take six, right? So if we could do away with this, think of what else we could do. Okay. Uh, questions? Dr. Thomas. Uh, to inquire, please. Senator Thomas, I am sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. Um, so you, you made the statement, and, and I totally agree with this, that um, I mean, and nurse practitioners do a wonderful job, and, and we need them. We need the entire range of professionals that provide healthcare services. Um, but again, there, it, it, again, in my opinion, and, and traditionally, there has been a hierarchy of supervision. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you commented that um, most clients... Um, don't even know the difference between who they're seeing. So is is that not a little confusing um, for, for some people? And, and on top of that, if, if we take on face value, and I'm just going to ask you to do that for a moment, the data that says that on average nurse practitioners um, require or utilize more tests, more, uh, more procedures, whatever, to, to get to their diagnosis – how would the patient know that they were subjected to additional tests? Because ultimately, if, if they do get to the right diagnosis, they may not realize that they had a couple extra blood tests or they had extra x-rays or something. Um, they're not going to know that. And, and, and so I have a hard time understanding how, how that's comparable care or the best care possible without, again, some type of collaborative arrangement, collaborative arrangement so that you've, you've got people working together and and trying to, between them, utilize services the most efficiently and effectively that they possibly can. Okay. Um, let me unpack that just a bit. It's a long question. It's Sorry. a long question. Um, and do you need a job? Because I could so totally use. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Today was White Coat Day. I think a lot of us walked around um, handing out business cards trying to recruit. So, uh, so sorry. Our nurse practitioners, um, so a story comes to mind. Um, I, I live in the middle of nowhere. We like to tell our stories. And there is a nurse practitioner that has been practicing, oh gosh, probably 15, 16, maybe 18 years. Um, patient came in to see her had been other places. Nobody could figure out what was going on with this patient. Nurse practitioner sat down, went over the symptoms, started ordering tests. Those tests came back neg negative. We ordered, she ordered more tests until finally she was able to diagnose this patient. And I don't remember what it was, um, but no one else had caught that. Had been to the patient had been to an internal med, medicine doc um, who had missed it, but the nurse practitioner sat down, went over the symptoms. So my argument back, or not really an argument, as much as a statement, they look at what is being presented by the person before them. And in my rural area, I have a people with a two to three is average. Four to five is more normal. Comorbidities. Where do you start? You start with the test. You start with the basics. You start with the knowledge. Um, yes, you know, folks can, uh, can diagnose based on symptoms, but isn't it better to diagnose based on data? And that's what they do. They get History is, is data. History, a good, a good well, history, history is and, data. And all physicians are trained in mm -hmm. doing that. And, and review that's, assistance that's, is that's so one important. of the issues yeah. that because there's mm -hmm. additional training, a physician can come in and immediately rule out certain conditions and not have to start with basic tests mm -hmm. because they already know those aren't part of the picture. Mm -hmm. 
and can jump into but more sophisticated part, tests. And again, I'm, yeah. I'm clearly yeah. speaking in generalities, but from my own experience, I mm-hmm. worked in the VA system among mm-hmm. other places, had, had nurse practitioners, uh, psychiatric nurse practitioners, very well trained, long standing. Yes. However, uh, one in particular, after I kept getting referral after referral from this person, and they were very basic cases mm-hmm. that didn't need additional evaluation, I went and asked her. Um, and yes, I had male nurse practitioners there as well, um, <laughs> but this happened to be the female. And, uh, and I, I said, you know, I'm, I'm a little surprised why I'm getting all these referrals for these, these routine issues. And her answer to me was, I refer everyone. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know how that's efficient mm-hmm. because she wasn't confident enough, apparently, in her diagnosis and wanted to cover herself. She referred every patient she saw for psychiatric consultation, despite having already done an assessment and treatment mm-hmm. of her own. Yeah. And again, I recognize and we can go back and forth individuals. Yes. That's that's not the way you prove a, a case. Right. We need to look at generalities. But sure. just primary to let you know, care, um, primary care, family practice, um, nurse. Pra- I'm sorry, family practice, nurse practitioners uh, are just good. I mean, they care, and they are really good to um, to dig in deeper. Because they have a nursing background, right? So that that has you know the conversations have been around the amount of time that a nurse practitioner spends in clinic. Um, many of them, uh, the majority of them, have spent years and years and years in nursing prior to going on to being an APRN, and. While they were in their APRN training, you know, they were doing rotations. They, we do them all the time. We love to have nurse practitioners come in and uh, do the rotations with us because we give good quality care. Case in point, the Tonys uh, are just wonderful. That is how you do rural medicine. Uh, that is that partnership. That is that team approach. And it is. Healthcare is a team approach. And I think giving APRNs a little more, I don't want to say, how do I dare say this? Um, Lifting the restrictions, allowing them to practice the full scope, not having a physician um, spend you know, five the the prior physician said, "Hey, he spends five hours a week. That's time away from our patients. Those physicians doing those chart reviews, that's time away from patient care. Is does that fix our access issue? Taking that away would allow a lot more time for physicians to see patients face to face." Well, I, I appreciate your perspective. Mm-hmm. I don't like the subtle implications that nurses care and doctors don't. Oh, no. I, and I so don't I, ever. I have the, the way I, that was phrased. So I, sorry. I have no issue with that. Yeah, so sorry. Um, but, but again, I, I uh-huh. appreciate what you all do. But again, um, flight attendants spend an awful lot of time in planes and around uh, airports, mm-hmm. but we're not going to ask them to fly the plane. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, there's, there's differences in training. Mm-hmm. And as you said, the best system is Mm-hmm. A system of care, mm-hmm. a collaboration, um, a hierarchy, if you will, but a a breadth of experience and specialization uh, to give that team approach. And I highly agree with that. Thank you very much, mm-hmm. Representative Stennett. To inquire. Go ahead. So we're really considering sort of an all or nothing approach right now. We're either in a collaborative agreement or we are not in a collaborative agreement. And in your testimony and in prior witnesses, we're talking about APRNs that have been practicing for 15, 20, 30 or more years. Mm -hmm. Their experience is quite vast. But what about an APRN who's maybe just graduated, you know, should there instead be um, a process for removal of that collaborating agreement versus just you graduated, you're done, you're you're set? In addition, I'd like for you to speak to, I don't know about your organization's experience or, or the type of care that you provide. Is it all in primary care? 
Um, should we have different considerations for APRNs that work in different settings? Maybe, maybe there needs to be a collaborative agreement in a more specialty setting, but maybe in other settings that could be. I mean, we heard earlier testimony that in public health there's already exemptions. You know, maybe there's some room there. And I can only speak to uh, what I know, which is primary med. Sure. And uh, we also do an OB-GYN practice uh, as well as uh, some pediatrics. And so it's um, to review kind of what you're asking as far as, you know, should a collaborative practice uh, be established for a new uh, APRN? Is that what you're and, yes. and if it was a specialty. Sort of a step right. in the process, right. you know. Um, um, I, can, I can let you know that even new uh, physicians coming in, we still do peer reviews, right? They, they are still uh, working with our chief medical officer for a period of time. Uh, I don't see that practice being any different uh, with a with a new APRN, they're still going to be peer reviewed and with um, with the uh, chief medical officer for a, a or the uh, assistant medical director, one of the two, for a period of time. And that is, you know, that would continue because that would be, you know, what our practice would choose to do, just to ensure that um, you know good patient care is is being handled, whomever is is doing that. Sure, and that, that makes sense maybe for your organization, mm -hmm. but what we're, we're talking about doing is removing that completely, and that may not be the case in other organizations. In other organizations. So I, I commend you for that being the practice. I think that's important, and I'm glad that your organization does that, but I do think it's important to highlight that that may not be mm -hmm. the the overarching practice throughout the state. I don't know. But. Yeah, and, and again, I can't speak for a hospital system. Um, I couldn't speak for a specialty care clinic. Uh, none of those. I can only speak for um, you know a community health center and the primary care that we provide. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. Further questions? I, I have one quick one. Mm -hmm. We referred to the Tonys, which I, I just met Dr. Tony, and yet you're telling me that they're key to your operation because mm -hmm. of their oversight and their leadership, but you're wanting to do it without them. I'm, I'm a little confused on... <laughs> I on, need every, I need all players on, well, I, on deck. I, that's my yes. question is, is... They are key. Uh, and uh, the way uh, it's... My understanding they were key to the mm -hmm. quality that you had, and yet in your testimony kind of leads me to think they maybe weren't that key. Is that... Oh. No, and I don't want to, okay. to lend right. that. So right now, we only know how to practice under the present law, which is a physician, and they can support six APRNs. Okay. That's, okay. That was my question. Yeah. More questions? Yes. Uh, Representative Gregg. Inquire. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so I'm glad you're here because... I'm all about the the, the underserved mm -hmm. rural areas. Um, where where are your areas that you serve? I am in Butler, Carter, Iron, Reynolds, Ripley, Shannon, and Wayne. Okay, okay. Um, I'm in Southwest Missouri. Uh, luckily, we're not in a desert, but just east of us, mm -hmm. we are. Um, and today, thanks to all the visits and emails that I got, so to <laughs> echo Representative Boggs, uh, thank you for the education. Um, so. When a what comes first, the doctor or the APRN in an underserved area? You have to have a doc right now under present law. Okay, uh, it, before you can move into uh, engaging an APRN. So if there is not, if there is an area that does not have within anything, seventy within seventy five miles, yes, an APRN has to find a doctor. Mm -hmm. The doctor doesn't find the APRN all the time, right? No, you are okay. correct. And um, it, is, it is our practice uh, that when we engage a physician, um, we do disclose, you know, obviously, that we do practice an APRN okay. practice. Um, on your APRNs, um, if they are over their head or there's something they just don't know, mm -hmm. um, without the collaboration... What would they do? 
depending on what it is. Um, so I can think of a time when I had an APRN practicing in Annapolis, Missouri, who had a patient come in with a problem. I believe it was a podiatry problem and uh, called the, the one of the area podiatrists, which was a couple of hours away, and did a phone uh, consult and then a, uh, set the patient up uh, for a specialty care visit. Um, they do recognize, obviously, when there is an issue that is beyond what their training and scope is. Okay. And if they did something other than just, you know, ordering too many uh, tests or anything like that, mm -hmm. we're talking major, because that's really the big fear. They mm -hmm. do something they really shouldn't be doing, and there are dire repercussions from a patient. Mm -hmm. What are the repercussions uh, down the road if we, if we vote this in? Um, and they do something messes up and the patient is scarred or lifelong, what would be the repercussions for an APRN? I would presume, since I am not an attorney, and I don't know what the, uh, the repercussions would be, but I would presume that there would be a lawsuit on that. So the APRNs so, are taking this real seriously because they know the repercussions down the road. Then. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Further questions? Representative Courtway. To inquire, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Um, I I see where rural counties are struggling, and um, so I'm I'm not one way or the other yet on this bill. But I have a question. So let's say Representative Dr. Thomas and I both come to work for you, and you set us up in a clinic, and she's the doctor, and I'm the the APRN. Um, what would a difference in salary be? Because I'm just trying to see if maybe this is beneficial to the clinics that they can pay less or if it's truly because we want to get the care there? It is, I would say, for most people who run a health system, it is a little bit of both. That's um, what I'm thinking. <laughs> I, I, I could use more of everybody. I just can. Uh, I can't see the number of patients that we need to see. So for me, it is an access to care issue. And I know that I can't, um, because I'm trying, trust me, I've been trying to recruit a physician to come in um, to a couple of my clinics now for well over three years. And it is, um, it's impossible. They don't want to be in Eminence, Missouri, or Ellington, Missouri, or Van Buren, Missouri, or Poplar Bluff, Missouri. They're totally missing out if they don't want to go to those places. Exactly. That's what I say, too. Um, but I can get an APRN to fill those needs. And then is there a difference in that salary? There is a difference like in salary. Get? Like it's half. Uh, it's typical um, to see um, an APRN salary being about half of what a physician is. And do you think if we would pass this that they would start to expect more, the APRNs? I, I don't know. Um there would be more opportunity for them to go to work. Um, I think that that is, um, so if there is more opportunity, more jobs open to them, I think, you know, if you go back to economics, um, you're going to maybe see a le little more level playing field on that. I don't, I don't anticipate, and maybe that's very naive of me, um, but I would not anticipate that to go up. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Dr. Thomas. To apply, I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you. Um, so help me understand as far as reimbursement. Mm -hmm. um, do the nurse practitioners get the same rate of reimbursement as, as physicians? For, and for the clinic's sake, their, their percentage of reimbursement, does it matter who generated that, that bill, that procedure? So if a, um, if a physician and a APRN both see a 99213, it gets reimbursed the same. We do utilize our physicians to see the higher acuity. Okay. And do you also so, get, get reimbursed per procedure? Or, or, I mean, obviously for procedure code, I assume, but maybe if, if you order x-rays and blood tests and so kind of complicated, mm -hmm. increasing the, the level of care. So at some level... Maybe if somebody's ordering more tests, you actually might make more money because you'd bill at a higher level, whether or not those tests were necessary. Um, there is some reimbursement. 
so I will tell you, ancillary services typically are not re very uh, very high reimbursement. And Doesn't that lead into complexity of care, which gives you a higher billing code, which gives you higher reimbursement? Um, complexity of care is an E and, e and M code. Goodness, yes, huh? okay, Yes. And uh, that is as much time spent face-to-face -face on that. So, But you're also, I mean, built into that, mm -hmm. is there not some issue of... of the actual, I mean, you discuss procedures with patients. I mean, it, it increases the time if you mm. have to explain the risks and benefits of procedures or, or this or that, oper, um, you know, intervention. So, I mean, it, there's there's an overlap there. Okay. So, more procedures probably translates to more time and more complex care. Correct. It could. Okay. I, I again, we've and not really looked at that. Okay. Um, typically, whenever we have chart audits completed, which we do. Um, that is typically not an issue that we find on that. All right. Well, so, thank you. And the other thing is, being a federally qualified health center, we try to roll all the care we can into the sliding fee um, discounted amount. Um, so uh, to the to the point of you know the more tests that are ordered, things like that for our, our sliding fee uninsured population, they pay the same amount regardless of what gets ordered. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Representative Nixon Clark, and I apologize. You've been hiding behind <laughs> Brother Greg's head, and I, I, I just didn't see you there. That's okay. Mm. To inquire, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, so I have had my share of hospitals, doctors, um, you name it, for the last seven months. And so um, you testified that there are eight physicians to uh, six to one, right? Six. APRNs or nurse practitioners. Correct me if I'm wrong. Right. The law allows for a six to one ratio. Okay. And is it is this because of, of the caseloads from the doctors um, not being able to physically handle, um, or if they're not available, you mm -hmm. typically would see a nurse practitioner, correct? That is correct. Okay. And also, I like hospital stays and things like that with the RNs. The RNs are able to see firsthand not with the doctors or the physicians present, correct? Okay, so my question is, um, with that being said, um, the nurses or the APRNs, they do require a certain amount of training, correct? correct. So when they yes. come out of school and they are a RN, mm -hmm. how many years of training do they require to get to the APRN? Um, an RN, I believe, is a bachelor's degree and somebody that is in education will have to sure. have to um, follow up on this and then an APRN would be um, additional training uh, on that and so they can get a master's or uh, most of ours are have a doctorate okay so estimate how many years so a doctor it would be for uh, would be what is that so a master's is six and a doctorate's eight. Okay, but they're still training on the job, correct? Correct. In order to get to yes. the APRN. Yes. So when, when it was testified earlier that a new APRN coming out wouldn't have as much knowledge, but mm -hmm. technically they would because they are getting the proper training along the way, along correct? The way. That is okay. correct. And they also do uh, clinical rotations uh, with a preceptor. And so we serve as preceptors um, across all of our clinics. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Further questions? If not, we're ready to move on to the next uh, opposition. Let's see. This was four. Next is opposition. Thank you very much for your testimony. Give us name, address. No, name, name <laughs> who you're with and... Man, can we all stretch? This is going a long time. No, we don't stretch. No. <laughs> no <laughs> How stretching. do you think we're ever going to get out of here if we stretch or go to the bathroom? This no is stretching. It. <laughs> well, thank you so much for um, letting me come and talk today. My name is Misty Todd. I am a family physician who practices obstetrics in Cole Camp, Missouri. So we've heard a lot about access to rural care. And um, I and my husband, who is also a family physician who does not do obstetric care, but is the nursing home director for two nursing homes in our, um, in our county, in Benton County, um, we have dedicated our lives to increasing access to physician-led health care in rural Missouri. 
Um, I grew up in northeast Missouri um, and fell in love with a guy in Sedalia and ended up saying Sedalia is too big and we both found small communities to practice. Um, and in doing that along the way at my training at the University of Missouri, um, became involved in increasing access to care and actually currently am the first um, rural training track residency director for um, physicians training to be family medicine physicians in the state of Missouri. Um, doing that, I also am in collaborative practice with a nurse practitioner in my clinic. Um, and she is wonderful, and she is an essential part of our healthcare team. Um, but today, I'm here on behalf of the, American, or the Missouri Academy of Family Physicians to once again repeat that we do um, believe in physician led healthcare. Um, the first opponent testified much of the data and did a great job of doing that. And you're currently getting a packet with um, very similar statistics, footnotes, all of the links, and I won't bore you with that. Um, but I do want to talk about how collaborative practice works in my mind, in my clinic, and how it actually increases access to care, um, specific to a patient last week. Um, my nurse practitioner, she uh, worked as an ICU nurse for multiple years, um, went to nurse practitioner school, and um, has come out and has worked in our clinic for five years. Um, she sees patients when I'm not available, and she has her own patient panel. Um, one of her own patients came in and said, um, you know, I have some postmenopausal bleeding, and for many of the healthcare workers in the um, audience, you know, postmenopausal bleeding is cancer and still improves proven otherwise. Um, and how do we prove that? We do an endometrial biopsy. Um, so I'm on my part of the clinic. She's on her part of the clinic and comes and says, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, do I need an ultrasound? Do I need a biopsy? What do I need to do? If I need to do it, I can't do it. I actually stop my clinic. I go over um, and do the biopsy for the patient. So the patient has less visits. The time from symptom to tissue diagnosis is decreased. Um, she has less copays because la um, less clinic visits um, and is hopefully on her way to gyne oncology wherever um, that may be. Um, and so that's what collaborative practice looks like in my life. Um, I also want to speak to, um, you know, increasing access to health care. So I'm there um, training physicians, and there are those of us out there that want to take care of physician, or patients in rural Missouri. We're passionate about it. We speak farm. We speak cattle. Um, but we also speak health care, and we speak medicine, and we're trained in evidence-based medicine. Um, we want the best for our patients, and we believe that um, as um, the rural training track produces more physicians, we'll be able to increase more collaborative physicians. Um, but my husband and I are in two separate clinics. We um, started our practices there um, right as COVID was going, and we were overworked, and we needed more help. And we looked to have um, collaborative um, mid-levels, where, whereas it be an NP or a PA. Um, and we actually put out job openings in January of 2022, and we did not hire anyone until September of this year, of um, uh, 2022 and actually could not start practice with her until December of this last year. Um, we had 10 applicants over nine months. We interviewed three of those, um, and it wasn't because the applicants weren't kind that we didn't um, choose them. It wasn't because they didn't have degrees, because they did have master's levels degrees um, in advanced practice nursing. It's because that the skills and the experiences they had in school did not prepare them for medicine in rural America. When we asked um, things like, tell me about the procedures you've done. Um, you know, we leave it a little bit open. And one of the um, applicants was very excited. She was like, you know, I'm really good at injections. And so we're like, yeah, tell us about the injections you do. Like, we do inpatient and outpatient medicine. As family physicians there, we do shoulders, knees, hips, fingers, trigger fingers, um, lots of things because getting to orthopedics is difficult. Um, and she is very sincere in saying, you know, I can give flu shots and I can give MMR vaccines and I can give Hep B vaccines when really her version of injections was just immunizations. Um, and when we ask her specifically, you know, what is your training on knee injections or what is your training on shoulder injections, she never had that done um, or been taught. And so the collaboration agreement allows them to work under physicians to learn those skills that they don't get in school. 
Um, in our role practice, we serve as a, um, you know, catch-all in ER and, um, you know, lots of farm injuries. Farmers, uh, my dad included, is, are one of the t tough types, you know. They will have, you know, smash their fingers in a post hole driver and um, it's hanging on by some tissue and they won't go in. Um, and so we always ask, you know, how, what are you comfortable doing as far as suturing? Like, you know, can you stop the bleed? And they're like, you know, um, that hasn't been our experience in the people that we interviewed. They weren't um, familiar with stopping the bleed or, you know, suturing on someone who was awake and actively bleeding. And that is essential to our everyday practice in rural Missouri. So I'm getting the time, and I will... Um, I could go on, as most people can, as we're all very passionate about this, but I'll open it up to questions. Representative Fogel. Thank you, to Inquire. Go ahead. I'm going to ask you some of the same questions. I don't know if you heard me ask um, of your colleague earlier, but a lot of the testimony I think we're hearing today is more specific to individual practices preferences, not necessarily related to the state statute. So going back to what the language currently reads, a APRN has to submit 10% of their charts to be reviewed every two weeks. So my question, again, is kind of surrounding that in that if we have these grave concerns that uh, APRNs aren't doing what a physician would want them to do, I have yet to hear testimony from anybody that we should be increasing the number of charts that need to be reviewed or decreasing the amount of time that a physician has to review those charts. And it would seem like in the medical field that if you're not touching that chart for two weeks, the damage that you were going to do, you would have already damn it. You are, would have already done. So I guess I, I would like to hear your thoughts surrounding that. And if, if we really do have these concerns, it would seem that there'd be an effort to strengthen the language. And I have yet to have anyone approach me about that, but I've had a lot of people approach me about the opposite. So I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. I think in my um, specific case, and I can speak for my husband's, as uh, and sometimes wives like to do that. Um, but in um, my collaborative practice, when I started, I reviewed every one of her notes for the first three months um, and really built that trust relationship. She had been there before I did, and I was the newcomer. Um, however, pointing out things like evidence medicine, we don't need a pap smear every year anymore. Um, pointing out that, you know, calling cancer screenings have changed. Everyone doesn't need a thyroid screen every year. Um, those things we talked about as those were coming. So it didn't seem um, as um, lumpy at the end of two weeks where it's like, here's all of these things I saw that were wrong. It's generally creating a relationship and changing um, practice styles over time. Um, in the uh, question of like, you know, the damage is already done. Um, the way my p collaborative practice works is ideal. Um, you know, I get calls when um, I'm on nursing home rounds, when I'm doing a delivery. Hey, I've got someone here with this. I'm concerned for this. What should I do now? And so um, the, the goal is not to chart search and point out bad things. It's to actually work in collaboration where there's time to make change and get to an accurate um, diagnosis in the most cost-effective and evidence-based way possible. Great. Thank you for sharing that. It, it seems like, of course, in all professions, you have people who do things differently within their own practice. And I'm trying to decipher if the testimony that we're hearing today on behalf of the doctors, if that's common practice across the board, because I hear a lot from APRNs that their collaborating provider does not provide that support. And they're, you know, 75 miles away. And it's not a, a hallway consult because that person isn't physically located in their building. And really, that's just serving as something that's being done, you know, on day 13 or day 14 and not truly providing the support that it seems like you and your colleague are, are doing a great job of providing. So thank you for answering my questions. Welcome. Further questions? Representative Seitz. Yes, to inquire. Go ahead. I'm looking at one of the handouts that was passed out. It's entitled Patient Risk and Malpractice Concerns with Non-Physicians. And I'm going over some of the points. In point number nine, it states, many malpractice cases in primary care or family medicine were related to a nurse practitioner's failure to order a medical test or to obtain an address test results. And yet I heard earlier testimony from your predecessor that, um, and even some comments here, that too many tests were being given. This says too few tests were being given. Um, some of these negatives, and when I present a bill, if I'm favorable to it, if it's one of my bills, 
I'll type up a page and find all the positive quotes that I can find and the positive happenings. Uh, could many of these negative instances that could be applied to APRNs also be applied to physicians? If you dug deep enough, you could find uh, malpractice and things like that involved with physicians as well. Is that the case? I agree. Um, in the current way that medical the medical system is set up, um, physicians are able to hold each other accountable um, and answer to the Board of Healing Arts. And so under um, the proposed legislation that um, even though they would be providing and being able to order similar tests, and I think what they're getting at this is sometimes uh, not knowing to do what to do with the test results is a problem. There's kind of a decision paralysis regarding what to do with that after. Um, how do we hold um, APRNs accountable if they're not under the same uh, regulatory body that physicians are who are ordering the same test? I understand. Could that also be applied to physicians as well? Holding them to a certain standard through misdiagnosis or something like that. Um, I'm just, I'm looking and reviewing these and I think they could also be applied uh, to other members in the field. Sure. Sure, and I think um, that is where um, we do hold each other accountable as physicians. Um, and so it, it seems peculiar to me that if they are wanting to order the same test and prescribe similar medicines, why would they not be held to the same standards that physicians are? Okay, thank you. Further questions? If not, thank you very much. And uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, uh, she and her husband are at Bothwell, which is a unique rural medicine practice situation and uh, she's very passionate about that field so that's not a pro or con I'm just saying if you haven't studied that certain unit you might want to talk to how they work it uh, let's see we are down to a con this is getting me long we're down to a favor are you would you would you yeah. represent Boucher is going to keep me on track here so Mr. Chairman, you asked for a con. I is, is stepped what, right what, up. What are that's we, where I fit if you coming up as a, a con, you you are in opposition. I'm in support. Oh, you're in support. Sorry. I, I, All right. I, I think I'm in Pro, the correct order. Proceed. Yeah. Shannon, yeah. Give me. Give me. Give me something. No. Shannon Cooper tonight, representing United We, an organization that works very hard to remove regulatory barriers to allow women and minorities to have great job opportunities, and those of you who know me will know that I am not a physician or an APRN, but I am probably an expert at how we can use this legislative body to block out competition, and that's all this is about right now, and uh, we've had a lot of passionate testimony talking about education, talking about a lot of things that aren't accurate, but the, the fact is APRNs have the right to practice in 27 states. The world has not fallen apart. Thousands of people are not dead in the streets. And all we're asking for is to let folks that want to come out and practice health care in rural areas like where I'm from, places that the, the folks that are here tonight opposing this, they either don't care about or don't want to come practice, but they want to tell people they don't have the right to come out there, and I think it's nonsense. I think it is time that we, as a legislative body, you look at what's going on in the state of Missouri, and we have a group of qualified people that are sitting right behind me that are willing and able to come out into these areas and help your constituents out. And I think it's a shame that we have struggled with this issue for so long when there are so many people out there in need. And I, I heard an earlier witness talk about the opioid crisis and try to blame it on these folks who can't even write a control to script. The, the very partners who created this problem and they want to deflect it on folks that have never had the ability to prescribe those medications, it's ridiculous. All this is about is control. And the folks that are losing out are the people that sent you over here to represent them. And I, we've been here for two and a half hours. I don't want to belabor the fact, but the world is not going to end if you let these folks come out and do what they've been trained to do. They're not asking to do brain surgery. They're asking to, to put their passion into helping the people that sent you over here. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will shut up and answer any questions you might have of me. Questions? If not, thank you for your testimony. Well, it worked out great for me. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Uh, let's see. That was that was in support, right? 
Reverend Boucher, <laughs> keep me on straight. Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the committee. I submitted some uh, online uh, writing for you. My name is Dr. Jeff Davis. I'm the uh, current assistant dean for clinical affairs at A.T. Still University in Kirksville, Missouri. Um, I live in Memphis, Missouri. Um, it's Scot in Scotland County. It's very rural. Um, we have a little hospital there. It's a 25-bed critical access hospital. I've practiced there for 20 years. Um, I do collaborate with nurse practitioners and physician assistants there. Um, I don't believe this bill is only about competition. Um, we get along great with our nurse practitioners. They provide great care for our small, small rural community. We actually operate uh, four rural health clinics, one in Edina, which is in Knox County, one in Lancaster, which is in Schuyler County, and one over in Wyaconda, Missouri, which has about 500 people that lives, lives in it um, in Clark County. And I, I wanted to take just a few minutes to, to make a couple of comments, maybe ask answer a couple of questions that I've heard as I've listened to some testimony that I didn't know if got clarified for uh, the committee. Um, first of all, the, uh, the title of this bill, Regulatory Reduction Act for APRNs, um, and the comments that were made by the author of the bill, um, brought to mind that we have APRNs in Missouri in collaborative practice arrangements because the government gave them the authority to do that in a collaborative practice arrangement. We didn't have it before the government reg regulated it. So as we've seen since that regulation, uh, I think it started with 30 or 35 mile radius and then it went to 50 and then it went to 75 and actually just a few years ago for those of you that were here, I, I was and uh, we were told by nurses that 75 miles would cover every part of Missouri. And I, it passed so that we could have that, so that, so that uh, they could have that type of collaborative arrangement. However, okay. However, what we have seen, just like in Oregon, Arizona, and many other states, when these laws have passed, competition hasn't driven nurse practitioners into rural areas competition has kept them in urban areas where they want to live and where they want to practice. Um, so we need nurse practitioners where I practice. Um, we also need physicians where I practice, much like the community health center that we heard from earlier. Northeast Missouri has a Northeast Missouri Health Council, a community health center that is in the same situation, needing nurse practitioners and physicians. And the best care that is provided in these areas is by physician-led teams um, where there is communication uh, between the nurse practitioner and the physicians. I echo the, the statements of the, uh, the young lady from Bothwell that was here before about how important being available to the nurse practitioner when they need you to come take a look at something that they're not certain about. And that's the best way that collaborative practice uh, works. A uh, couple of final uh, comments I wanted to cover. CMS was uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services or who gave the data that 2% of APRNs currently are in federally qualified community health centers. And that's of all practicing across the, the, the United States. She has 25 in her practice because it is in a more, more rural area and, and, and that's great. Um, one other comment that I wanted to make is that this same body approved assistant physicians a few years ago, 2014, medical school graduates with a degree who've passed two steps of their boards but did not get a board certificate or a board resident a residency spot passed them to go into collaborative practice uh, arrangement with a practicing physician and provide health care and we have assistant physicians who are practicing in the state today but they have more years of training more years of clinical experience than nurse practitioners and yet we this bill would make fully uh, licensed and board certified physicians equal to nurse practitioners in the practice of medicine. And medical school graduates, which we graduate 175 at Kirksville every year, we have 300 that are out in clinical rotations. We have many across the state of Missouri in rural areas like Cape Girardeau and Farmington, Missouri, and here in Jefferson City. Uh, and uh, that's my role of overseeing those uh, students in, in their medical school training. 
um, they, if they don't get into residency and they can become a physician, uh, assistant physician in this state, have to be in a collaborative practice agreement because we think that's what's safest for them to have that supervision and oversight. And I'll conclude my comments there. If I, if I can answer any questions, I'd be happy to. For those of you not familiar with Missouri uh, geography, Wiconda is the is the uh, Ellington to the north, and uh, Edina is probably equivalent to the Piedmont of the north. So if, if you're from the southern Missouri, uh, these are very, very, very small, especially Wiconda, extremely small. Right. And you got to hunt to find it. So <laughs> uh, with that, Representative Boggs. To inquire. Lone Jack is Lone Jack's a little bigger than either one of them. Okay. <laughs> all right. So I appreciate all the support and opposition. But I, I so I, I'm in like I stated earlier. I'm in a rural area. So for those of us in a rural area, and as doctors have retired and different things, and I've watched uh, now. I have no clinic in Mount Vernon, one of my towns, and. For those that say that it's harder, getting harder and harder to find these doctors to collaborate, what what is the an, like, like if this you know if this isn't the answer, uh, do we have another path that we can you know we can look at, or what is what is the answer to this? As as a doctor retires, then that nurse has to reach out to someone else, and and if they won't take them on, so what is the path to uh, to the Answer, what's the answer to a path in, in this rural area that I'm talking about? One of the, well, I think, 9%, he said, whenever you're a part of that 9%, that becomes important. So. Right. Yeah, that's where I live. I don't live there, but I live yeah. in an area yeah. very similar to yeah, that. <clears throat> um, I, think the, I think we're trying to fix an issue in the wrong way. I think the pipeline is the problem that we have. I think we need to have rural students in rural Missouri go to undergraduate school and go to medical school and become doctors and come back and practice in rural areas. And I think that's not just by recruiting rural high school students to do that. I think it's by having good opportunities for them when they finish their, their um, undergraduate medical education and their graduate medical education to go back just like I did. I was born in that hospital where I practice at and, and where I collaborate with nurse practitioners uh, at. And so it worked out good. I, I went through the AHEC program as I was a junior high student and a high school student and got interested in health sciences. And AHEC has had its funding cut, lots of programs like this that's, that focus on the pipeline. I think we're trying to um, stick a bubble gum in a hole uh, and I don't think that's the best way to solve the problem with the highest quality of medicine. We want it fixed right now. I get it. We've, we've started med clubs in our rural high schools in those communities but because we're trying to inspire students to desire to go into uh, medical education. A.T. Steele University, one of the reasons why I'm there in the role that I'm in is because we are one of the top 5% of medical schools in the United States graduating primary care physicians that go into rural areas to practice medicine. All right. I, I like that answer. Questions? Uh, I have one. How, how, as a physician, do you propose? We've got a supply problem on physicians, and the supply problem is due to the residencies, due to Medicare and Medicaid paying for them. Nobody else does. We haven't increased in 30 years, so we have a constriction on supply. We've went to increase Medicaid. We've went to uh, more people in Medicare, baby boomers uh, like myself are all getting mature. We use that term selectively. We're getting mature and we have higher needs when we've constricted the supply of residencies. We've increased the number of medical graduates, but right. not residencies. How are we going to, how are we going to get that adequate supply? Because this is a problem. The physicians have a problem with supply because of residency. Nurse practitioners are filling that void because you don't have supply. What right. are you going to do? Yeah, and just to back up one step from that, but I'll answer the question, is I think the competition that's here is in corporate health care pushing nurse practitioners to provide primary care in the United States as an equivalent. 
and because it because it's cheaper for them when they're paying salaries. I think we're finding out from states like Mississippi and Tennessee and Texas who looked in their accountable care organizations and the cost of care to the actual patients was was going up. So I think that's where the competition is and I think that we need to solve this problem uh, with rural residencies like she's doing in Bothwell. I think the state legislature if it if it had monies to increase residency funding in the state of Missouri to to do something novel where our state started to train more physicians in rural areas there's proof 36 40 percent of residents that are in a residency stay within 35 miles of that residency whenever they graduate their residency so if we're sending them to st louis kansas city chicago for residency they're not coming back to bothwell or piedmont or any of those places and and we really do have a big problem even at the national level with the contraction of funding for graduate medical education programs and the way we've solved the problem is online nurse practitioner schools that are lower cost to get into, that can crank out more nurse practitioners quicker to try to flood the market and, sol and solve this problem that we do have. I won't disagree with that. And that's why I've happily practiced in collaboration with nurse practitioners. I've never had six myself, the highest I've ever had, three nurse practitioners and a PA at one time. It is time consuming, but it's the only way we can see as many patients in rural Northeast Missouri um, that we see. Okay, I'm on a I'm on a, a a box. Okay, we all need to increase the number of residencies, or we're going to be we will be short. We will be in, in I agree. a desperate situation of we will have uh, medicine being metered out, and we're not going to like it if right, we don't ration. do that. And mm -hmm. the physician somewhere we've got to put that pressure on, or it's going to be catastrophic. Yeah, and just one final comment. We at Kirksville, we have about 5,500 to 6,000 medical stool applicants per year. We interview about 550 to 600 medical students to fill a class of 175. There are a lot of people that want to go to medical school and become doctors. That's why medical schools in the country are exploding. There were about 10 osteopathic medical schools in the, in the United States when I was in school. There are 38 universities now on 62 campuses uh, across the country uh, for osteopathic medical education. And allopathic medical education has also grown. It hasn't grown quite that fast, but there's 25% more medical schools than there was five years ago. With the same number of residencies. Exactly. And that's that, the problem. That's the if, point, with yeah. the same number of residencies. So, uh, yeah, so I agree. Most, uh, that, that is a critical need we need. So, Dr. Thomas. Uh, to inquire, please. Sorry. You go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you You're for your testimony, <laughs> and, and I want to thank you also. So this is also a comment and a question. Um, thank you for bringing up assistant physicians, because with that choke point, we are graduating medical students, but there aren't enough residencies, so we're contributing to that glut of assistant physicians. And interestingly, as you said, they are better trained because they are actually medical school graduates. They've been through all of that. Um, and under the category of assistant physician, they're mandated to go to rural areas. So right. they do go. They do address the rural health care crisis. So we need to figure out a way to utilize those. And yet bills in, I'm, I'm sure you're aware, and I'm going to ask you if, if you have any other thoughts about this, um, bills in, in recent sessions have tried to limit and actually get them out of practice after a few years, essentially throwing them away and saying, oh, by the way, then you can go and pay to become a, a, a PA, go to PA school, when they've graduated from medical school. So do you have any thoughts on utilizing assistant physicians? I, yeah, I do. I, I know they are being utilized, and, and you know, I was around when the bill was originally discussed, and, and you know, it took a year or two to pass, and it passed. The, the position of the American Medical Association, the position of the American Osteopathic Association, the position of all of the associations that support uh, medical education in the United States believe that the best physicians for our country are board certified and residency trained. I was at the Board of Healing Arts three and a half, four years ago when the board here in Missouri of Healing Arts planned to restrict licenses for physicians to require board certification. 
Right now, they don't require board certification. What they do require is that you've graduated from medical school, that you've completed one year of an internship in a residency, and that you've passed the third step of your board licensing examination. And if you've done that, you can then practice. The, a, a gap is being filled across the state in emergency departments by first and second, third year residents who have met these requirements to moonlight in emergency departments like Samaritan Hospital in, in Macon or Troy, Missouri or Chillicothe, Missouri or all over the state in small rural hospitals that have emergency departments. I do believe that, that, that assistant physicians can be helpful in rural areas. I, I am concerned also about allowing them after two or three or four years of uh, apprenticeship to then be fully licensed, just like I'm concerned about this bill giving equal uh, licensing you know, rights and authorities to, to nurse practitioners. But I do think that if we had rural residencies in our state that we were home brewing, that maybe we were even finding uh, um, n private funds to fund residencies, we could train those assistant physicians during those years in a in a um, organized training system where then they could uh, stay in Missouri and practice for the next 10 years if we help you do this. I mean, there's possibly some ways. May I, may I clarify a comment I made? Yeah, quickly, yes. Okay. Uh, I, yes, I, I did not in any way intend to talk about a, uh, an alternate pathway to licensure um, because as it stands right now, assistant physicians need to work in a collaborative practice right. arrangement. And I fully support that. And again, if they are not able, for a variety of reasons, to secure a residency, to continue in that collaborative I practice agree. arrangement, the could. bills were to actually limit the number of years someone, and to very short, to the time that a person could stay in that collaborative practice arrangement and then could no longer practice, which right. again is throwing away trained physicians. So right. like I said, I'm, I'm for collaborative practice. And again, with the rural mandate, this would make a difference, and I just wanted to clarify in case I hadn't made that clear before, so thank you. Okay. Other questions? If I could just make one more comment, Chairman. Yeah, quickly. Okay. Um, I, my nurse practitioners, uh, over 20 years, I've probably been with nine, ten different ones. Right now, there's three nurse practitioners and a PA. I've asked them routinely um, through the years if they, are, if they desire uh, independent practice and to not have collaborative practice with me. And we, we've had one uh, through that whole time that told me she would, and she's now practicing in Alaska on the Kenai Peninsula at an Indian Health Service, and she is practicing independently. And, and I congratulate her. I'm friends with her. I communicate with her. But all of the rest of them have said no because they are comfortable with the relationship that we have, that they can come to me, that they can come to one of my other partners that, they're, that are in a collaborative practice arrangement. And this bill would remove the opportunity for a nurse who wants to continue in a collaborative practice agree ag agreement and they all would be you know, independent because it's struck, struck out. Now, could they come and ask me a question? They can. And if I have a you know, a great relationship then, we work in the same practice, I'm very likely to step in uh, like, like the previous speaker did and run down and go do the endometrial biopsy, but I would no longer have to. I wouldn't have to review charts. I wouldn't have to collaborate. I could tell them they can schedule an appointment on my schedule and I can, t you know, address the issue. Um, so um, that's a another concern I have that I, I'd like to see that we could continue to let nurses choose that if ever the state decides to allow assist, uh, independent practice. Okay. Representative Bragg. Um, point of clarification. Um, just want to make sure, did you, and I haven't read it and clarify real quick if I've read it or something wrong, but this will make it so that APRNs can't work for you anymore? Is that what I just heard you say? They cannot, they won't work in a collaborative practice with me. I would not Oops. have a collaborative practice agreement. I didn't read that. Okay. Because in every place where it says an attending physician or a nurse practitioner in a collaborative practice agreement, those are all struck out. Okay, I'm going to have to reread that. Yeah. And it would also possibly be, and I would have a question, it is the collaborative practice agreement and the Board of Nursing going to continue to offer that pathway separate. You get to choose. Do you get to choose to be independent or in a collaborative practice ag agreement? And that would answer my question as well. So if that was fixed, 
So they could have that choice? I think it would be better for, than throwing the rest of them under the bus just for the sake of the ones so that if, we want. So if I reread it and it's not there, it's... I wouldn't be in support of it because I don't think it's the best way to practice medicine. But rather, than, yeah, yeah. rather than doing it this way, um, if there was going to be that opportunity for, for the nurses, because I think we're going to have a lot that, just like we've talked about, that feel uncomfortable when they come out and desire to have that, that collaborative practice arrangement with their physician. Okay, thank you. Okay. Representative Lewis. To inquire. Go briefly. ahead. Good evening. Um, I just want to provide a little bit of clarification. And first of all, thank you for, for coming here. Um, the, it doesn't, it just, um, what the bill does, it no longer makes a law that mandates that you have to have collaborative practice. The way you practice today with your um, three nurse practitioners and your physician assistant, you can continue that practice. It's your freedom and your choice and what's best with your practice and your patient population. And I think that's what we need to re, uh, kind of refocus in on is that I know a lot of people, including myself, enjoy freedom and liberties and to do what's best for, for our areas. And um, the chair and I have served on a healthcare study group, um, and we have a healthcare crisis on our hand. It was mentioned earlier that we are 43. You know, we've got a lot of opportunity. Uh, we've been working with the APRN practice since the 19, since around the way it is, since around 1993. And I think back of um, my mom's a nurse by background. And when she first started, her job was to follow around the physician. And that's what she did. And there was some reference of, I'm a nurse by background too, and I worked ICU critical care. And nobody was watching over my shoulder and what I did. <clears throat> if I saw something suspicious or someone circling the drain or whatever, you know, I would raise the raise the alarms and I practice within my scope and training and education. So we have enough uh, sick people here in this state. We have an aging population, as the uh, chair said. So I think there's plenty of health care issues. And I sometimes get frustrated because in my bedside um, nursing days, you know, we were a healthcare team. And then you come to this building and it's this turf war that I never experienced in the real world. So yeah. anyway, thank you for that. Just wanted to clarify that you could continue what works for you. You like to work with three. You can work with up to six under the current law, but you choose three and that's your freedom, your choice on what works best for you. Thank you. Yeah, and th thank you for your nursing. And great, there are great nurses everywhere, and, and great nurses are being trained every day. It also doesn't, they're not trained to practice medicine. They're trained to do great, great nursing. Further questions? If not, we're going to move to a pro. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'll be very brief. Um, Nikki Strong with the Missouri Healthcare Association here to testify in support um, of this bill. I don't want to belabor any of the points that have already been, uh, I, I think that uh, good points have already been brought up. Um, we just want to ensure that we're able to have access to um, providers in our areas, especially the rural areas. Uh, I think the workforce, healthcare workforce shortage has hit our nursing homes harder than any other industry um, in the country, and it's not rebounding. Um, I'm receiving emails continually from our members saying we've lost our medical director. What do we do um, from liability issues to other issues? So uh, we have done, I think, pilot projects of uh, nurse practitioners in a lot of our facilities. It helps helps us be able to treat patients um, having that um, uh, level of, of um Knowledge in our facility keeps them out of uh, the hospitals, and I think it will really help um, with access in the rural areas. That I would answer any questions. Questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. I appreciate you coming. All right, a uh, con. Mr. Chairman and committee members, <clears throat> I'll also be brief. My name is Tim Swearingen. and I'm an anesthesiologist. I practice in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, full disclosure, much of this bill uh, does not directly affect me um, except for specific se sections which uh, remove regulations with regard to controlled substances and nurse anesthetists from the Board of Healing Arts to the Board of Nursing. Um, I assume we'll unpack that more in the next hearing, but I did want to go on record of saying I, we are opposed to that. 
I would like to address one of the previous speakers mentioned um, that APRNs have to specialize before they complete their training. And I don't really understand that because in my institution, I see on a regular basis an AR APRN working with a group of surgeons and six months later, they're in the cardiology clinic. And six months later, they're in the ER or running a Walmart clinic. I cannot do that. I cannot tomorrow decide that I'm a cardiologist. Um, but they can. And they can do that because of collaborative practice agreements and arrangements. There's a physician there overseeing them and making sure that they know what they need to know and that they get educated a little OJT. There's no guardrails in this law that I can see. So we're talking a lot about, and I understand, rural areas, healthcare deserts, that sort of thing, but there's no guardrails to prevent APRNs from working in any specialty. And, you know, Dr. Haruza made the point, and I'll reiterate, I have yet to see the Board of Nursing see anything that isn't within the scope of APRN practice. And again, they just move freely through the healthcare system, and that's okay because of collaboration. And I'll end, unfortunately, on a sad note. I have here emails to senators and representatives from one of my colleagues in favor of this bill. I have confirmatory emails from .gov to my colleague thanking him for his support of this bill. And I have a letter from him that says, I do not support this bill. I was hacked. This is fraud. This is identity theft. And this is not right. So I hope that as you're perusing all of the emails that you received with regard to this, that you'll vet those appropriately and have discretion because I since have heard of other examples of this, but it's hearsay. I've heard this I know firsthand. I'd like you to give that to to our staff here so we can we can investigate. We got it. Okay. Okay. And with that I'll close and answer any questions. Questions. Any further questions? If not, thank you for your time. We appreciate your testimony. Uh, in support. Uh, just, just for my information, how many more we got in support? One, two, how many, how many, three, how many more opposed? And overflow still? All right. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, uh, Chairperson Hayden and, and the committee for hearing. Uh, my name is Jim Wallace. I am the uh, Missouri Director of Business Development for Chestnut Health Systems. They're a fully integrated healthcare company, a not-for-profit. First, I just want to say that uh, this whole committee are rock stars to 27 social work students at the University of Missouri-St. Louis because they don't have class tonight because I'm <laughs> here. <laughs> The downside is they will uh, watch this entire recorded hearing and write a reflection paper on uh, what they viewed tonight. So uh, I just want to say that, and I, uh, there's a lot of expertise in this room. Um, I, I give a different lens. I would say four years ago I really didn't understand the issue with APRNs in Missouri and some of the restrictions. So I think I can give a concise real-life example, and I'll do that um, here now. Um, in September 2019, Chestnut was invited, uh, applied, and was awarded a three-year grant by the Jefferson Foundation in Jefferson County, Missouri, to address significant waiting lists, uh, sometimes weeks, sometimes months, uh, to access treatment in Jefferson County. We named our program Project Access, focusing on access of substance use treatment, youth-based mental health counseling, and medication prescribing, facilitated by our Chestnut APRNs. My role in this is to sustain and grow our programming and when the three-year foundation grant goes away we don't go away so we're there to continue to serve one of my first roles and first challenges was finding a collaborating physician I didn't realize it was uh, gonna be a problem and it was a problem and I failed miserably for six months trying to find a collaborating physician that could oversee and supervise our Missouri licensed APRNs um, 
I had zero success. And then an amazing thing happened in March of 2020, a global pandemic. A global pandemic happened and rules were loosened uh, and regulations and we were able to, our APRNs, uh, we, have, we have programming in Illinois, um, so uh, our APRNs were able to uh, serve, our Missouri APN, APRNs were able to serve our clients um, and our med, our, our med um, restrictive rules uh, in 2021 alone, our med prescribing team served over 400 children in our five Jefferson County school districts where we have embedded mental health clinicians. There were no issues with the, this adapted pandemic model of service delivery. I'm completely confident that lives were saved because the APRNs uh, were able to practice their earned skills in a more independent fashion. In fall of 2021, the writing was on the wall. The pandemic waivers would end. I once again started the arduous process and quest of finding a collaborating physician for our Missouri APRNs. Um, it took six months. Um, and, six, and four months after uh, 2022 started, um, uh, and our use uh, during 2022, once the pandemic waivers ended, uh, the, the youth and family in Jefferson County had to drive to Illinois and be seen by one of our Illinois APRNs supervised by um, uh, in, in, uh, the collaborating uh, physician agreement in Illinois. That was the only way our folks were able to see uh, patients in Jefferson County in 2022. So this restrictive archaic model currently in place in Missouri overseeing APRN functions is not designed to save lives. There's a better way. Working examples are to the east, west, south, north of us. Um, and uh, I just ask that you please support the passage of House Bill 271 in its full form. And I'm confident you doing so, lives of Missourians will be saved. So thank you. Questions? Representative Seitz. Yes, to inquire, and I'll be brief. Um, I see House Bill 271 as an issue of freedom and liberty as far as health care goes. Is there anything, according to your reading of this bill, is there anything in this bill that forces someone seeking health care to visit an APRN? No. So they would still have the option to see the primary care physician? Yes. Okay, then I restate that I see this as a bill that promotes health care, freedom, and liberty for individuals to make their own decisions about their health care needs. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so we need a, a opposition. Everybody, please sign. make sure you sign sign the uh, uh, testimony sheets and Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, David Jackson, uh, testifying in opposition uh, as a registered lobbyist on behalf of the Missouri Dermatological Society. It, you know, I think to kind of wrap up some of this uh, in a long evening of discussion, I, I think what this bill boils down to is, you know, really whether or not you, you want physicians involved uh, in that team-based healthcare setting, whether or not you want a nurse and a doctor working together collaboratively or separate. Uh, if, you know, if the answer is together, I think there's a lot of work that can be done there. And we've talked to the sponsor uh, and the stakeholders, and I, I think there are certainly improvements that can be made uh, and adjusted to make sure that they're reflected to, you know, today's economy and, and practice and technologies uh, to make sure that, you know, care is delivered uh, in the most appropriate fashion in all areas of the state while maintaining quality. Where our concern lies with this bill is that it completely breaks apart that team-based model and, and tears apart that collaboration. Uh, and I, I think as uh, Representative Stinnett may have mentioned, you kind of go to extremes, right? Is you know, either collaboration or no collaboration. And I think there's a lot of ways we can re revamp how physicians and nurses are collaborating together to affect patient care. And I think it really goes down to that patient. You know, it's not about the doctor or the nurse. It's about whether or not patients want a physician involved in their care and their diagnosis. Uh, and it's hard to paint with one, you know, brush. And this is a, a big bill, a lot of different specialties. We're not just talking about primary care or, you know, mental health. I mean, this impacts all specialties of all kind. Um, I, I want to address a question I think Representative Fogel has asked a couple times regarding chart reviews. So last year, you know, I, I talked to a lot of our physicians from different specialties and asked about chart reviews. 
because it, it's something that we hadn't had a lot of discussion about, and I really want to get their take uh, on, you know, if it's effective. And I, I kind of got a mixed bag. So I, there were some who said, similar to Dr. Ruza, they review 100%, and they find it very helpful. Um, others that said, you know, I review 20%, or, you know, the, the amount required, and I think I had this conversation with Representative Lewis, and, and they indicated, you know, sometimes it is retroactive. If you're working within a hospital system, and sometimes you're throwing that chart review in a black box, and maybe it's not reviewed. So one of the alternative ideas that we talked about, you know, last year was allowing physicians and nurses to come up with their own quality control plan. And, and so may, maybe some doctors will do, um, you know, work on reviewing adverse events. So there's other ways to, to look at that. And so I think there are a lot of different ideas, um, but I think my time is up and I can answer some of those uh, with you here in the building. And you have written testimony you're going to going to submit. Is that correct? I, I don't, but I'm here every day and can follow up with you individually. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see, Representative Boggs. So as was stated earlier, uh, as far as getting more doctors back on that subject, uh, do you believe that the doctors would get on board with, and I know it's something that we don't have a lot of control over, but if residency is the problem, uh, you know, would we have just full support on both sides if that was to happen or, uh, are we right back where we were as far as creating another competition for for these these doctors? Because I know we're all afraid. Of, I mean, in every business, we're we don't we don't want a bunch of competition, but competition is really good. So I just want to verify that it's not a competition thing. Yeah, I mean, look, I think you just heard from Dr. Swearingen, who's an anesthesiologist who, you know, in large part, this bill isn't as, you know, directed, you know, in his practice, but is here because he cares about patients as well. You know, and I think you have a lot of physicians that, uh, you know, I think doctors and nurses both go into it for the right reasons, to treat patients, you know, and I, and I it's, I think why everyone's here, you know, similar when we talk about education discussions, it's, you know, it's really about the kids and this is about patients. And so I, I think that's why, you know, doctors go into this. And I think the representative Lewis's point earlier, I, there's a lot, there's a room full of doctors over in that room that also are, you know, blown away by what sometimes gets, you know, characterized as a turf war because they're used to working together and saving lives with nurses every day. And sure. they don't like this, you know, more than anybody else. Sure. Yeah. And, and I, and I get that, but, but, you know, as, as you look into solutions, whenever your hands are tied because of big, you know, big brother or whatever, uh, you know, when that happens and you can't, you can't open that door or you can't open that gate or whatever, then, then I look at this as, as a, as the avenue that we have in this house. And so, uh, so I get, I guess what I'm saying is whenever you look at the options, if there's not a lot of options, then, then how do we fix these, these issues in the rural areas? If, if we can't have more, you know, if we, if they're not available, and I, I mean, I don't know enough about how the residency part even works, but I understand that if there's only so many let out the gate, then, then it, it, it keeps down the competition. So, but in, in our area, we need some competition. We need some, we need somebody just to keep the doors open that are there. We need to maintain what we have without the growth part. So that's what I, that's what I want to do. I want to make the right decision, uh, which I realize we're not making the decision tonight, but I want to make the right decision to help all Missourians, but more specifically getting to my area is how, you know, that whenever, cause once it's gone, once Mount Vernon has no, uh, it's, it's empty hole. It's a big hole. And so I want to make sure that we make the right decision to in this bill, put the right language in this bill that both sides could support it. Right. And, so, and I think an important thing to look at that representative is, you know, whether or not this bill actually does move the needle in, in increasing access to care in rural areas. And that, you know, if, you know, and how many, you know, Nurses may have called your office to say if this bill passes, they're going to open up shop in Mount Vernon. I think as you and I discussed, or you know, how many of you, you know, in St. Louis have had people call you and say if this bill passes, I'm going to move home to Popper Bluff and practice. Yeah, you know, yeah, and, and that's a and, and that's, that's a, just I mean, we haven't a valid seen point. it in the I, last I decade of changes. Yeah, so. And, and so that's that's a valid point as well. So uh, I know it doesn't sound like we're getting anywhere, but discussion is 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 great, and it's been a great discussion, and it's great to see so many people get in the discussion. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, Representative Thomas. To inquire, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I know you've been working on this for uh, quite a few years, so just 
Could you give us a little historical perspective in the time you've been working in this area? What have been the changes to collaborative practice arrangements? Ooh, um, well, I don't want to keep everybody too long here, but the, uh, there's a lot of people here been at it a lot longer than I have. But I, you know, I think my first year down here was 2008, uh, and you know, in the last you know 15, 16 years or so, we've increased uh, prescriptive authority to uh, include Schedule Three controlled substances. We've uh, increased the mileage to 75 miles, uh, and the goal behind that was to you know, if you draw a 75 mile radius around anywhere in the state, you should hit a you know metro area uh, with you know, a, a sufficient number of physicians to choose from to collaborate with. Uh, we've um, uh, created 30-day, you know, windows for if a physician in a rural area is uh, is out for vacation or something like that, that the clinic doesn't have to shut down. Uh, we've increased the number of physicians that, in uh, or number of APRNs uh, and PAs that a physician can collaborate with. Um, I, I'm sure there's some others I may not be thinking of, but there's been you know quite a few changes, and I think we don't always look backwards because in 2008 when we talked about adding controlled substance prescriptive authority for Schedule Three, um, the same arguments were being made in the same room, you know, or maybe room over there, you know, if this is going to increase access to care in rural areas, and you know I, I don't know that we're looking backwards to that data to see if it's worked, and you know in this bill just two lines of a 55 page bill. You know, if you really break this thing down and unroll it, Schedule Two is some serious stuff. I mean, this bill is authorizing, you know, adding seven thousand prescription pads for fentanyl, morphine, oxycotton. I mean, some serious stuff. And so, you know, again, that's just two lines of fifty-five page bill. Yes, Representative Clark. To inquire, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Thank you so much. So, can you? Um, run through a typical day of an APRN? So, Representative, I, to full disclosure, I'm a lobbyist of okay. representing doctors, no, and so I'm I just, I'm just, I don't want to speak out of turn there, uh, so I would defer to maybe an APRN on that. Okay. Sorry. I, um, well, I will wait and table yeah. that question. I would like to know what is the job description, the specifics of what they actually do, and how many times they would confer or... or um, um, go to a doctor for what they're doing. How many times do they, uh, if, a, if a patient is in pain, right, and a nurse say, okay, doctor, we need to prescribe X, Y, Z in 500 milligram. And the doctor typically says, okay, go ahead. And so if they are already knowing or have that knowledge to do that, why, take, why not take the free range or why not take the restrictions off of them where there isn't a delay in in access to care. Yeah, so I, I think uh, I think you touch on an important point. This kind of goes to the chart reviews uh, that I was mentioning earlier. You know, with Representative Fogel, it, it, one thing I do hear from physicians and the value of chart reviews is that even though it's after the fact, they see patterns, and so you you may notice certain patterns of prescribing, and you'd be able to coach and work with that uh, nurse practitioner. So whenever they see similar cases coming in, uh, that maybe you know they know not to do a certain test, or you know maybe to run you know a separate test, and you you kind of coach around those patterns and. And work and and try to uh, correct you know correct there, but I think you bring up an interesting point in that you know, and I, I think Representative Seitz mentioned earlier in the highlighting part of the bill about you know nurses' skill and training uh, under the proposed legislation. You know, on page the bottom of page twenty six and top of page twenty seven, the current law today says that in a collaborative arrangement, a nurse practitioner has the authority to administer or dispense drugs and provide treatment as long as the delivery of health care services is within the scope of practice of the registered professional nurse and consistent with that nurse's skill, training, and competence. So under current law, they have the ability to practice pursuant and consistent with their skill, training, and competence. The difference is that the physician's involved in that care and in that you know, that physician and that nurse are making that decision locally, what's best for them and their practice and their patients, rather than a state board in Jefferson, Jeff City deciding what's most appropriate. I think that's kind of the difference. And that's bas basically built on trust, right? So that's that collaborative agreement that right. they form within their practice, and they develop a trust to where they if the APRNs are seeing physically the condition of a patient and the doctor is not present, they are trusting the APRNs to 
be the, the second eyes, basically, for them. But they're not diagnosing. They are basically treating the patient. Uh, no, actually, I mean, this is, I mean, even in current situation today, I mean, a, a doctor can delegate the ability for a nurse to diagnose and treat. Um, and, you know, this bill, you know, would just remove the doctor from that requirement. And so, you know, under this bill, if you have a patient, you know, let's say dermatology, and a patient gets diagnosed with skin cancer, the question is, do you, do you want a doctor to, you know, oversee that or be involved in that care? Uh, and so, you know, this is, uh, this gives no limit, you know, to what a nurse practitioner could do. It's up to the board of nursing, which is, you know, composed of nurses um, and, and have no physician involvement. And, you know, I think it's important to note that Missouri is a state that doesn't define the practice of medicine. A lot of states that, you know, have independent practice for APRNs also define the practice of medicine to say, XYZ procedures are medicine, these procedures are nursing. We don't do that. And so that's why this is so controversial, because when you leave it open to interpretation, you know, it's, um, it's completely up to a state board in Jefferson City what you know, what's allowed and what's not, rather than that local practice and that local physician working with that nurse to see what fits best within their skill, competence, and, and training. Sure, but traditionally, if they don't know what to do, they collaborate, correct? Correct. Okay, thank you. Representative Sides. Yes, to briefly inquire. I think that uh, Representative Lewis and Representative Craig noted that the bill does not eliminate collaborative practice, but it simply becomes a personal decision as to whether or not the APRN wants to continue in that practice or go out and uh, operate more independently. Um, those that are comfortable with the positions that they are in would still be in that collaborative practice. So again, as I stated before, this becomes an issue of liberty for those individuals. Can they practice without the all-seeing eye of the physician hovering over them? And I think on page 26, lines uh, 5, 6, and 7, or 5 and 6, talks about that. In fact, that whole paragraph, a physician may enter into a collaborative practice arrangements with registered professional nurses, and that is not going to change. So that option still exists so, within the bill. So, Representative, the way, and perhaps I'm incorrect in this interpretation, the way I interpret that is that it, it, on line five there, it allows a physician to enter into a collaborative practice arrangement with a registered professional nurse who is not an advanced practice registered nurse. Uh, and so, as I understand that, you're allowing physicians to enter into a collaborative practice with an RN uh, and, and not an APRN because you're elevating the APRN, um, you know, to practice and do the same, have the same scope of practice in, in autonomy as a physician. And yeah, so you're basically quite, moving right. up an RN to what an APRN is today. And again, perhaps I'm wrong in that interpretation. Uh, you know, I defer to the sponsor, you know, somebody to clarify that, but that's... Um, you know, and I think you also have to look at, I mean, look, people are always going to need care and people are always going to want physicians involved in their care it, to an extent, right? And, and there are going to be people willing sure. to pay for that. The question is, if, you know, this bill passes, you know, who, you know, how many physicians start going into concierge care and it becomes a, if you can afford a doctor, you get a doctor. And if not, you don't. And that's where I, you also have to look at how the system is structured in, in team-based care. Right. I see where you're, I see what you're talking about as far as an interpretation of what we just talked about, but I go back to a previous point that these APRNs are not going to be practicing outside of their competency level or their experiences as APRNs. That's right there in the bill on page 40, line 45 through 47. So they would still be acting consistent with the required education, training, and certification that they have. And they're not going to be stepping outside of those roles at least that's not in this legislation. And I think maybe, you know, we'd agree to disagree on this. I think where, where you know, my client feels that that decision is already, that, that autonomy is already allowed right now under current law in allowing them to practice the full extent of their training. It's a matter of who's best to decide that, of, you know, what their skill set is. Is it that doctor working with them in the clinic or in the hospital day in, day out, it, who's done that preceptorship with them that understands their skill sets? Or is it a state board in Jefferson City and, you know, full of nurses with no physicians deciding, you know, what may be beyond their skill or training? And so I think that's, that's where I think the disagreement is uh, in, in how that's handled. Sure. I appreciate it. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Representative Gregg. 
Thank you. Uh, just to continue that question real quick then, sure. who's best to choose uh, health care choices, the board, uh, us, or the patient? If the patient has the option to go to an, an, a nurse uh, practitioner or a doctor and they've got that choice, who's best to make that decision? Yeah, I mean, I, I think patients, you know, and I that's where I would, you know, urge people to ask, you know, your constituents too, if they want a physician involved in their patient care. And, you know, it, with insurance and everything else, that's where it gets complicated. I, like I said, I think you, you'll have more and more physicians migrating towards that concierge, you know, type care. But also, I think it's important, you know, to look at patients don't always have have that choice. And, you know, if you're looking at primary care and whether you want to go to an urgent health clinic, you know, and I mean, look, I've made that decision with my family and my kids before where it's, do you, you know, do you want to wait a day to get into the doctor or the doctor's office says, Hey, we, we can have you come in and see an APRN today or can see the doctor tomorrow. And, you know, and I think patients, you know, have that ability to make that decision. And, and I think that's fair. But I may um, be wrong, but Alton, Missouri probably doesn't have a walk-in clinic. So, yeah, I'm looking more at the rural, honestly. Uh, but you may not have that choice. But if we've got, do we have enough doctors? No, we don't. We don't have enough. So the, the, the issue for this bill, the reason it's here, though, isn't it because we just don't have enough? Well, what I'm saying, though, is that you, you in some circumstances, are going to be in, because this bill isn't specific to primary care, you may be you know, in a hospital setting or you may be in a situation where you don't have that ability to decide your provider. If you're getting, you know, let's say, anesthesia and you're getting rolled in you know, from an ambulance, like, you're not going to be quizzing and asking for resumes and deciding who's doing what or who's qualified for what. Whenever you walk in to you know, get a procedure done, you assume that that facility or that hospital or that somebody has verified that that person's qualified to do what they're doing and so you don't have to you know quiz them you know or try to make sure that they have the credentials you think they do if somebody walks in with scrubs and a white coat and says that they're dr jackson you're going to assume they're a physician not necessarily a doctor of nursing practice and so you know we want that transparency and so, sure we want patients to be able to make that decision um you know, but I, I also would caution that we've been hearing for years that these laws will allow you know and create more access to care and in rural areas, and we just haven't seen it in the changes we've made in Missouri, and we haven't seen it in other states. And instead, what we've seen is you know more specialty care, med spas, and things like that in urban areas, in that migration in urban areas. And so I, I think it's just important to look at um, you know because it all sounds good. I, you know, if we can, if we had a magic bill that did increase the number of providers in rural areas, I mean, it'd be great, right? But I, we're just not convinced it does that. But are we getting? Healthcare in those areas with current plan. To, I mean, to an extent, right? But I, I mean, at the same time, I think you have to balance that between quality, you know, access and quality, and whether or not. Um, I mean, look, as I mentioned in opening, we're not in just all-out kill mode on this, in the sense that you know, our big thing is making sure physicians are involved in the patient's care. How that's done, in in a way to help increase access to care in rural areas. We're on board to try to figure that out. Uh, where, where you know, our strong opposition is is to breaking apart the collaborative practice arrangement. Okay, thank you. Questions? Keithley? Choir, Representative Keithley. Thank you. Um, so I and I, I'm glad you say that you're that no one's closed off to this completely. And I, I think there's there, it seems to be I, I'm hearing a lot of people are agreeing on a lot of the problems here, um, and not a lot as much agreement on the solutions. But I'm not hearing on. Like anything that seems insurmountable for to overcome, and how do we address the accessibility of health care in our state? Um, and to Representative Nixon Clark's point, um, with building the trust, you were talking about that, and I think I've I've heard two, three physicians come in, and they've told a similar story of, well, we've started out in one place with me reviewing 100 percent of the charts and following up on every patient, and I've gotten to a place where over years or months, whatever it is, I trust them. And I do less and less of that. I catch less mistakes. And it looks like there's a point at which there's there's a tipping point where we start tr where the physicians too start trusting that. But it takes the collaboration to get there. Um, a lot of the time on the testimony from from the other side, from the physician side, this has been devoted to to to, to the, the the training requirement and the training problem and the gap in expertise that that might cause. Um, and the collaboration is a way I think we overcome that. And is I, I wonder if there's a point where, because I'm hearing in the, you know, kind of buried in the physician's testimony that at least on a personal level, at an individual practice level, there seems to be a point where they grow to a certain comfort where they're, if they feel like they're, they're, uh, 
you know, their their APRNs are getting to a point where they can they can exercise more and more independence, complete independence. I don't know, but there there is a tipping point where that happens. Um, and so I, I'm wondering if 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 that's a place where there, there there's some potential movement on this. And and um, and I think the 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 other concern I have is like you know it's like we're we're talking about you know it's, everyone talks about turf wars and and protectionism and what's what's happening here and I, I think I think there is a liberty component to this representatives as representative sites put up because when I'm looking at this you know I'm, I'm I'm reading you know we're talking about mileage restrictions we're talking about six to one ratios of how many how many contracts you can work with and I don't think this was the intention how this was set up I think this was set up in a patient care. Uh, philosophy mindset that that the priority was was prioritizing patient care, um, but it reads like franchising agreements. And I think what we want to do is make sure we're providing care, and the state isn't standing in the way of more accessible health care by creating these pseudo kind of franchise requirements. And I, I that that would be my hope. Any suggestions that that you might have, that physicians might have, is how do we maintain to to cover that that training gap? Um, which the collaboration seems to solve without looking like we're setting up, you know, which isn't the intent here, setting up franchise protectionist right. or anything. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's important to also look at when you're looking at chart reviews or, you know, other measures in, in that tr gained trust over a number of years that the vast majority of physicians and nurses that you, you, you know, are going to hear from are working in the same facility, right? It, it's you know, it, it's a very small percent of you know nurse practitioners that are actually practicing outside of that uh, same facility and fall under that kind of radius, um, you, you know, range there, and and probably you know more specific to your primary care type settings. But uh, you know, and so whenever you're in the same clinic working, you know, with a physician, you know, even though um, you, you know you're going to have you know more trust and more independence there. You know, you're still down the hall to collaborate with and call in to look at something, and you're still going to have that, um, you know, that connection and that partnership there in in treating patient care. Uh, that, that I think is important. And so, um, on the ratio and everything else, the other component I think it's important to remember is the vast majority of physicians going to hospital employed settings. And so, you know, what you don't want is a hospital system to say you're going to collaborate with. 10 doctor or 10, you know, APRNs and doctors say, I, I can't feasibly do that. Uh, you know, and I, that's too much for me to take on, but it's your job on the line. Right. And that's a protection too, to make sure that you don't have anybody that's forced to collaborate with more than they can handle that. That patient still has that trust that that doctor is going to be somewhat involved in their care. And I think, but, and what we're doing in the process is we're limiting the amount of the amount of APRNs who can come in and practice even under a physician. I mean, I think, I think you're right. I think that that the 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 intention is to not overload any single physician and not give them more where they can't review twenty percent of charts or any whatever the number of charts is that they feel comfortable reviewing, um, and turning these into just someone buying up all these licensing agreements. But it seems like there is there is so much flexibility that needs to happen here because there are so many different kinds of practices we're talking about and types of treatment and medical facilities we're talking about. And I'm hearing from the physicians and from I think the APRNs that it's very practice driven and practice dependent um, and I think the, the this kind of one it's hard crafting a law that's going to take into account all those different setups and allow everyone to work efficiently in an accessible manner um, but still providing as much quality health care as they can yeah, I agree thank you Representative Lewis. Hey, go ahead good evening. good evening thanks for being here you're representing the dermatologist. I am, and I, and I do wear several other hats and representing yes. other specialties, but some of our physicians have been here testifying, so, so you're I, the I am testifying today. for the dermatologist hat okay, right now. Okay, good. Um, so uh, the dermatologist that you're representing, do you have like a average like cost of um, what their incentives are that they receive for collaborating with nurse practitioners? I, I do not have the information, but I, I'm happy to ask them and, and report back. I would love that. Thank you very yep. much. You bet. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> he, was, he was. I thought my car was in the wrong place. You know, <laughs> Representative Courtway. To inquire, please. Go ahead. Thank you. So I'm just curious. I stepped out for a second, so if this has already been touched, I'm sorry. but um, And I'm not sure if the bill sponsor would be agreeable to this, but it seems to me that that one of the biggest problems we have here is 
is everyone's talking about their lack of training or the lack of of years or, or the amount of hours they have. So I'm just curious if we would put an amendment on this bill that would say the first five years, uh, APRN would have to have a collaborating um, license with a with a doctor collaborating agreement. Thank you. <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> A collaborating agreement with a doctor for five years. Uh, you know, they work a full time job that's 40 hours a week, 2,000 hours roughly a year. That gets us up to 10,000 hours in five years. I'm just curious if that's something that would appease both sides of the aisle, per se, the fors and the against. No, I, I I appreciate you know that thought representative, and I know that's been discussed um, you know before. I, I think we're our client, and you know, and in, in not just dermatologists. I think you know other physicians that we work with uh, are feel very strongly in in a collaborative practice model uh, in making sure we have maintain that collaboration in some capacity uh, because even after that number of years, it, there's you know it's still not going to be equivalent you know to medical school, um, but. It, you know, the goal is to have that team-led care uh, in in collaboration. But I, you know, think that it is important to you know look at and try to rewire the best way to collaborate and allow for flexibility. You know, in certain areas to you know increase access and you know while also maintaining that that quality. And so I, you know, I think we're open. You know, to you know, and anything that can figure out the best ways to collaborate. But it is very important, you know, to to our client that. Uh, physicians and nurses, you remain in in some type of collaborative model that physicians are involved in in a patient's care. Thank you. <laughs> Other questions? If not, we're ready for Representative Pujay. My, my microphone's on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're falling down your job of moving this for me, and I I, I will replace you if it didn't improve. The work doesn't improve. So. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Mandy Hakeseth. I'm the Director of Policy and Advocacy with Missouri Family Health Council. We have a little bit of a different line of sight on this issue. We are um, the administrators of the Title X Federal Family Planning Program, and then we also administer a privately funded state-based contraceptive equity initiative as well. So one or both of these programs is delivered through a network of approximately 80 um, health center sites all across the state, ranging in type. We've got community action agencies, federally qualified health centers, hospital-based clinics, did I say community action agencies? It's been a long day. Um, hospital-based clinics, standalone family planning providers as well. Um, in 2021, we served about 44-ish thousand patients, and we have about 75 to 80 APRNs um, that deliver family planning services throughout our network. So keeping it very brief, I just want to mention that from our line of sight, um, we can tell you that we have had um, providers in our network have to reduce their service um, site hours or close some of their service sites providing services altogether. Um, the need for family planning services in the state of Missouri greatly outweighs the capacity of the current family planning network. And just as we've heard tonight, there is a health care crisis. There's also a reproductive health crisis in the state of Missouri. And we've got 75 to 80 um, APRNs in our network who are trained, ready to provide these services. And in the experience of the providers in our network, um, collaborating physicians are difficult to find, prohibitive prohibitively expensive sometimes to keep. Um, and also they are, um, there are a lot of barriers and we can share anecdotes with you offline if that is helpful, um, just about the barriers to securing some of those um, relationships. And at the end of the day, services are being reduced. They're greatly needed in the family planning space. We really appreciate your consideration of these bills and urge your support. Thank you so much. Questions? If not, thank you very much for your uh, testimony. Now we will go to the any more in, uh, op opposition. Good morning. Wait, no. Go, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we understand. <laughs> Please go ahead. Uh, how, how many more? How many more support and opposition do we have? For this bill, where did you come from when we took our count before? Yeah, I, I tell you what, 
We need to stand at ease for five minutes right now, okay? I, there's not a lot of help, but we got to stand at five minutes. We'll be back in five minutes and start back up. And turn your mics off. Everybody turn your mics off. Go ahead, and we're going to get started. Uh, state your name, and, and uh, you, you are in... Opposition, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Thanks. My name is Jeff Howell. I represent the Missouri State Orthopedic Association, Association of Orthopedic Surgeons, opposed to the bill. I'm just going to try to be quick and not very verbose. There was a couple questions and comments. Representative Thomas asked about the history of collaborative practice. So collaborative practice passed in 1993. The rules were not completed until 1996, and there was a, a nice period of calm as everyone settled into their roles. And then uh, in the early 2000s, we started seeing some CRNA bills, like the one you're going to hear after this one. And about 2005 or 6, uh, some bills came that would allow that were to allow nurses to prescribe controlled substances. That finally passed in 2008. They were given the ability to prescribe controlled substances except for Schedule IIs. Uh, in 2009, the following year, uh, the chart review requirement was reduced to 10%, 20% for those controlled substance charts. In 2010, APRNs were allowed to prescribe physical therapy. In 2012, uh, non-collaborating physicians listed on the, on the agreement were allowed to sign off on charts if in the collaborative practice agreement. In 2013, APRNs and rural health clinics got a 28-day waiver to the proximity rule, the 20, uh, 75 mile. At that time, it was 50 miles. They got a 28-day waiver to that. And there was also a waiver uh, granted for the use of telehealth services, and that was in 2013. 2014, um, APRNs were allowed to order restraints in mental health facilities on patients. Uh, with a 24-hour review from a physician. In 2015, they were granted the ability to prescribe hydrocodone off Schedule II. Um, that remains the extent of their controlled substance prescribing authority to this day. Um, in 2016 and 17, the nurse licensure compact passed, and they made some uh, adjustments to that the following year in 2017. 2018, we moved proximity from 50 miles to 75 miles. I hear a lot of people ask me, why do we have this arbitrary number? It is not an arbitrary number. That number was moved to 75 miles because Representative Rowland from Theodosia had a couple people that could not get health care coverage. And I agreed with the Nurse Association to move that to 75 miles. It is not an arbitrary number. If we move it to 100 or 105, that's an arbitrary number. In 2000, what year is that? 2019, um, the, the waiver for, for telehealth was repealed. And so a waiver is no longer needed for that. You don't have to go ask the boards for a waiver. Um, in 2020, we reached an agreement on APR and licensure, which is kind of what uh, Representative Cook has introduced, that eventually failed. It imploded. Um, and then last year, APRNs were allowed to order home health services uh, without physicians' orders to do so. So that's kind of a history of collaborative practice in a nutshell over the past 30 years? 30 years. Um, uh, someone asked about solving the rural health care crisis. That takes money, and um, good things cost money. And uh, the chair mentioned that CMS hasn't provided new residency slots for like 30 years. But the Cures Act actually approved 1,000 new residency slots to be awarded nationwide. And the first 200 of those were awarded in early January. Three teaching hospitals in Missouri applied for those. And two got slots. So I think, I think, don't quote me on this, but I think those two hospitals got a total of three slots. So out of the 200 available, Missouri got three. Um, so 125 of those out of the 200 are earmarked for primary care and then I think another 25 for psychiatry. Um, and so at some point in the next year or so, they're going to, I'm sure they'll award the rest of those uh, residency slots under the Cures Act. Utah and Virginia are the most recent states to use state funds to uh, supply residency slots at their in-state teaching hospitals. So we can do that through the budget process. I have the language Utah passed on my desk in my office. So if anyone's interested 
in that legislation. I'll be happy to work with you on that, regardless of what happens to this bill, um, because we do need more physicians, and uh, we can do that, and we can earmark those funds so that they're used for primary care and that those residents have to practice in rural areas. We can do that. Um, and I, I will also let you know that Missouri is the number one exporter of medical students. Uh, we send medical students to more states than any other state. And uh, you know, we have, now we have seven medical schools and you know, our, our residency slots are there. So these students leave Missouri, go practice in Boston or Florida, and they never come back. And, uh, and I know that because they don't pay any dues to my organization. They're free. <laughs> you know, my, my feeling on the bill as it sits is, and, and I think the chair uh, kind of alluded to this at the very beginning when he was talking to the sponsor. And this bill kind of takes two things that are inherently different, and it elevates them. And he mentioned DOs and MDs. Does it put it on the same level as NPs? And the sponsor said, yeah, that's pretty much it. Well, when you take two things like that that are identical, one of them becomes unnecessary. You no longer need that one thing. And this bill allows you to declare those two things the same, but it doesn't let you say which one's unnecessary. But there are other people that are going to make that determination for you. And so you know, in other states where this has happened, you know, physicians are fired. They lose their jobs, and they're replaced with nurses. And I have you know, the news articles, and I'll share that with you, with you if you want. But you know, I, I think that if you have a small clinic in a place like, I don't know, Piedmont or Willow Springs, and that, and that community has a physician, uh, and, and it's a part of a larger health system, I think that facility will lose its physician. That community will lose its physician, and they'll be replaced by a nurse. And that's my theory, and I'm sticking to that. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Questions? Seeing none, thank you thank very you. much for your, and I would like that information on those other states to me, okay? See you tomorrow. All right, thank you. <coughs> there is legislation drafted on that, by the way, so uh, I would like to see that. No, on Missouri, so go ahead. All right, four now, right? There we go. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. My name is Jeremy Cady. I'm the State Director for Americans for Prosperity. Um, I, I felt the tingle of people saying freedom and liberty, and so I had to come run in. I had to make sure that I got in and testified today. Uh, but no, seriously, uh, Americans for Prosperity, one of the things that we really work on and one of the things that we support is what we call the personal option. Uh, what we try to do is we try to support health care policies that increase access to quality and affordable health care. Um, one of the interesting parts about being in the position that I'm in right now is that on any given healthcare policy, I've got different allies and different opponents. Uh, so it's one of those things where just depending on what it is, you know, I'm in agreement or in disagreement with different groups and organizations. And so it's not one of those things where I'm in here supporting only one side on any particular thing. What we try to do is we support uh, the policies that are going to, you know, help Missourians overall. Uh, so uh, on this one, reforms like this, uh, they have uh, dramatically expanded access to healthcare services around the country, including rural and underserved communities. States that enact full practice authority have increased the availability for checkups, decreased hospital use, and reduced emergency room visits. Providing NPs full practice authority has also helped states reduce, reduce health care costs. Uh, we've, all, we've all looked at the budget. We understand uh, that it's one of the fastest growing portions of, uh, of our budget right now. States that implement these reforms spend 17% less per capita on outpatient care, 11% less on prescription drugs, 15% less on pediatric preventive care than states that restrict access. As states experience increasing primary care shortages, NPs can play a crucial role in ensuring families can attain high quality medical care. Analysis by the HHS estimates that states could reduce their provider shortage by two-thirds simply by loosening laws that prevent MPs from independently treating patients. These reforms will significantly reduce the cost of health care uh, services to patients as well. In 2014, an analysis from the National Bureau of Economic Research found patients spend 15% less for pediatric checkups in states that expand practice capabilities of NPs compared to those states with more restrictive access. More recently, a 2019 study in the Journal of 
nursing regulations showed families spend 17% less on outpatient care, 11% less on prescription drugs in full practice authority states. Experts predict these low prices would generate enormous savings for the state health care system as well. These savings would ensure more families can afford health care where and when they need it. Um, and I have uh, a more expansive and, and in-depth um, uh, uh, testimony that I can email you uh, and, and hopefully you can share that with the rest of the committee that goes into it, uh, cites all the sources for that as well. Uh, but in our position, uh, doing this provides greater access and more affordability to more Missourians and we think it's the right thing to do and we would appreciate your support. Okay, questions? Seeing none, thank you for your controversy. Right, thank you. What did he do? He testified. <laughs> Not controversy, he just testified. I'm sorry. It's getting long. So uh, that was in favor of opposition. Thank you. Seeing no opposition, any more in favor? And if he was in favor of opposition? Is there an opposition? There is no more opposition. Then you can you can go ahead. Uh, I would ask the members. We do have another bill after this, so be aware. Let's keep our questions pretty to the subject. So go ahead. I'll be exceedingly brief. I hope. Um, thank you. My name is Leanne Chilton. Um, I represent BJC Healthcare in St. Louis, and I've proudly represented them for over twenty three years. Um, I'm here and to testify in support, primarily because these nurses have gotten additional credentialing. They have gone through a master's program. They have gone through a clinical program. They deserve to have a license. And they deserve to be able to have um, their direction under the Board of Nursing, not under the Board of Healing Arts. And we do see a lot of collaboration. We've got 31,000 employees, 9,000 are nurses. So we absolutely have to collaborate. We also have rural hospitals, as well as, of course, St. Louis Children's Hospital, Barnes Jewish, Rural, urban, suburban, we've got it all, right? So in order for us to make sure we can maximize the training that we want, the recruiting that we want, and the retention of people to stay in our state, we think that APRNs need this additional flexibility, and we would ask for your support. Questions? Seeing none, thank you very much you. for your testimony. In support, are there no more opposition? In support? If you're in support, since we don't have opposition, be prepared to come up quickly. Go ahead. Thank you. My name is Kathy Harness, and I'm here today on behalf of the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, and we want to go on record in support of House Bill 271 and House Bill 330. Um, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing is a council that works with all the state boards of nursing in all 50 states. We do that to help promote good public policy, to improve access and quality care um, throughout the state with um, our nurses. And I would like to say that we do, this is not an expansion of scope. That all this is is that we can practice to the full extent of our education and training. Thank Questions? You. Thank you. If not, next witness, please. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Derek Leffert, uh, CEO of the Association of Missouri Nurse Practitioners. Just want to make a couple of quick points here. Uh, I know it's been a long hearing, and, and uh, certainly understand you're, you're, you guys being tired. Uh, I guess the first thing I would say is imagine that uh, you spent six to eight years in school, and you come out, and you can't actually do what you're trained and educated to do. Uh, that, that would be a question I would have for folks. Uh, secondly, there was a lot of things said uh, about APRNs acting outside their scope of education and training. There are existing mechanisms to address that through the Board of Nursing. Uh, their licensure can be suspended, revoked, or disciplined. Um, physician appointment wait times. Uh, you, know, we can, you know, we can throw out our side's study. They can throw out their side study. But at the end of the day, how many of you guys have made a phone call to try to get an appointment with a physician and probably couldn't get one. Uh, that's a question you need to ask. And then uh, in addition to there being a shortage of providers, more importantly, there's a shortage of collaborating physicians, right? So the, the health systems a lot, a lot of times won't allow their, their uh, physicians to collaborate with APRNs uh, on top of any other number of issues that, that are related to the collaborative physicians. Uh, so 
that in and of itself is an issue. That not only is, is the pool of, of uh, providers, physicians limited, but also the uh, the collaborating collaborating physicians as well. Uh, another important point to make here. Um, it was said earlier, but I'll say it again. During the pandemic, you know, the fears uh, that things were going to fall apart, the sky was going to fall, that didn't come to fruition, right? The, the barriers were eliminated, and uh, nothing catastrophic happened. And then finally, I will tell you that uh, a lot of APRNs are looking at moving to other states. We're surrounded by states that have full practice authority, uh, and I can tell you from experience, a lot of our members, especially uh, in the border areas are suggesting that they're going to go practice in those other states. And with that, I'd answer any questions. Questions? Yes, Representative Keeley. Thank you. To inquire, uh, just quickly, I had a, um, how much does the mileage drive? Um, the uh, You'd brought up collaboration. There, there, there's just a shortage of physicians who are willing to or able to, or and that, that the bottleneck is really in the collaboration, not in, in anything else. Does easing the mileage restriction, does eliminating the mileage restriction, anything like that, have any effect on that? I think that? eliminating is, certainly helps. I think, uh, you know, the, well, the bill that Representative Riley has before you is certainly uh, probably a, a better answer, a better solution to the problem, but I think, uh, you know, eliminating the mileage was certainly a step in the right direction. Thank you. Yep. Next question. Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Okay, if you're in opposition, please. I'm sorry. This is in opposition. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Sarah Schlamer here on behalf of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, gynecologists as well as the emergency physicians. Um, I think we've spoken a lot tonight about the need for addressing the primary care situation, but I represent two physician groups that are um, working in collaboration during very critical moments of health care, um, thinking of, you know, moving to emergency C-section from just a typical delivery situation. Emergency room, people go to emergency rooms for a reason. It's because their health is in a very critical situation where the team um, practice is best placed, and this bill goes a little further than just that primary care setting. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. And your opposition, correct? Opposition, yes, right. sir. Sorry for the questions. late appearance. Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. In favor. Good evening. Kara Hoover here on behalf of SSM Healthcare. We simply want to go on record in support of House Bill 330. Um, I don't really have anything to add from the previous three hours. All right. Questions? If not, thank you for your testimony. We got to be getting short here. <laughs> go ahead. I think I'm last, maybe. Hi, I'm Heidi Lucas. I'm the executive director of the Missouri Nurses Association. And I just want to leave you with one thing. In 26 other states and the District of Columbia, this bill that is presented to you tonight is what they have. Our nurse practitioners are able to practice to the full extent of their education and training without physician supervision. If it didn't work in those states, trust me, we would see over the course of the last couple of years, there had been back movement on those. States would have rescinded it if it wasn't working, if malpractice rates were high, if people were getting hurt. That is simply not happening. In the last five years, um, since 2017, five states and one U.S. territory has adopted restriction-free practice environment, including our friends in Kansas just last year year. So we're seeing some major problems along the state lines as nurses are choosing to go and practice in Kansas. And trust me, that's the last thing we want to do. We don't want to lose anything to Kansas. So we want to keep our, our nurse practitioners here in the state of Missouri, keep them happy, keep them practicing. Questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Are we, are we finished? No, one more. I'm sorry. You were snug. You were hiding by that pillar. Go ahead. I won't even sit down. Okay. Um, Jessica Pabst on behalf of the Missouri Hospital Association and the University of Missouri Healthcare System. We are in full support of both bills. However, um, on behalf of MHA, we would like to see the collaborative practice remain um, in statute. Thank you. Questions? Okay, no questions. Thank you very much. There is a question about full support with a question, but that's we'll pass that up. Uh, next, who who is next? Are we through? Information only. 
You have waited a long time for your information only, haven't you? Perhaps the longest. Yeah, the longest. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Um, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, so good evening, Chairman Hayden and members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me to testify for HB 271 and 330 as informational purposes. My name is Ramon Martinez. I am the Health and Mental Health Policy Fellow with the Most Policy Initiative. We're a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization here in Jeff City. Our primary goal is to provide the Missouri legislature with relevant scientific research on request. And we have um, prov provided a, a written short uh, science note on scope of practice laws for APRNs, which we can provide to every member of the committee upon request. All 200 of our notes are on our website, mostpolicyinitiative.org. Now with that, let me briefly summarize the research. First things first, when it comes to a really large area of research, such as APRNs and scope of practice, always remember that there's gonna be nuance. The VA, for example, um, allows APRNs full practice authority, and yet the VA themselves, through their evidence-based synthesis program, say that, um, a lot of the increases in, or a lot of the maintenance, if you will, similar quality, similar cost that a lot of the research may suggest, there's no evidence that suggests that that's due to the policy change alone. Now, with that, what I can provide is an aggregate of the data. Regarding access, APRNs can improve service to patients on Medicare. They can improve service to more rural and healthcare shortage areas. These are often at similar cost and quality to physician services, but remember those caveats. Um, and remember the metrics. Are they based on rural areas that don't have any health care provisions or any health care providers whatsoever, or are they based on uh, areas that are saturated with specialties? Regarding the workforce, states with these laws see APRNs work more hours. They are um, more often self-employed. APRNs are more likely to practice in full authority states and yet both restrictive and full authority APRN practice states um, have had similar issues and shortages regarding APRNs. Um, so that can suggest that there's other factors that affect APRN supply in the workforce. Um, relaxed APRN laws, APRN laws can also result in modest shifts in the workforce internally within he the healthcare system. Think hospital nurses who may transition into the APRN role. Um, most studies only do comparisons between full practice states and fully restrictive practice states. So the research and the nuance in some of the states that might have one area that's restrictive or one area that's restrictive, that, that data is still not there yet. Um, but with that, I'll take any questions. Clearly, there's been a lot of conversation this evening. Questions? If any of you aren't familiar with the research they do, it's always, always fair, both sides, and very... Uh, very high quality work, and we appreciate uh, your testimony. Have you? We would like to have you send that to the committee. We can get it around. Absolutely. Okay. Other questions? Other testimony? Any anybody else for information only? If not, that will conclude the hearing on uh, the first two. Two seventy one and three thirty. My, my stack of papers is so far down. I'm having trouble finding it. With that, we will we will uh, start the hearing on our next bill, which is Representative Cooks three twenty nine. Representative Cook, start when ready. Representative Cook tried to get off the hook by offering pizza, and I informed him we couldn't eat it, and that was torture in itself. So, <laughs> Chairman Hayden and uh, committee, uh, great to, to see you again this evening. Thank you for he hearing uh, House Bill 329. Um, I'm going to go into a few details. I know we've been here for a long time this evening, but this is a very, very important uh, piece of legislation. Certified registered nurse anesthetists, are known as CRNAs, have been administering anesthesia for nearly 150 years. CRNAs spend an average of a 11, 11 and a half years between education and clinical ICU rotations before graduating with their doctorate in nursing or nursing and anesthesia practice. All CRNAs pass the national exam, making their profession 100% certified. I'm going to kind of jump ahead of my notes. I know it's been a long night. So in 2001, the Bush administration gave the power 
to the states to, to the states to remove supervision. And you can see in front of you, I passed out a, a, a map. I love uh, visuals, and uh, you got to love the pictures. So you're going to look at these, and you're going to see um, the front page, 48 states, 48 states with no, uh, with no CRNA supervision, seven states. We are letting Kansas and Arkansas and Oklahoma, Illinois even, and Iowa Kentucky, Tennessee, get ahead of us, and we know we love Oklahoma. So, um, and they're and they're getting ahead of us, and uh, <laughs> um, and we can't let that happen. Uh, but I just wanted to provide that with you, let so you could see that uh, for your information. Um, on another page that I sent you as well uh, has CRNA um, and uh, um, anesthesiologist uh, representation across the state, um, and you you can see uh, CRNAs are um, represented quite uh, frequently in uh, rural areas. And I think that uh, is vitally important. I, I represent uh, Texas County, Phelps County, and Marys County. In Texas County, the Texas County Memorial Hospital has zero, has none, has none uh, anesthesiologists. We, have, we don't have any. We have two CRNAs. Uh, now, we have three uh, anesthesiologists uh, up at Phelps Health. I think mean, we have one at Ozarks Healthcare and down in West Plains and Howell County. But that just goes to show you our CRNAs, they're going out in the rural communities. They're going out there to, um, to provide health care uh, in our rural areas. And, again, I, I just think with the first map I provided – and then the second, obviously, you can see how valuable our CRNAs are to Missouri and to the United States. So you can see that. Going back to some more of my notes here. Um, again, I'm not going to go in too much of a, uh, a you know, greater detail. There's a lot of folks behind me, and I know you all want to get out of here. Um, but this bill um, is going to uh, uh, remove... Uh, the supervision and the CRNAs, they, they know what they're doing. Uh, they have the education, uh, the intelligence to do this. Uh, there's no, uh, in these 48 states, I, I, I looked for uh, information that shows that maybe has there been any kind of issues uh, since those 40, I'm sorry, 40, uh, 43 states uh, have um, changed uh, the supervision laws. I couldn't find any issues there. Now, of course, you might hear uh, that there might be some data behind that. Make sure you fact check that. Make sure they have uh, information on that. I was provided some information. I had some anesthesiologists, and they're very intelligent as well. They came to my office, and I appreciate them coming. Every one of them that came to my office was from um, from the city. I did not have one um, one anesthesiologist come to my office that was from a, a rural area and nothing against that i mean that's you know they they prefer to practice there that's fine uh and i appreciate that we need them around as well and we need our doctors we need great doctors uh but our crnas are are here asking for a little bit and uh, uh with that um you know i present a little bit here i, I you have some some uh, uh some uh, maps of what's going on across the united states and here in missouri uh with that i'll take any questions questions You've done such a job of either baffling us or, or answering all our questions. Or, or we got locked, y'all, one or the other. No questions? If not, we'll start out with uh, those in support. Uh, yeah, just before we start, how, I almost hate to do this. How many are we going to have in support? Raise your hand pretty high. Higher. <laughs> I no. <laughs> you get an account. I got around ten. All right. How many in opposition? Four. Okay. Five. All right. Proceed, please. All right. Good evening, Chairman Hayden, committee members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Denise Stide. I'm a certified registered nurse anesthetist in uh, Missouri, and I'm here today to represent the Missouri Association of Nurse Anesthetists. Uh, the heart of this bill is to update laws uh, to benefit both uh, metropolitan and rural uh, constituents. So we are in support of this non-appropriated bill because it provides direct benefits to all Missourians. 
Uh, there are currently over 1,700 CRNAs in the state of Missouri, and we practice in all hospitals with surgical services. We are the only anesthesia provider in 41% of, hosp of hospitals and the only anesthesia provider in 78% of rural hospitals. In 43 states and in all branches of the U.S. military, CRNAs are practicing without supervision. Yet Missouri statutes can currently say that CRNAs are required to be supervised by a physician, a dentist, or a podiatrist. These operating providers want to focus on the surgery and not be burdened with the presumed liability of managing over a specialty that they themselves admit they were not trained in. This implied liability discourages partnership with the CRNAs and reduces recruitment to these rural hospitals. CRNAs and physician anesthesiologists are two different type of anesthesia providers with different backgrounds. Uh, CRNAs, we are not trying to diminish the value that anesthesiologists bring to Missouri. We both are valued members and we both are very much needed in the state. House Bill 329 seeks to remove the word supervision and allow CRNAs to practice at the request of a physician, dentist, or podiatrist. As such, this legislation does not remove physician involvement from the operating room. Furthermore, the bill fixes a misinterpretation that Missouri CRNAs are prohibited from giving uh, controlled substances. This would include uh, pain and, medi and anxiety medicine to patients with, with, uh, without having first have an order or a protocol. Interpretations of the statute are inconsistent, and CRNAs are left in jeopardy for the potential violation of a regulatory interpretation. House Bill 329 is a budget-neutral solution to help alleviate these concerns without compromising patient safety and updates current laws to more accurately describe how CRNAs practice today. Despite what others may say, anesthesia is exactly uh, the same no matter who is administering it. We all use the same machines, the same uh, medications, uh, and there's multiple publications to confirm that there is no difference in safety if there is a CRNA at the head of the bed or a physician anesthesiologist. Uh, we are two separate anesthesia providers that have overlapping scopes. This creates competition, and we encourage competition. Um, it's healthy for healthcare reform and to keep costs low. Either way, we share the same standards of care. We use the same guidelines, the same protocols, um, all for the best interest of the patient. Both physician anesthesiologists and CRNAs have a long-standing history of providing patient-centered care, though let us not forget that the CRNAs are the ones providing the anesthesia. Um, we ask that you support House Bill 329. It clarifies the statutes for practices already in place, removes the regulatory burdens for CRNAs and the healthcare facilities that are currently suffocating in rural Missouri. It allows CRNAs to practice without the risk of violating contradictory regulations. It's a step in the right direction to ensure that Missourians have adequate access to care. For these reasons, we respectfully ask for your support for House Bill 329. Questions? I guess I have one. Under the bill, it would allow for pain management clinics operated by CNRAs. Is that correct? Oh, that's a good clarification. So we made sure in the bill to say that anesthesia services can only be provided after the request of a physician, dentist, or podiatrist. So you cannot, so, you cannot operate an independent pain management system under this bill under your interpretation? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Representative Keithley. Uh, thank you. To inquire. Go ahead. The, so, I, I think the, the to me the major the major um, or the significant change to the statute in this is um, is removing the supervision of an anesthesiologist or a physician, a dentist, or a podiatrist, mm -hmm. um, and that's that that's what I guess is the 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 freeing part that allows CRNAs. I, I don't know if that's what you mean when you say this is a clarification of practices that are what's already in practice. Um, but I mean, I mean, to me, I, I read that and I read it as, as pretty broad because it doesn't require an anesthesiologist. I mean, it requires a physician, a dentist, or a podiatrist. And I'm, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, I'm, I'm assuming that CRNAs are practicing in a surgical setting predominantly. Um, and I'm wondering what kind of procedure treatment is going to be administered where there would not be a physician, dentist, podiatrist, or anesthesiologist already on call, like, I, what 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 is the situation that this statute allows a CRNA to operate without a physician in the room? Mm -hmm, absolutely. So, um, the state map that was passed out with the green counties; those are currently counties that only have CRNAs. Those counties do not have physician anesthesiologists. Um, so, in those counties, the supervising provider is the surgeon, the dentist, or podiatrist. Um, we call these the operating practitioner. 
Um, these operating practitioners do not wish to supervise the anesthesia. They were, were not trained in the anesthesia. We have some testifying here today to, uh, to provide witness to that. Um, and um, supporting states, as uh, Representative uh, Cook uh, presented, that all of the surrounding states around Missouri do not have a supervision requirement for CRNAs. So we were trained as independent practitioners. Um, and the uh, misinterpretation is both for the, what the word supervision means, which implies that the surgeon, dentist, or podiatrist is overseeing what the CRNA is doing, and that, that is not accurate. Um, in addition, that um, in our current state statutes, there was a little miscommunication with uh, the Bureau who regulates narcotics to say that CRNAs could not administer controlled substances. Now, this is, this is important because the, the definition of anesthesia itself is uh, to ad abolish pain uh, that is accompanied with a surgical or procedure stimulus. So for a CRNA that we are um, having patients go to sleep for procedures and surgeries and treating their pain, you can't take away controlled substances and, and allow us to do our job. Um, Missouri is the only state where CRNAs have this extra uh, step to jump through to get controlled substances for our patients. And then lastly, to clarify, the um, medication for controlled substances, again, that's only during anesthesia uh, services provided for a uh, surgery procedure um, at the request of a physician, dentist, or podiatrist. Um, as it relates to so to the beginning part of that with the physician, so I mean I'm, I'm hearing that that the rationale for this is well physicians, dentists, podiatrists, if they're on if they're the ones performing the surgery or the procedure, well they they don't want to do the supervision all, mm -hmm. um, but it's not changing the on the ground fact that there is always going to be a physician in in the room overseeing what they're doing in the building certainly when whatever is happening because by definition of patients in surgery there's someone performing the surgery and that's not. A CRNA presumably doing that exactly, um, this and in which case my well. So just to finish is is I see this as less actually changing any practice true, which I I think has been admitted like has been stated in your testimony. But I do see it as a significant sharking of liability. If is, is the main concern less about CRNAs in this and more about doctors and physicians who just don't want to be responsible for for CRNA activities that maybe they admittedly don't know much about, but. Yeah. Yeah, and I have a colleague here today that's going to talk specifically about um, the presumed liability and the liability that is um, that is put upon the surgeon, though that does not relate to case law. So case law show that, shows that um, there is no difference in liability to a uh, surgeon, dentist, podiatrist, again, no matter who is providing the anesthetic. Um, but it again, that, just that word supervision makes it seem as though they should be responsible. Um, and then also to clarify, so in, in hospitals, that ch this bill allows hospitals to choose their own supervision model. Uh, so we fully recognize that mainly in metropolitan areas, they will likely keep the same supervision that, that is depicted in, in the current statute. So this would just allow rural facilities um, and their medical boards, made up of physicians um, of, of the, their local region, it would allow them to decide what's best for our patient population. Thank you. Uh, Representative Fogel. Thank you. Can you can you quickly talk me through I, a lot of the conversations we've had today regarding the earlier bills was about education. So can you quickly walk me through the differences between what you guys do and what what training perhaps a, a general dentist would have as it relates to administering anesthesia? Yes, absolutely. So uh, CRNA starts out with a bachelor's degree in nursing. It's a four-year degree. Then we work as a nurse. We are required to work in an ICU for a minimum of one year, though the uh, COA reports that the average before admittance is four and a half years working in an ICU. Then we are admitted into graduate school, which is a minimum of a 36-month program, um, after which we pass a, a national certification exam before we are allowed to uh, practice. Um, a, a dentist, I think, uh, takes various rotations um, through certain things. It's actually funny. We had a um, at the hospital that I work at. We train um, oral maxillary facial surgeons, so surgeons that do surgery on the face and the jaw. Um, so they start out as dentists. They come to us and do a rotation um, with us in the OR uh, for several months before they can go on to um, 
to practice uh, surgery, but uh, just ironically thinking that uh, I was training the dentist in anesthesia, and he, according to our current law, was allowed to give uh, just like fentanyl, for example, and I was not. And I was, I was educating him on the practice of anesthesia. Uh, dentists in general um, have no specific training in the administration of anesthesia, similar to podiatrists as well. Representative Thomas. To inquire, please. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, a, a clarification. Uh, when, when you said earlier that um, you would not be able to operate a pain clinic, I, I, I want to know if that's accurate because you said if, if there was a physician referral, you could provide the services. I don't know that there's anything in here that says you can't, I mean, under the new conditions, that you can't operate the clinic which would be a change. Yeah, so um, according to our uh, current state statutes, we have to practice within our scope and our training. I was not trained in pain, so I would not be allowed to go open up a pain clinic. There is a fellowship that a CRNA can obtain. So after two years of being a CRNA, you go back for a 12-month fellowship in chronic pain management. There is another certification after the end of that training, and then you're certified to practice uh, in chronic pain management. But again, if a CRNA is, is not trained in that, then that's not within their scope and, and would not be allowed within the statutes. Okay. Because um, again, I, I, that was unclear since you said that as long as you had the referral, you could provide the treatment. And, and I, I'm still not sure that you can't operate that clinic. And are you able to do spinal stimulators? Uh, so no, spinal cord stimulators are not uh, taught extensively within the pain certification course. Um, so, uh, no, CRNAs would not be placing spinal cord stimulators. Um, even after the pain certification, those CRNAs would still need uh, a patient to be a, a request from the physician, dentist, or podiatrist. So even though they're certified, they still have to have a request or a referral. But once you have the request... Can you then follow up on that? For those that are pain certified, yes, right. that is within so their scope So you can of provide training. that. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Further questions? If not, thank you very much, and thank you for your testimony. So we are ready for a opposition. Dr. Marshall, when you're ready, start, please. Thank you. Um, Representative Hayden and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Julie Marshall. I'm from Columbia, Missouri. I'm here to oppose House Bill 329. And um, I will try to avoid hitting too many of these topics I think that have already come up. Um, I am a physician anesthesiologist. I have worked with CRNAs in medical direction and supervision for over 14 years, and I do agree that CRNAs are a very important part of our practice and um, part of the healthcare team in Missouri. And I do appreciate um, everything that they do for Missourians. I'm in academic medicine. I have spent five years as a residency program director. I write um, exam questions for our national board exam, and I am the current president of the Missouri Society of Anesthesiologists. So I appreciate um, the um, prior um, testimony about the reasons for discussing um, bringing this bill forward. Um, I did speak with her um, last week about some of the, the things that were um, in this bill and the reasons for bringing it forward, and those were the, some of the, quest, the um, items that were brought to, um, to the floor. So the three reasons that were brought forward were, uh, number one, member request when they had surveyed their members, that there was a compliance with some of the, uh, or a question about compliance with some of these um, controlled substances, which she alluded to. Um, and this was actually a question that had come up back in 2017 with the BNDD, and we had addressed that and got some language clarified about what that meant um, for orders for controlled substances. So in the state of Missouri, we do not need to have uh, an order for every controlled substance if a CRNA is under the direct supervision of an anesthesiologist or is working with a protocol under the supervision of another physician. So that was um, the, the questions brought forward about if it is a surgeon, um, podiatrist, or dentist. So in Missouri, every procedure is supervised by either a physician anesthesiologist or um, by one of these other providers. 
protocols are um, in place at facilities in order to have the the appropriate um, kind of guidelines for CRNAs to practice. And if they need to go outside those guidelines, then they need to just clarify um, and request that they go beyond that for the person who is supervising them. So for if you're in a procedure, if you have somebody there, um, uh, you know, potentially in the room that you can just ask, you know, I need to go beyond those guidelines. Anesthesia is a unique specialty. We are dealing with patients that are not um, involved in their care. They have entrusted us in a very vulnerable time in their lives for us to give very powerful medications that control um, their physiology. So they decrease their blood pressure, may make it so they are not breathing independently. Um, They may change the way that their heart contracts. Um, And so, you know, there are a lot of things that may change in an anesthetic, and having a physician available to immediately respond is very important. Um, So I am getting a a wave. I was going to provide a few um, details as far as data, um, and some of my colleagues will cover some of these as far as some of the language. Um, We actually have 45 states with physician involvement in the United States. Supervision may not be the word that is used. It may be other things such as direction. There is data showing a difference in outcome um, for independent studies. So a 2017 study looking at 200,000 patients showed a 6.9 access deaths per 1,000 complications when there is only a CRNA involved in care. Um, There is a 80% higher unexpected disposition when CRNAs are providing care versus an anesthesiologist. For opt-out states, there is an 8.7% increase in inpatient costs with an average of $1,800. And we have both um, national data and data in the state of Missouri that physicians want, or (laughs) patients, Missourians want physicians involved in their care. Thank you. Questions? Yes, Representative Vogel. Thank you. I want to follow up on a question um, that a representative asked earlier. So would I can't, I can't think of an example, but would there ever be a time where a CRNA was providing a service that there wasn't a physician nearby in the building that was getting ready to, whether it's oral surgery or any other type of surgery, Would is there ever an example of a time that wouldn't be the case? Um, I... I'm not going to be able to say an absolute, but um, facilities have a protocol um, also for those. You know, if there's, if there's, I'm not sure if I can think of one off the top of my head. Okay. But. So your concerns related to in case of a medical emergency, would those same providers not be on site already, which would alleviate the concern of having someone there in case of a medical emergency. Do you get what I'm trying to ask? I'm just trying to understand how those things intersect. If there's guidelines um, with these protocols, there may be a certain level of of like a vasopressive substance, something to increase blood pressure. Um, That's within the protocol. And if it's beyond that, um, is involving the physician in order to continue to make guidelines uh, and choices. And um, physicians I have spoken to who are surgeons on this, um, they want to be involved. And honestly, the, um, our American College of Surgeons and the Missouri chapter of the American College of Surgeons support continuing physician-led care. They have written letters, and I'm sure we can get copies to everyone if they don't have it. Um, so, you know, when, when things are going wrong with the patient that they have brought to a procedure, those physicians want to know and want to continue in that discussion and be involved in directing the care. Can I ask a follow-up question? Do you think those, those sentiments would remain true for general dentists and podiatrists who maybe aren't as confident in those emergency management situations but are operating as the supervising physician or, or, or dentist in the case? Um, I work with podiatrists. I don't work with any dentists. Um, And the podiatrists I work with are very involved in the care of their patients. If there's something that's changing, um, they always do want to be involved in the discussion. So, um, you know, it's they can delegate what they feel is appropriate to the CRNA and each facility and each setup, just like I think with the last bill you heard, there's a lot of variability um, in what things may be out there, but that's that's up to the facility and the physician. Okay, that was helpful. Thank you. Other questions? 
Puget, you this is uh, Representative Puget, this is your first first <laughs> query, and I am so happy that you're involved tonight. <laughs> oh yeah, it's Rian, uh, the representative. Yeah, the microphone didn't work. Good evening, thank you. Uh, just going back on the same subject line and brought it up. So, would there be an instance where a dentist or a podiatrist or some other physician, doctor? overrode a CRNA on when it came to anesthesia? Um, I have not been told of an instance that occurred. When I was speaking to um, our colleague from the, the Missouri um, Society of Nurse Anesthetists, I asked if there was ever a problem where that they were aware of where there was a protocol in place and that that somehow impeded or in, impaired patient care. And there was no instances that was um, brought to me. So there wasn't like a disagreement on how to proceed, even in an emergency situation between a CRNA and the providing surgeon or I don't that have any information of. of one, no. But, I mean, but, I just don't have that information. I mean, obviously they'd be involved because they're performing a surgery or an operation or some sort. But if they're not going to have any input on anesthesia, I don't see why it's an issue. I guess, I don't know, I just, as a non-medical person, I'm like, well, if it's not their world, why are they, yeah. Why? Um, be, you know, if there, if there is a physician anesthesiologist involved, obviously we are, well, yeah, we are course, bringing that, in that expertise. If correct. we're in a situation where that is not um, available, so this is not an access issue. Right now, CRNAs are everywhere that sure. they want to mm -hmm. be in the state of Missouri. Um, is that in order to provide that same care safely for very powerful medications mm -hmm. is to have protocols in place for what is considered a reasonable component of medications for that facility um, and that type of procedure. I totally understand it's very delicate and important stuff and a lot smarter than me doing it. But if the podiatrist or dentist doesn't overrule or argue with the CRNA, if there's no physician anesthesiologist, then I don't see where the concern is. I think about. it's just continuing to involve them in care. So if you were well, providing like course, a sedation for a patient certainly. who is undergoing a dental procedure and they are not doing well. Sure. Um, you know, that physician, the person who is in charge of that um, that procedure needs to have that ability to be part of the discussion and part of the determination of if they if the, the CRNA involved wants to continue to provide additional sedating medications uh -huh. and is going beyond what's considered to be in the bounds of the standard care. Um, that's kind of an important thing for that dentist to be able to guide whether or not that procedure is going the way that they want it to as well. Well, obviously it's not going in the way they want it because that's who would be in the situation of, right. at outstream. But with, but with their limited experience and knowledge of anesthesia, wouldn't they normally just go with the person who's trained in that? And in this instance, in that instance, if they choose to do that in a very limited instance of a, of a dental procedure, then they would have that right to choose to do so. Okay. I'm just trying to understand. Thank you. I just... Mm -hmm. Thanks. Patty, uh, Representative Lewis, I'm sorry. To inquire. Granted. Thank you. Good evening. Thank Hello. you so much for, for being here and sticking around and for hours and hours. I'll try and be brief here. But I just, um, you said something about like protocols. Right. Um, who, um, who writes the anesthesia protocols when there aren't any CRNAs? Um, I will defer potentially to how these have been written in the past, but we, there have been protocols provided to um, facilities that have come under review. This was years ago when this was set up um, as examples, and those were provided to facilities if they needed to have a template in order to, um, to help guide care. Um, I believe all facilities that, um, you know, should have them available. I know we have discussed, when we were discussing um, with the, you know, concerns about bringing forth this bill, that there might be some facilities that have some outdated ones. Um, if that was a concern, I 
am this, I and the society are happy to help working through that again. Um, but I believe those were helped, you know, put together back when this uh, program was initially started. Okay. okay. I couldn't give you a year on it. I'm sorry. Okay. So, and then I, a different question though, um, just quick yes or no. So, is a physician anesthesiologist required to deliver safe anesthesia care? Yes, I would hope so. So then Sorry. what would your answer be to the 78% of hospitals or healthcare settings in rural Missouri that don't have an anesthesiologist present? Right. So um, there are some payment issues. Um, one of my colleagues will come up and talk about that in a little bit more detail. But there is a discrepancy in the way that CRNAs can be paid in um, some of our rural settings compared to how anesthesiologists can be paid. So it, it, there's a, at a federal level, um, they can be paid under Medicare Part A, where we get paid under Medicare Part B. Um, and I will let my colleague kind of address that in a little bit more detail, but it sets up a payment discrepancy in those two settings. But I wasn't asking about pay. I was asking about like safe, to, safe care of anesthesia. Right. So there is, there is a challenge of getting the payment at those rural, so at those rural areas in order to support anesthesiologists. Um, there is... Obviously, a lot of CRNAs in the rural areas um, that are serving there. Um, when we do get into situations with opt-out states, we don't see an increase in CRNA moving to, to rural areas. It's, it's pretty much the same number. But, um, but we don't, this isn't an access issue question in Missouri either. Um, right now, every place that wants a CRNA in a rural area can continue to have it with our current system. Thank you. Further questions? If not, we thank you for your testimony and appreciate your time, and especially, particularly staying as late as you have. Okay, and somebody uh, in support. All right. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Representative Hayden and members of the committee for allowing me to sh share this wonderful evening with you guys uh, here. Uh, it's an introduction. I am a, uh, my name is Sam Hadi. I'm a board-certified neurosurgeon. I practice in St. Louis. Um, I am department chair of surgery for Mercy Clinic South and also medical director of spine and pain for Mercy East. I am testifying in support of HB 329. I have had the unique opportunity to work with a solo CRNA practice in rural Missouri, as well as with CRNAs and anesthesiologists in St. Louis. At both locations that I've worked at, the CRNA care was excellent. I honestly saw no difference in the care between the anesthesia provided by my solo CRNAs in uh, the rural Missouri and the CRNA physician collaboration team that we have in St. Louis. At both locations, my patients received excellent care. I was impressed with the quality of care done in rural Missouri. We were able to do quite a few surgeries. Uh, the bill intended before you will not remove the physician involvement, will not change the relationship between the CRNAs at least the surgeons. Uh, I think we're all here for the patient's best interest, and they've done a, decent, they've done a very good job. Um, as a surgeon, I would prefer not to be liable and in charge of something that I am not an expert or trained in, although I would be happy to collaborate and work with them toward improving the patient care. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions from anybody. Questions? Representative Keithley? Thank you. To inquire? Yes, go ahead. Um, I'd like to not be liable for a lot of things in my business, too. But, <laughs> um, so I, my, a, a question I have is, I'm in, in your role as a neurosurgeon, how many of your patients are you meeting with pre-op, build-up to surgery, how far in advance? Well, I mean, obviously, with every patient, I'll see them preoperatively, both in my office. I'll see them the day of surgery. I'll see them postoperatively, and we'll follow up with them in the clinic afterwards. And how much involvement do they have in a preop with the CRNA or the anesthesiologist, whoever's providing that in the build-up to that? You might want to ask them about that. They have their own specific areas that they ask about questions. I do my area based on what I check for my neurosurgery surgery that I'm going to proceed, proceed with. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I don't want to answer something that I'm not an expert in, so I would defer to them to answer what questions they do and what they do preoperatively. 
And then um, in terms of choosing uh, a CRNA team or staff person, who's making that decision ultimately? So I did. I had influence. If I would, you know, had preferences on somebody that I worked with, or personality issues, or just people that uh, you know you liked more, like you would any other field. But I did not make those choices. They were assigned to me by the staff, whoever's running the board, or the anesthesiologist group had some sort of process for putting the people in my room. Okay, thank you, Representative Fogel. Just a few quick questions. When you put a patient under, for lack, I mean, I don't have the right terminology, when a CRNA puts a patient under, are there things that regulatory guidelines on how close you have to stay in proximity to that patient as a surgeon? Like, is there anything that says you have to be in the building if your patient's under, or anything that says you have to be within a certain yard or my, or feet? Yes. No, yes. I was like, mile's not the right one. Yeah, certain yeah. yards or certain feet within the patient that you're being treated. I'm trying to get to the heart of this in case of a medical emergency situation and how Correct. close I think a surgeon would be to the patient. Most hospitals will require you to be in the building. You can't go sign in, do your pre-op consents, et cetera, and leave and go do a, a clinic or see a patient in another facility or another building. They won't. That's, A, not good care and most of the time is not allowed by hospital laws. Okay, Problems. but that would be dependent on the hospital. There's nothing in any other... Not that I know of. Okay, yeah. thanks. Representative Stennett. To inquire. Go ahead. Can you tell me in the rural communities that you're speaking of, what types of procedures you were doing there? Were sure. they different? The community was Rolla, Missouri, and it was kyphoplasties, lumbar discectomies, lumbar decompressions, and anterior cervical discectomies and fusions. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Could you repeat those? No. <laughs> okay. Uh, Representative Sykes? Yes, to inquire. Go ahead. Uh, would you say that the training for CRNAs is greater in scope than what you've received, and yet you're to be placed in a supervisory position? Do you think they're more than qualified to... Uh, be self-sufficient and self-supervising because of their training. Well, as a neurosurgeon, I'm supposed to know everything. That's what but, I thought. Yeah, yeah but, but on yeah. these, uh, actually, the training for us for anesthesia is much, it's limited. It's okay. what we learn on the, on the job. Okay, thank you. Representative Lewis. Just to inquire. Go ahead. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Um, I just want to kind of talk about like an emergency because I think that sounds pretty scary to, to a lot of people, emergency. And I worked um, critical care, ICU, and academic um, facilities. And so when we think of a, and correct me if I'm wrong, but when we think of like an emergency or, you know, code blue, you, you know, you anesthesia or CRNAs are the first to come to the rescue to protect the airway. That is what they are trained to do. So you are in good hands with your physician, anesthesiologist, and your CRNA, you know, the, they're the ones who come running and intubate the patient. So I don't know, just my, my thoughts. Would, do you have any comments on that? Yes. Um, I don't respond to many codes. Right. Okay. <laughs> Unless you have a head bleed or you have a serious problem that needs some sort of craniotomy. I have very little to offer. And so I kind of make sure that there's somebody running the show and I move on to my work. If I'm the only person around, I will do the best that I can in that room. But I am very so specialized that my area of expertise does not extend past neurosurgery to any significant extent, unfortunately. Thank you so much. Further questions? If not, thank you for your testimony. We appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, in uh, support, oppositions. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the ability to come talk to you. I commend the committee's stamina for uh, allowing us um, to talk about something that's very important to us. So your stamina and being here is, is a, uh, a real good thing for us, so I appreciate it. I'm Matt Casey. I'm a physician anesthesiologist in St. Louis. I work for Western Anesthesia. Um, I have possibly a slightly different perspective um, to come before you. Um, my oldest sister, who is my greatest influence to become uh, and to get into the medical field, is a pediatric nurse practitioner, um, and my wife is a nurse anesthetist. Um, so 
I definitely hear um, uh, I have a different perspective on some of these issues uh, than maybe some because of the conversations I have at home. Both of those individuals um, would not practice in an independent uh, setting. Um, both of them love the collaboration that they have with their physicians. They learn from their physicians. Their physicians learn from them. They think that the care that patients get from a care team model is better um, than them alone. Um, and the vast majority, I've been doing this for 20 years and working in an anesthesia care team model my whole career, the vast majority of nurse anesthetists that I work with um, feel that same way. Um, I really would love to hear the argument that my experience, my training, combined with a nurse anesthetist training, um, provides the exact same care as one of us alone. It makes absolutely no sense to me that two people's experience that are different, their educations that are different, um, can come together and work together collaboratively and wouldn't provide a better product and better patient care than one alone. Um, I would love to hear that argument, and I never have. Um, couple questions that have come up that I've heard since I've been here. Um, one is the, the setting of um, how, how, how does this rural um, anesthesia happen and do you think it's worse without a physician? And I think definitely yes. Uh, I think we would love to have physician involvement um, um, for the exact reason that I just mentioned. Um, uh, another question was asked about, is there a time when um, a nurse anesthetist would be alone without a physician, a podiatrist, or a dentist? Um, I think maybe you're getting to a point of um, um, possibly situations like a pain interventional pain clinic, a ketamine clinic, um, a medical spa, things like that are, are where um, this could possibly lead to um, nurse anesthetists or nurse practitioners practicing alone without any type of um, supervision or um, um, collaboration with a physician. Um, and lastly, um, I find it very short-minded um, that um, people that come up in front of you say that um, the care is the exact same, we use the same practice parameters, we use the same techniques, we use the same um, um, decision-making. Um, I won't go into the weeds because we don't have time, and I'd love to go into the weeds with you on this, but every practice uh, maybe I shouldn't say every because that always gets you in trouble, but almost all practice parameters that are commonly used in anesthesia have been developed by research and clinical data developed by physicians. Our peer review research is, out, is unmatched. Our quality and safety initiatives over the last 50 years are, are um, the envy of every specialty in anesthesia. Um, every little minute detail that becomes second nature for every CRNA and every physician including how much anesthesia gas to use and what's the appropriate number, was based on physician research that created that. So the people that say that physicians aren't needed, that our, our, our care is the exact same and we don't need them, they use the physician's data and all the research that we've done over the last 60 years, and then they say we're not necessary. I think that's very short-sighted. Thank you. I'm here to respond to any questions. Representative Nixon, Nixon Clark, please. To inquire, Mr. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, I hadn't heard that um, they were trying to, to take your position, correct? Um, my question is, um, previously it was testified that there is an issue with getting paid in the rural areas for um, anesthesiologists, correct? I think the way physician and where the way care is um, paid for by Medicare and Medicaid is different based on a physician uh, in rural areas. Yes. Sure. And with that being said, and with the concerns of not being enough anesthesiologists in the rural area, what would be your solution? Uh, getting more physicians. Um, uh, we don't have, um, you know, we have a national crisis of anesthesia personnel, of um, um, medicine um, in, all, in all aspects, not just primary care, not just anesthesia, in everywhere. Um, we, we look at different states that have different rules on um, supervision and direction. They still have problems with access to care in rural areas. Missouri isn't the only state in the country that has problems with rural medicine. Every state does. So we need more physicians. We need more nurses. We need more nurse practitioners. And that's a money problem. Um, 
Sure. And so for the last four and a half hours, we've established that there's a lack of physicians, right? And so in the meantime, what happens? People are dying. So how do we fix that right now? Well, we do a couple things. One, um, we try to make um, the physicians as available in, in as many situations as possible. Um, you will get data on the counties that don't have a physician available. You should also get data on how many procedures are being done in these facilities. The vast majority of procedures in this state are being done in Kansas City, Columbia, St. Louis. Um, of, you know, 90% of all procedures are being done in these places. Um, so are we solving a, p a problem for 10%? Maybe. But are we trying to create a system that doesn't in um, incentivize people to go into medicine and go into uh, become physicians? I think we might be. And I think we might be creating a problem that people say, man, I don't want to go through four years. I, I took me three years to get into med school. Every part of that, my, my, um, my, my journey to medicine, there was an obstacle. And at that obstacle, I could have gone, and I was instructed by a couple people, why don't you go into nursing? It's going to be shorter, and you're going to get there faster. I wanted um, the privilege to be called a physician and to have a patient-physician relationship. I think that is something that um, is so important to me that after three years or after not getting to med school and going to a master's program, starting a Ph.D. program, until I got into med school, I would be um, – I didn't want to – to waver from that goal. Um, and I don't want to create systems and, and laws that dissuade people like me from going into medicine. And I think some of these might. Sure. And so is it safe to say that your definitive answer that the 10%, it doesn't matter? No. Okay. It means that we have to do better ways to get stuff. And if, if we say that my job is not important, um, that my in input doesn't mean anything, if that meant that all of a sudden thousands of nurse anesthetists were going to come and move to the rural areas, maybe we have to really think about that. And maybe I'd have to say something different at this mic. But that's not going to happen. The nurse anesthetists, just like physicians, work where there are jobs and where, it's, um, um, where they want to live. Um, and that's been proven for many years. Um, so trying to create access by giving someone more authority doesn't create access, and it hasn't worked for a long time, in my opinion. Thank you so much. Representative Fogel. Thank you. Are there any, is there any service that you provide that, let me rephrase this, is there any medical service that is provided that a physician anesthesiologist has to provide the anesthesia for versus the CRNA, or is, like, are there any very labor-intensive or very... You know what I'm trying to ask? Kind of. Uh, and it's um, probably facility dependent. It's probably uh, comfort level and experience dependent. Um, I know in my facility, um, and I work with nurse anesthetists and certified anesthesiologist assistants, um, they do a broad range of um, physical um, activities into the anesthetic care. I am the one that is called in our facility to handle emergency intubations that require a fiber optic intubation. In my training, I did over 1,000 fiber optic intubations in four years, and uh, I led a training program for four years in Chicago before I moved back to St. Louis in difficult airway management. Um, so that's one way with difficult airway where my training is far superior to even some of my physician colleagues and where I'm relied on to handle those type of things. That doesn't mean that I'm the only person that can do it, and sometimes I try to teach and help people because they need to learn some skills in this area. Um, but that's one way that I do things that um, most uh, nurse anesthetists don't get the same experience that I do uh, in, in the training. And can you clarify for me, are you here testifying on behalf of Mercy, or are you here testifying on behalf of yourself? No, I work at Mercy. I work for a private, um, a private anesthesiology group. So okay. I'm here for myself. Um, here as a member of the Missouri Society of Anesthesia. Okay, thank you so much. Representative <clears throat> Seitz, please. Thank you. To inquire, um, first I'd like to state that everyone on this committee would appreciate your service and what you've done in the medical field. I think it's outstanding, your work as a physician and the specific things that you've done. But earlier you mentioned collaborative practice, so I have to go right back to the piece of legislation that we're talking about 
And on page 2, lines 32 through 35, it states, Nothing in this subsection shall be construed to prohibit or prevent a certified registered nurse anesthetist from entering into a collaborative practice arrangement under section 334.104. So again, if they choose in the area in which they live to maintain being in a collaborative practice arrangement, they can do that according to this legislation. But just like I spoke in favor of the last bill that was presented, um, this would give these individuals a choice whether or not to remain in the collaborative practice or to go off and do things a little bit more on their own. Two things. One, just because you don't have to be into a collaborative practice region doesn't mean that I think there are a lot of nurse anesthetists that would choose to it. I testified to that early. Um, my wife is one of them. She would choose. Um, I wonder where um, that would go down the road, uh, especially with hospital administrators who oftentimes forget about patient care, sometimes forget about what they want, and are all only looking at a dollar value on something. And would they prohibit? And would they create a system in a hospital that said, um, I'm going to not pay the physician as much um, because I don't have to. And if they want to stay, maybe they could. Or if the nurse anesthetist wanted to work with them, they could. I think that creates a terrible idea and a terrible opportunity for hospital administrators um, to meddle in something that they really shouldn't. Do you think that's happening in the 42 or 44 states where they do not have the CRNA supervision or whatever you want to call it based on the last testimony. I think the majority of anesthesia care, even in those states, are um, some version of a collaborative care team with a physician. Um, but because you can't, um, for myself, when I work in the care team and to bill Medicare and Medicaid, I have to perform six vital functions um, to, to say that I've performed my duty and to be um, reimbursed for that. That becomes pretty onerous, and a lot of places will choose not to bill in that way, and they'll bill as a supervision, not a direction, which is a lesser standard, uh, because they don't want to get audited and they don't want to find that they're not performing all six steps. Um, so I think a lot of the data that you're shown says that um, – medical supervision or less than medical direction is happening. And it's happening some places, but I think a lot more places are doing anesthesia care team and not billing for it because they're worried that they don't um, completely comply with all of the uh, regulations. Okay, so thank I think you. some of the data is a little misleading. Okay, appreciate it. This year's second time, Representative Keith Lee, or not? No, not on no. this. No, okay, go ahead. Thank you. To inquire. Go ahead. Um, and then just to uh, to represent Sites' point on this, well, I mean, I guess to I, – I, and, and maybe this question would be better suited to uh, someone who is, I guess, here on behalf of a facility itself. I mean, I, I do see this as restricting um, – May, that may not be the intent, but I, I do see restrictive language in this regarding collabor collaboration. I mean, it, if you look at Section 7 on page 10, um, a certified registered nurse anesthesia, 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 as defined in subsection 8 shall not be required to enter into a collaborative practice arrangement. It does not say who's requiring them. I, I mean, if I, if I were a, a CRNA, I, I could read that and say, no, my facility can't make me enter into this collaborative. I'm, I'm completely independent as far as the decision to go into collaboration. Um, I don't know if you can speak to that as, as whether facilities have these, these collaboration requirements beyond supervision or if they would seek to input those, but I, I'm, I'm curious how restrictive that would actually be on the facility. I don't know if that's the intent behind how that language is, but I think that's how it reads. I can't comment to it, but it does worry us, and that's part of part of the language that worries us, and what we see as a possible, you know, down the road effect. Thank you. I'm gonna raise my own hand. Uh, when we look at rural practice, and we look at, you know, and I, I'm in an area that has had two hospitals close, and we are desperate. But is that desperation caused in part by how we do Medicare and Medicaid? And is the reason we're getting CRAs 
at these hospitals is because we're billing, getting percent of bill and administrators cannot pay for an anesthesiologist because of Medicare and Medicaid as a percent of bill, which is lower in my area, which is 40 miles from Columbia than it is in Columbia. Is that correct? I think that is correct. I think the other part of it is it's very clear that um, complicated procedures are done better at places that do a lot of them. Um, every time that I'm on call, not even on call, every time I'm working in St. Louis, we get a transfer from one of Mercy's rural hospitals. Every day there is something added to our operating room schedule because it's something that isn't done in the rural place. And that's not a bad thing. I think that's good for the patient. When you go to a place that's doing more cases, you have a surgeon who's doing more of one thing, um, they do a better job. That's been very clearly documented in, um, in many studies. So I don't disparage the rural hospitals from shipping patients up to, uh, up to a, an urban center. But that's the, re- that's the reality. And that's why we have 50 anesthesiologists where I work. That's why we have 70 anesthetists at where I work. Um, because we're doing more cases, because we're doing more complicated things. Um, the bread and butter, easy procedures are done in these places. The last thing I'll say is anesthesia has become very safe. Um, And so when you look at, oh, are are the outcomes better with or without, the outcomes are good no matter what you do. Uh, Because of the 50 to 60 years of work, um, uh, groundbreaking work on patient safety that has been led by physicians in the anesthesia space. Um, That can't be overlooked, that all of that work to create a safe environment um, shouldn't be used as a as a reason to um, dis uh, I don't know to 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 take away from the physicians that helped create that. As a rural legislator, I am confirmly convinced that our Medicare and Medicaid system is choking our rural hospitals on their payment systems, and we're de- a lot of what we're talking about of lack of rural care is due to government interference in the form of Medicaid, Medicare, and Obamacare. And what's designed to help has actually hastened the destruction of rural, rural, rural medical systems. And if you're in one of those areas and you think you're getting a fair shake, I think you're, I think you're sadly mistaken. And I think that's part of what we're discussing here is not whether we have anesthetists. I think it's a function of the payment system we're getting on Medicare, Medicaid, and other systems. And uh, that's another band box I'm on, and I'm through. (laughs) But uh, other questions. By the way, I think you could run for politics. I've been married 50 years, and you danced around that of hacking your wife off when you go home at night. I thought marvelously. So (laughs) I I wish I could do as well when I get home tonight. So uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Any other questions? Uh, I'm sorry. Any other questions? All right, we are to someone in support. Oh, quick quick idea. How many more would he have in support? How many in opposition? Tell Mama breakfast is coming in, I guess. So is there other room still? Uh, (laughs) police making sure we're not convicts in here so okay all right uh because the numbers that would take us about to 11 30 what we have right now we need to really speed it up and cut them down uh go ahead all right good evening um my name is uh, dr andrew palmasano um I'm a board-certified orthopedic surgeon from Jackson County. Uh, I support this bill for a couple different reasons I'll get into. Um, First off, the operating room is very much a team effort, as we've discussed already tonight. Uh, We each have our our role to do and our specific area of expertise. Um, I complete uh, complex joint reconstructive surgeries, and the CRNA in the room performs the anesthetic, and that allows me to do what I do. Um, Just as the CRNA is not qualified to supervise the surgery that I complete, I don't feel I'm qualified to supervise or to perform their role. Uh, By having the operating surgeon sign off or supervise the CRNA, 
um, liability that is not warranted or appropriate is now shifted onto that surgeon, uh, podiatrist, or uh, dentist. Uh, the operating surgeon has enough liability uh, for the procedure itself, um, and I don't want to take on the liability of the anesthetic or the CRNA. Um, so I think shifting this, this liability to the appropriate provider makes logical sense. Um, along with this, I feel many surgeons would agree, um, and they do not want to take on uh, the liability and practice in the areas where there is excess liability, as we've been discussing. Uh, I believe the burden serves to limit uh, care and surgical services and specialties in these areas of the state, uh, which are predominantly CRNA only, um, and removing this barrier will allow better access uh, and better care for our patients. Uh, lastly, I've spoken to many of my surgical colleagues as well as the anesthesia physicians that I work with on a daily basis, none of which have opposed this bill um, and all of which agree that removing the burden from the surgeon, uh, placing the liability on the person that's actually performing these, these um, uh, duties would only serve our communities and our patients better moving forward. Open to any questions. Questions? I... I I, I have one real quick. So if you're doing that, we've had a lot of discussions earlier on about uh, uh, liability. You're just saying basically it shifts the liability of CRNA, and necessarily if we shift liability, their malpractice has to go up, correct? Um, if you're shifting liability from yourself because of that liability, then it's going to be on the CRNA. So somebody's going to have to have that responsibility, either the hospital or or the CRNA, correct? I mean, I've got lawyers here, so. So, but, honestly, I don't know. I mean, that's my question. Somebody, the liability doesn't go away, so by shifting it, it their, their malpractice has to go up if you're shifting responsibility. So, potentially, honestly, I don't know about CRNA's liability insurance. Okay, but, but you would feel your responsibility, your liability would go down. It would go down. I don't think it would lower my malpractice. Um, you know, <laughs> that'd be nice. But uh, well, with insurance, it probably increases both of your liability. You both of your <laughs> malpractice goes up. I would guess, but I don't know that. But that—that that was a question. So you don't know the answer to that. I do sure. not know the answer. To okay, that. Representative Lewis. Okay. Go ahead. Good evening. Thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to just make sure I heard correctly. Um, you said none of the. None of your group opposes this. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And how? <clears throat> excuse me. How many um, uh, surgeons are in your group? So we we have about f about forty surgeons, um, and I've spoken to you know friends of mine, and I I was at a previous practice that I've spoke with a couple of those as well, um, and it's all basically the the same concern that we have is liability. And a lot of us, you know, we practice outside of Kansas City, mm -hmm. um, and you know we don't want to. I don't want to go to some of these communities just because of that, because of the liability um, issues and things. And, um, you know, it was discussed that some of the, some of the particular surgeries, you know, um, more complex surgeries aren't performed in some of the outlying uh, areas. Um, it, we're really talking, you know, bread and butter cases and surgeries and things like that that, you know, don't need to go to a big community or a big, um, you know, urban area, um, but that allows more access to care. So, um, even the anesthesiologists that we have at our hospital, um, they agreed with the, you know, with that, that they thought that that would allow, you know, better access to care. There's already CRNA only um, areas of the state, you know, quite a bit of them. Um, and that allows some of those, you know, more standard type cases to stay in those places. A lot of my patients, um, I do a lot of revision surgeries. Uh, so I do hip and knee replacements and a lot of broken ones or failed ones. Um, they come in from two, three hours away. A lot of these patients are 80 years old. They got to drive, you know, quite a bit. They get hotel rooms. They have, you know, family come with them. Um, so some of these things, if they can stay near their community, it's a lot safer for them. Um, but clearly, if they're more complex things or more more complex patients in general, they're going to still go to the big city. But uh, it's you know, it's to allow better access to care for the majority of people in those areas. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I just want to quickly point out, um, I want to thank all the people in Scrubs who aren't going to be testifying, but are hanging in here, showing their either support or opposition. It's really, really nice to have you all involved. So just wanted to give a shout out to all of you just being part of the process. Representative Fogel. Thank you to inquire. Go ahead. 
Can you, we've covered this um, already somewhat, but I just want a, a specific answer or a or more technical answer. When you're either pre-op, in surgery, or post-op, are you in the moment directing the dosage and the meds that the CRNA is pushing? So I, I am not. Um, you know, to tell you a little bit, you know, of my anesthesia training, uh, when when I'm in when I was in residency, we had to do a month of anesthesia. Uh, we had to do an oral exam at the end of that uh, to, to test out of it. I asked on my first day if I could take that, that oral exam, and I did, and I passed it. I took a month off. So I did not have any specific training on that. That's not part of orthopedic residency. Um, it was really just to have anesthesia to have bodies at the place I was at. But, um, you know, I don't know the dosing for – you know, I know the medications of propofol and fentanyl and things, but I have no idea about the dosing or how you would, you know, keep a patient at a certain level or what MAC or any of those types of things. Um, with that said, doesn't mean I'm not involved in the care. You know, if I'm if I'm completing a surgery and they they start, you know, spraying blood, I you know try to say, okay, what's going on? How's your blood pressure? That type of thing. Um, or if I notice that, hey, I don't hear that beep very frequently anymore. You know, why are they? <laughs> at 40, you know, heart rate, well then, yeah, you're involved in that, but I'm not telling them what medications to push and I have no idea what to tell them. Okay. So Just when like you walk they can't into tell the, me what to do when I'm, you know, right. operating. When you walk into the surgery room, that's already taken place and now you're presenting the patients in front of you. At what point are you consenting or signing off in that collaborative practice the dosage and the meds that were pushed when you sign the chart so or it'd be after yeah, after the procedure, but but it, you know, and they have they have their protocols and things, but um, but yeah, I, I can't give them any specifics of, you know, they couldn't ask me, they could ask me and I'd, I'd just look at them. Like, I, I'm not sure how to help you with that. Okay. Um, so I'm in the room. Yes. And I'm still part of the care team, but that's what they've went to school, went to training for. Um, in the majority of cases, if not all cases I'm in, uh, there are anesthesia physicians at my facility, but they never are in the room. Um, they're not the ones performing the day in and day out, you know, in the trenches kind of, uh, of the procedures. Um, and to be honest with you, a lot of them, um, you know, we'll do spinal anesthetics for some of our, some of our replacements. Um, and if, if, you know, if you're not familiar with them, you know, basically you're putting a needle in their back, trying to numb up some of the, some of the nerve roots so that we can perform the surgery. If they're not able to get it, then you would call in your anesthesia, um, attending Well, they come in and oftentimes they go, well, if, if they couldn't get it, they do it all day long. I can't get it. Um, and so, uh, you know, each have their roles and they're they're necessary, but um, you know specifically for liability and talking about access, I think that's that's what this is this is about in my mind. Okay, thank you, Representative Keithley. Thank you to inquire. Go ahead. Um, I just want to clarify some of that as as far as I understand it, I. I, I I don't think that this would really shift liability at all. I think it. I think it just removes you from the liability or removes the the physician. I mean, a CRNA carries malpractice. A CRNA, at least that's my understanding. A CR. If 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 I had if I, I I'm a lawyer. If I had a client and I don't do malpractice medical malpractice, but if I had a client who had an issue go on in surgery, I would I would sue the hospital. I would sue the doctor. I would sue the CRNA too. So I mean, everyone's on the hook for the liability. You're not shifting liability. You're just removing yourself from that liability equation. So I, I mean, that's how I understand it. And I want to make sure that that I'm clear in understanding if that's how you see it, because that's I, I think that's different than shifting it, saying, well, you know, the CRNA is more responsible for what for whatever's administered, and that might be true, but. Um, you know, and I, I would pose the same question to you about, you know, in terms of, in your experience, your your preoperative care with the patient versus, in your experience, the CRNA or the anesthesiologist preoperative care, preoperative care, because I, I think that's an important distinction here um, when we're looking at the, the the patient's involvement and how much they're vetting, how much they're controlling their team, especially. If you know the hospital or the facility or you are seeking to remove yourself from the liability equation, I I I I start questioning that when when you're the one who is putting the team together, the facility is the one who's putting the team together, and the CRNA is not necessarily being chosen by the patient. The patient's choosing you. They're not choosing the anesthesia team to deliver it necessarily. 
Um, unless I, I could be wrong about how that plays out, but that's in my in the couple surgeries I've had in my life, that's how it's played out. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I agree. For for uh, you know, each facility will have their CRNA team or have their anesthesia team, and you know, that's not necessarily the the patient choosing that person. Um, for what I do in total joints, we have you know, you either talk with the CRNA or the anesthesiologist beforehand, so you have met them beforehand. Um, usually, it's a week or two before. Uh, so that we can develop the plan. I think talking about the liability as well as I still have plenty of liability. Uh, I just now, uh, you know, my concern is having liability of the anesthesia itself. So if something goes wrong with anesthesia, um, you know, obviously, like you had mentioned, you're going to name everybody that you possibly can, plus, you know, their family members, anybody. You know, you put it all on there and see how it, see how it shakes out. I think for the anesthesia por- portion of it, if if I'm not the one directing it, I didn't have to sign off on it, that type of thing, then that hopefully would remove me from it and keep the liability on the person that, that you know, uh, is performing that. Um, just like if something goes wrong in surgery, you know, in the in the surgery that I'm doing, the CRNA or the, the you know, uh, anesthesia um, physician, they're not on the hook for that. Um, they're not going to be named for that. So I, so shifting may not be the right term, but I think applying liability to where it should be is probably, you know, more of a correct statement. And then if, uh, if I could just do one more, because I think it might, might, might actually be in the interest of time, because I'll, I'll, and I'll pose this question to you, but I really mean it for, I think, anyone else who comes to testify here, because I can see myself asking this at the same time, because it's the second time I'm asking this. You, you said that this is about access in your mind, expanding the access, and there's been a lot of conversation here tonight devoted, about, devoted to expanding this to the rural areas. And, and I'll be honest, I'm struggling to see how this actually is going to, how this as presented is going to actually increase the amount of surgeries we're able to perform in the state of Missouri. Um, because although you're, although we'd be giving CRNAs this, this, this independence within each surgery, the CRNAs aren't really the bottleneck here. I think it's, it's the physicians who have to be involved in the surgery one way or the other. So, I mean, you're addressing the CRNA independence issue, but you're not addressing the much larger bottleneck that is who's going to be doing the underlying surgery. You still have to have a physician in the room. So if, if we're talking about this in context of whether a liability shield for you is a good idea, let's talk about that. But um, I, it, if, if there's if we're talking about this in the context of, oh, this is a good idea for expanding access to rural areas, I don't really see that right now, and I'm, I'm trying to figure out how, how does this actually accomplish I that. I think it's, it's access of CRNAs. I think it is access of certain surgical specialties. Um, with that said, you know, I'm a subspecialist, um, and I, have, I do a lot of cases that have a lot of liability associated with it and, and doing a lot of revision work. Um, and, you know, going to some of these outlying places where I would have to be the supervising physician for the anesthesia, honestly, it's easier to stay in the city and not have to deal with that. So I do agree with you. I think it's a bottleneck, but I think that by, you know, releasing some of that, at least in my, in my opinion and from talking to my colleagues, um, they would be more likely to go to those areas to perform these surgeries. So it's not, a, it's not an access to CRNAs. It's an access to the care that, you know, a lot of us just don't want to, you know, it's more, more liability that we have to deal with, more issues, you know, more burden, you know, um, you know, some of my, some of my colleagues have tried to learn a bit more about anesthesia before they go to some of these, some of these places. I'm just like, you know, they, I did, I did, you know, six years of training after medical school and none of which was anesthesia. I don't really want to go learn that job too. Um, and I don't think I could appropriately. So, I, I do agree with you, but I think the access to care is getting some of the physicians to go to those areas uh, and remove some of the burden for that. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony and uh, appreciate you being spend the night. <laughs> Maybe the morning, I don't know the way we're going. You're going to have some anesthesia, <laughs> pain management, I think. so. Proceed when ready. All right, Mr. Chairman, committee members, I'm still Tim Swearingen, an anesthesiologist in Springfield, Missouri. Um, side note, Mr. Chairman, I agree with you completely. The Accountable, the Affordable Care Act was absolutely designed to crush uh, small critical access hospitals and drive everything into mega health centers, but that is a discussion for another day. Um, I'd like to start like Dr. Casey. Uh, my wife is also a nurse. 
Um, and it's been my great privilege through my career to work with an outstanding group of nurse anesthetists. I am not anti-nurse, APRN, or nurse anesthetists. I am pro-physician-led care. And one of our nurse anesthetists who I worked with throughout my entire career um, always joked that we should put on a clinic for people to come and see how team-based anesthesia care is delivered. A couple things. Uh, you all know me from my last testimony. I don't belabor this. The map that Representative Cook gave you, if you look in the footnotes, um, they say according to the Nursing Practice Act or the Board of Nursing, um, there are other statutes in those states with regard to the Board of Healing Arts, um, other places in regulatory statute. This is the map according to the American Medical Association of states that require physician involvement in anesthesia in the green. Red is no physician involvement. I can leave that for you. To my surgical colleagues who have testified here today, uh, we kind of danced around the issue, but it does appear that they are just interested in unloading any sort of liability that they have with regard to this procedure. I have never met a surgeon who does not want to be involved in the care of the patient. And let's, you know, don't forget that anesthesia is not just the matter of pushing drugs to put a patient to sleep. We manage blood pressure, and we need to know, you know, is their blood pressure low because they're bleeding to death, because they have sepsis, which is an overwhelming infection which causes it, because they have swelling in their brain, because they have decreased heart function, all these sorts of things. Um, and I've not met a surgeon yet who doesn't want to be involved in aware in those types of decisions. I'm not talking about do I push, you know, 150 or 200 milligrams of propofol, but involvement in the anesthesia care, okay? But what, what I've heard here tonight is I would like to unload the liability. Uh, as Dr. Marshall alluded to, a letter from the American College of Surgeons and the Missouri chapter of the American College who want to preserve physician-led anesthesia care. A couple things, again, that we've danced around here tonight. You're 100% right. I am not a fan of podiatrists or dentists um, being in charge, but, you know, I, I didn't create these rules. I think that, you know, a physician anesthesiologist and an anesthesia care team is the way to do it. I see my time is short, but I want to touch base on one last thing that we've danced around here all night. There is federal legislation called Rural Pass-Through. It gives critical access hospitals, which do less than 800 procedures a year. Now, mind you, if you are doing a fee-for-service, what we would call eat what you kill, you can only bill and collect on 800 procedures a year. You cannot make a living doing that. Critical access hospitals through rural pass-through have the discretion to use Medicare Part A dollars to pay for a CRNA. Why this does not include physician anesthesiologists, I have no idea. But the legislation doesn't. The, the CEOs of these hospitals do not have the discretion to do that same thing for physician anesthesiologists. So I can tell you that if we fix rural pass-through, I do know physician anesthesiologists who would love nothing more than to go back and practice in the area of their youth, where they grew up, Gentry County, Missouri. But they can't because they can't earn a living there. But a, but a CEO of that hospital can pay a CRNA to essentially not do cases or do a very limited number of cases, still a full salary, they can make a living, and we cannot. I believe that one of our senators um, may be sponsoring a resolution to our Missouri delegation, uh, congressional delegation, to try to put a fix on rural pass-through to just simply make those dollars available to physician anesthesiologists. Any questions? Questions. I, one, I think you are, you are very correct, is that, that pass through, a lot of those nuances are killing us in rural hospitals uh, and killing, uh, I know there's some CEOs and some, some office managers of rural hospitals and, 
in a size, they're telling me that they're getting squeezed and can't help it. So, Repton Fogel. To inquire. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Just a follow-up. You know, I know you said if you were living in a perfect world, you might not include dentists, podiatrists, podiatrists and surgeons in a leader of the care team that's administering anesthesia. So can you, that, that's the reality of the situation, how the statute is now. So if your options were a surgeon, a podiatrist, or a dentist to administer anesthesia on you as the patient or a CRNA, where would your comfort level lie? And let, let's answer that one first. Well, so for... for you have to con keep dentists and podiatrists separate because of the types of procedures they do. Of course. But if you're asking me if I would prefer to have a CRNA administer anesthesia without any type of physician supervision, um, or would I want you know to at least have the surgeon involved in my anesthetic care? The answer is yes. I would want the surgeon involved in the the care. Okay. It's. You know, we're we're talking a lot about confidence and an ability um, to do one's job, and it's interesting to me that we've had several surgeons now come on and, and basically publicly testify that they're uncomfortable providing that care or that they don't feel like they have the competency to do it in the same way that their CRNA colleagues do. And, you know, as a patient who might one day have to undergo anesthesia, it's been interesting to hear that even they have that discomfort when we have a room full of CRNAs who are advocating for themselves that they do have confidence in their ability to do that job. So just something that I wasn't necessarily expecting out of today's hearing, but it's been interesting to hear um, both sides of that perspective. I think those surgeons, as I said, are uncomfortable with the liability that goes along with it. Um, I would be shocked if they are not interested in being a part of the care that is provided to their patients. Further questions? Thank you for your testimony, and thank you for hanging with us for a long time. All right, we're talking about in support. Good evening. My name is Amy O'Brien. I live in Audrain County, and I'm the former CEO of Audrain Community Hospital. Our hospital closed in March of 2022 due to financial difficulties stemming from an ownership transition the previous year and not having enough capital to survive that significant change. The hospital did not close because of low patient volumes or an inability to recruit physicians or advanced practice providers. Access to health care is pivotal in a thriving community. Especially in rural areas, health care facilities provide Missourians with necessary primary care preventive medicine, emergency services, and surgical services. And these services would not be possible without CRNAs. Our hospital in Audrain County used all, an all-CRNA model because that is all the hospital budget would afford. Compared to physician anesthesiologist supervision models, the CRNA-only model saves hospitals approximately 39% annually. And this unspent money can then be invested back into the hospital to support technology and staffing needs. Our patients reported having great experiences with CRNAs. We never had a complaint or a safety concern. We provided general surgery, orthopedic surgery, GYN surgery, and ophthalmolic surgery. The only complaints that I ever received were from the general surgeon and the GYN surgeon that they did not like having to sign off on the CRNA work. And at the time, I did not have a solution. So hearing about the House Bill 329, I realized that we could have a solution for surgeons that don't want to sign off on anesthesia services. We can have a solution for the CRNAs to feel valued and appreciated in our state of Missouri. We have the opportunity for CRNAs to legally do what they have been doing for years, and that is providing great anesthesia care to Missourians. Missouri is ranked 47th in overall health care performance. Over the last two years, we realized how important it is for health care organizations to have options for providing care to their patients. 2023 is the year we need to move forward in removing the red tape that clearly serves no purpose. This legislation reduces regulatory burdens on hospitals and physicians and will allow them the flexibility to choose the supervision model that best fits their needs. So I ask you to vote in favor of House Bill 329. Thank you. 
Questions? Seeing none, thank you for hanging with us tonight. Uh, next up, opposition. How many, how many, just a quick poll, how many are left in favor? So I can kind of manage time. Five. Is that the right count? Five. And how many opposed? One opposed. All right. Okay. Go ahead. Good evening. My name is Quinn Johnson. I'm a physician. Uh, I practice anesthesiology in Columbia. I practiced in Joplin for seven and a half years and had the privilege of working in Columbia for the last 13 years. I think tonight, to keep it brief, um, I've, I've heard all the testimony from the previous bills that you all heard, and I, and I know there's a common theme. But I think the common theme is physician involvement in patient care provides superior care. The issue of why a physician can't be involved is varied. There's economic pressures, there's geographical pressures, there's all sorts of things. But the physician involvement and physician-led care is the best. And as a, um, as a state, as a uh, group of professionals, I think we owe it to try and figure out how to provide the most optimal care we can to our patients. Um, while there isn't an, a one solution or an easy solution, I think some of the things that I personally have concern with all of the bills that have been presented tonight, but in particular this bill, is, is it seems to um, over, be a little bit of an overkill. It feels like there's a, we've identified an infection on somebody's arm and we're just going to cut it off and let's just get rid of it. And so this, there's too much red tape, let's just fix the problem, and if we just open the doors, everything will be okay. Um, because what these bills do is it allows for each advanced practice nurse to kind of say, and I've heard it repeatedly tonight, you're going to help determine the extent and, uh, and the parameters that you're going to function under. And I think that's at the heart of the problem. Who's providing the oversight? Who's providing the quality? And the physician is the most advanced trained, the person who has the, the most experience, typically, to help provide that oversight and help all of us understand what the quality needs to be and the extent and the parameters needs to be there. So physician-led care is important. So these bills, I think, again, just leave the door too wide open. Now, briefly, um, I'm glad that it's already been addressed where individuals have said, hey, this does not open the door to chronic pain. Um, I have strong concerns that the language in the bill does allow for chronic pain, and it leaves it wide open because of the way that the language is written about uh, diagnose and intervention and a few things there. Um, I personally have had experience where we've watched individuals, and it's not all of them. I'm, I, I work in a care team model, and I have for 20 years, and I've had great experiences with CRNAs. It's always the 5% that you've got to worry about. And that 5% is going to use these, this open language and the things that we have by completely extracting it and cutting off the arm to take advantage of what's going on. And chronic pain has been delved into by CRNAs in this state, and I've seen it in, our own, in my own city in Columbia where CRNAs have opened a ketamine clinic uh, with not advertising that there's any kind of physician oversight. In fact, they began to say they were anesthesiologists when they first opened the clinic, which is incredibly concerning. This clinic continues to be open uh, ketamine is a drug that we use in anesthesia. It is not something that you just want to have open access to. It has very limited uses, and it can uh, be very dangerous. This one example of what we're dealing with when we're just saying, let's just remove the physician, and it solves all our problems. With that, um, that's why I oppose the bill, and I hope that we can figure out a way to continue <coughs> to have physician-led care, because, again, I think we've all agreed that's the best <coughs> possible care that we can provide to the citizens of Missouri. Um, open for questions. Questions? <coughs> Thank you for your testimony. I, of all, when you mentioned ketamine and rompin, and uh, you mentioned rompin, but ketamine as a veterinarian, uh, I have seen the effects of ketamine, and this isn't good. You know, uh, <coughs> as you see dogs and cats and horses going under anesthesia. Uh, in veterinary medicine, we have a term for the cut off the arm. We call it put them down. You know, so everything is put them down, and uh, that way we don't treat them. So. Uh, it's getting late, all right? <laughs> Next witness. <coughs> I'm 
Good evening. My name is Dennis Purcell. I'm a board certified Missouri licensed OBGYN specialist, and I served as a combat surgeon during Operation Desert Storm. I'm here to speak in favor of House Bill 329, and I'm here to tell you that I'm here as a surgeon. I'm not an anesthetist. I'm not an anesthesiologist. And in the rural hospital that I've served in in the last 12 years, I haven't had availability of an anesthesiologist ever once, ever once. I've worked with nurse anesthetists for over 36 years, and I'm here to tell you that as a group, they are the most steadfast, dependable, hardworking, well-educated, well-trained individuals you're going to ever find on this earth. I've had surgery myself with the anesthesia administered by nurse anesthetist, and I would highly recommend it. Please understand that when I walk into a rural Missouri operative theater, I am the surgical expert in the room. I am not the anesthesia expert. That role is filled by a very capable nurse anesthesia, nurse anesthetist in my facility. And unlike some of the testimony you've had previously, my nurse anesthetist can do laryngoscopic uh, intubations. Uh, they can do tap blocks. They can do other things that are at the cutting edge of uh, um, medical science. And they have the capability to give the best doggone anesthesia that you would need in an emergency situation. There are times when we don't have time to triage a patient and get them off to the big city center. I would love more than anything I could tell you to have full, all the time, anesthesia care in my hospital, but it's not a reality. It's a, it's a dream. Someday, maybe, but I doubt it. I doubt it, not the way things are going. So just to summarize, I'm here to speak in favor of House Bill 329. I think it's somewhat irksome that a nurse anesthetist has to have me sign off on their anesthesia chart when in reality I don't know what the hell I'm doing, and they do. They're the experts. I do the surgery. And between the two of us, we keep the patient alive and well. We wake them up and we get them home. I want my colleagues in anesthesia to know I am not antithetical to anesthesiologists in the way. Some of my best friends are anesthesiologists. But I'm here to tell you that they're just not everywhere. And no matter which kind of a map we hold up to you, in Missouri, there is a real cringing lack of anesthesia. So we can't provide this model of care that everybody is talking so altruistically about. We just can't do it in rural health care at the current time. Thank you for your attention. And I wanted to take a moment just to thank your committee. Uh, I, I am so impressed at how well you serve your constituents. And I thank you for your, your service. Did we record that? <laughs> we, are we are recording. Oh, we are recording. Right. Questions? Recording. Representative Seitz. Yes, very briefly, I'd just like to thank you for your service to our nation. I appreciate that. My privilege. Representative Toshin Reich, <laughs> you have not participated, so I'm going to give you a chance here. <laughs> okay. I've been listening all night to every testimony except when I step out of the room for a moment. But uh, he, he's saying this because I haven't asked a question all night. So I'll ask my first and last question. What hospital do you work at? Mercy, Lebanon. Lebanon. I'm now retired and I'm doing a consultative practice in Lebanon. My grandchildren live near Lebanon. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Further questions. <laughs> I, now I'll pick on you. Pick on you. That's okay. Further questions. Okay. I wanted a question from the nurse in the room. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Patty. But. Thank you very much for your and your time, your effort, and your drive from Lebanon. Okay, so that in opposition. Good evening. Good evening. Um, sorry, it's kind of late. Um, my name is Dr. Yulia Peniston. I'm an OBGYN physician. 
Um, I work in a rural hospital um, in Chillicothe, Missouri. And I'm here to support the House Bill 329. Um, I had um, a great opportunity to work with um, our group of CRNAs for the past, since 2011. And um, the best group of uh, CRNAs I've ever worked with. Um, I don't think I can go and um, repeat. I can't remember which physician was here, the OBGYN physician who just spoke. Um, he basically said everything that I wanted to say. Um, I would not be able to do what I do without CRNAs. Um, one of the things that was not brought up to um, our attention this evening is, yes, there is a crisis in rural America, um, but I think not letting CRNAs do what they do the best will make the crisis worse. For example, um, I take call from home. So when a pregnant patient comes in in labor, she requires an epidural if she chooses to do so. If I have to come in for every single epidural in the middle of the night to supervise my CRNAs, I will not be able to do my job the next day. And of course, I have to attend to C-sections and do GYN surgery. So I, I really do think that they're very, very, very capable. They know what they're doing. Um, I just sign a piece of paper. That's all I do. And unfortunately, I don't know what they're doing. And um, going back to um, being a team, we always communicate together. Um, I am there for my patients um, every single step of the way. Um, if the machine beeps, I kind of look over to make sure nothing is happening, and I communicate with my, with my CRNAs. If, if I provide any kind of local anesthetic, I will let them know that I'm injecting a local anesthetic to make sure there's no changes in blood pressure. If they tell me that the patient is not breathing well and we need to take the patient out of the Trendelenburg for the patient to breathe well, we'll do it right away. So it's always a team effort. It's never he or she's doing her job and his job and I'm doing my job. We're doing it together to provide the best patient care that we possibly can. Sorry, I don't know why I'm so nervous. <laughs> Any uh, questions? Questions. Uh, you're testifying in favor then? Yes, sir. Uh, have you filled out a witness form? Yes, I have. Okay. Uh, forgot to remind me. I need to remind everyone, make sure you fill out witness form. Questions? Thank you for your coming down all the way from Chillicothe. We appreciate it. Uh, opposition? Go ahead and start. Thank you very much. I'm um, Dr. Kathy Perryman. I'm here in... Missouri Society of Anesthesiologists, and uh, I just want to talk to you a bit about my experience. I started off as a nurse. I became a nurse anesthetist and practiced in a care team setting as a nurse anesthetist. And uh, I heard the question here earlier today, why in the world would you go back to school for four years and add another four-plus years on to that, to be, you know, a resident, to become an anesthesiologist. And my answer to that question was that I knew that um, I wanted to have that full knowledge base. I wanted to have the skill set and that I could not achieve as a nurse anesthetist. And um, I really um, loved what I was doing and... Uh, I really understood that the um, staff anesthesiologist that I was working with and collaborating with was um, a, an extremely port, important part of the team. And there were several instances during my career in which that anesthesiologist um, intervened and really made a big difference in the patient's safety. And that happens with surgeons as well. Um, so I did. I went back to school for four years. I finished my uh, anesthesiology residency, did a fellowship in pediatric anesthesiology, and had a wonderful practice collaborating again with uh, CRNAs for over three decades. So I value them as members of the team. Most of the CRNAs that I've known over my career would not want to practice independently, but when they are, you know, if they're in a rural setting, the the surgeon is a, a very important part of that team. We collaborate with surgeons all the time in tertiary care centers, and um, 
the description that the last um, OBGYN gave is very, very much, I think, what we're talking about retaining is that teamwork that is so important in patient care and patient safety. Thank you. You're obviously bringing a, a different approach from anybody we've had so far. Questions? Again, Dr. Perman, thank you for spending a long, long day, and, and we appreciate your effort. Thank so, you. Uh, let's see. This is opposition in favor. Yeah, and how, how many, again, I'm taking a hand to count. How many left in favor? I think they are multiplying outside. I, I think I think there's something there's something going on outside that we don't know about here. You know, <laughs> so all right, that was a favor. How many opposed? One. Okay. Commence. Hello, my name is Carla Klubine, and I am the chief executive officer of Pershing Memorial Hospital, a critical access hospital located in Lynn County, Missouri. Our hospital, as small as it is, still has some um, outpatient services that perform procedures at our facility, and those include orthopedics, gastroenterology, urology, ophthalmology, and podiatry. At Pershing Hospital, our anesthesia services have been provided solely by CNRAs for more than 30 years. In the 31 years that I have been a part of our organization, the care provided by our CRNAs have been nothing short of exceptional. In the 15 months that I have served as the CEO, I have not received one complaint or concern from patients, staff, or physicians regarding the quality of care or professionalisms our, C our CRNAs provide. Access to health care impacts the quality of life of citizens in rural communities such as mine. Without our hospital, patients would be required to travel up to 90 miles to receive some of the same outpatient procedures that they receive at my facility. We serve a large elderly population. Transportation for this population can be very difficult and impossible at times. Due to challenges of travel, many of our elderly patients will decline referrals or procedures that require them to travel more than just a few miles. During my time as CEO, I have been actively trying to recruit both primary care and specialty physicians to my facility to say this is challenging is an understatement. The rural community is not attractive to the physician candidates for various reasons. Some of those include supervisory responsibilities. If not for CNRAs providing services or providing anesthesia coverage at my facility, we would not be able to provide the limited number of services that I listed to you earlier. And um, the loss of that revenue alone would be enough to impact my facility's ability to stay open. When rural hospitals close, more patients are left without access to health care. Um, thank you. Okay. Questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. I appreciate that's a long drive from Lynn County, Missouri this time of night, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, and opposite, let's see, that was, I uh, need an opposition. Proceed when ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, David Jackson, registered lobbyist for the Missouri Society of Anesthesiologists. Um, I don't know how it's over 10 o'clock, and we haven't had a joke about people falling asleep yet, given the contents of the bill, but I'll uh, <laughs> provide that dad joke. Um, in all seriousness, I want to thank the committee. I, I know uh, this has been a long day, a long hearing, uh, but we have people on both sides of here who have you know, come and traveled a long way, and this is, uh, this is their profession. They went to school a long time to do this, regardless of what side you're on, and a lot of hearings like this, people start filtering off and, and leaving, so uh, we, we thank Thank you for regardless of where you stand on the bill. Um, I, I think it's important to think about and go back to patients. We haven't, you know, had anybody testify as a patient today, you know, talking about what they want uh, in their anesthesia care when they go into surgery and who they want involved in their anesthesia. I think Dr. Swearingen mentioned before, and I think it's important to reiterate the, the map that everyone talks about in these 46 states, uh, in my opinion, is very misleading in that that uh, is relative to the word supervision. And so states that require medical direction or collaboration or involvement, or if the statutes are in the Board of Healing Arts chapter and not the Board of Nursing chapter, it is not counted in that colored map. So I think that's important to clarify as we're thinking about what's going on in other states. Uh, secondly, I think it's important to look at the current law and what's currently being provided. Right now, 
CRNAs are already permitted to provide anesthesia care without an anesthesiologist in rural hospitals. I think as Representative Keithley mentioned, this does nothing to change the amount of surgeries. If this bill passes, you can't do any more surgeries. You still have to have the surgeon. What this bill says is that the physician in the room is no longer the quarterback. And opposed to you know the other bill we talked about before, when you have somebody that takes a prescription you know maybe and comes back in a week or is in a collaborative practice arrangement with the doctor 75 miles away, you have a little more time. When you're under anesthesia, seconds matter. And so what this says is that a physician and even a surgeon, they can delegate something to the CRNA as much or as little as they feel comfortable. But that physician has that critical care training and managing an emergency. And, it's, and we feel that patients want and deserve to have that physician involved in that care. Um, in regards to the protocols, I'm happy to discuss more of that offline with you. As I said, I'm here every day. All a facility has to do is have a protocol in place that says, here is a range of medications that, that's provided for each surgery. And if you go beyond those protocols, beyond that range, in a certain scenario, you have to get a verbal order from the doctor during surgery, and they sign off on it afterwards. Um, I, I'm a little shocked how many people have said that you know this is already happening and, and seem to be admitting not following the current law, uh, which is a little alarming. Um, but when we talk about rural areas right now in where you don't have anesthesiologist, it's a very small percentage of the total surgeries provided. I think as one of the physicians mentioned earlier, a lot of things are getting rerouted to the urban areas uh, for a reason. Um, but um, I know I'm over my time limit. Thank you. Questions? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Uh, let's see, that was opposition in favor. Uh, good evening. My name is Joe Dietrich. I'm a CRNA in Chillicothe. Uh, Dr. Penniston and Ms. Klebein uh, are in hospitals that I work at, and we're very fortunate to have them there. I've been a CRNA for 28 years, 16 years at Truman Medical Center in Kansas City as a CRNA instructor in an anesthesia care team setting, and the last 12 years in private practice in a rural setting. Our group provides uh, sole CRNA coverage to six hospitals in North Missouri. We cover over 5% of Missouri counties. I'm going to get to, I think I can answer your question about collaborative practice. I believe I can answer your question about pain management. I'm going to talk to you about other situations. My concern with the need to pass this bill is that there is such a convoluted pathway to both the supervision issue and the prescriptive authority issue that we can't comply with them all the time or we're at risk for adverse interpretation by a regulator and therefore can be cited or lose the possibility of obtaining some services. Uh, I would certainly challenge that I can provide safe anesthesia and done so. I can tell you in our hospitals, our employees actually seek out the CRNAs to provide their anesthesia. I do know Dr. Perryman about 30 years ago in my training, I rotated with her at, uh, in my pediatric rotation and appreciated that very much. So to your question about supervision outside the operating room, there are situations where that's necessary. When we do labor pain analgesia, that's usually in the labor and delivery suite. There's physician not necessarily immediately there, the obstetrician. Sometimes we do radio radiological sedation and an MRI spe most specifically. And we may be get called for critical services such as airway management or code blues in the OR, I'm sorry, in the ER or in the ICU. We don't have an operating practitioner in those. Now, a little history is the operating uh, practitioner and supervision definition actually comes from CMS and Medicare, and then got codified in the statutes. So we're having to work backwards to undo this. We've got to get it out of the statutes before we can get it cleared by Medicare. Medicare defines what anesthesia is only in the hospital regulations. So we, we have to do this weaving thing to try to pretend that we're following all the regulations. Also, there are times in an emergency specific to the prescriptive authority when we can't have those signed in advance that BNDD has said is necessary. If we have an emergency C-section, they can't put those orders in. Or if in the middle of the night I'm doing a labor epidural, the obstetrician may have called in the order to admit the patient, which includes an order for the epidural to be placed on the patient request. If I need to give ephedrine, which is a controlled medication to support the blood pressure, I don't have an order in for that, and the, patient would the nurse would have to wake up the physician to get that. Mind you, the controlled substance is very narrowly focused to the perioperative environment, to the drugs that we give every day, 
we're in recovery room where I know what that patient received, how they responded, and what the best choice is. I'm not trying to expand practice in those cases. So for us, it's streamlining the convoluted processes to reduce the risk uh, of adverse interpretations. And one of the other things in the CMS regulations that relieving supervision would cause refers to podiatrists and dentists. The CMS regulations, unfortunately, are contradictory in their description of who can supervise. We actually had a state surveyor in Bethany last October, and thank goodness I was there because I know the regulations, who questioned whether we could do a sedi uh, an anesthetic for a podiatry case uh, because they weren't an MD or a DO. And I showed her where that is in the CMS regulations, but they're a little contradictory. So we need to clean these up so we can just continue essentially the practices that we're doing, but without risk of losing our licenses, being cited, or the hospitals losing their ability to do podiatry or dental cases, which all six of the hospitals we cover do one or the other. Thank you. I, I have a question. So you're saying we need CMS revisions that what we're doing is not going to affect. I, I got a little lost on that. I know it, it's it's convoluted. Maybe because we can't, so, we don't have any control over CMS. I wish we did. No, you don't. Know. Except, so supervision is something that was going to be relieved entirely by CMS back in the year two thousand and one because of a nineteen ninety eight article that showed we were just as safe. However, because of uh, the push pull, throw something against the wall, some, everything against the wall, something will stick. They came up, and the states can opt out of the supervision regulation. But we have to get out of the statute before the governor can opt out of the supervision. And the description of supervision in the CMS guidelines is variable. If we're free of the supervision, then we don't have the issue providing uh, any question about being able to provide anesthesia for dental or surgical cases. That also gets into the definition of what is anesthesia. Is a sedation case where I give a little bit of medication uh, actually an anesthetic? Is labor pain relief an anesthetic? Those are defined differently in different places, and those things become crystal clear and okay if we can get relief from the supervision guidelines. And then regarding the prescriptive authority, again, there are just times we can't comply in spite of best efforts for putting in an order set that I personally wrote for our institutions uh, for the physician to sign for me to give. And to your question, if I may address the previously addressed questions, if that's okay. You asked about pain management. Back in 2014, a bill was passed that <clears throat> prevented CRNAs from using advanced modal uh, imaging modalities such as CT scanning or uh, real-time x-ray. So being able to place the spinal cord stimulator is not feasible. These orders only allow us to administer medications in the perioperative environment, so we can't send them home on a script for pain medicine. Ketamine clinic, okay, I, I don't know, maybe, but low-dose ketamine has actually been proven to be very helpful in a number of situations. But the type of pain management you're referring to, uh, Representative Thomas, I don't see as feasible just because you can't use the imaging necessary, which was the entire intent of the bill in 2014. Uh, you had a question about the uh, collaborative practice. That's where things got muddied uh, years back uh, when they wanted to give APRN's prescriptive authority uh, and in a collaborative practice agreement, CRNAs were specifically carved out of being able to give those. I think the concern by the opposition was, okay, a CRNA could get collaborative practice agreement, use the prescriptive authority to do what we're asking to be, do going forward. Collaborative practice and supervision are not the same thing. Supervision is a definition that comes down from Medicare. just means we have to work in the presence during an anesthetic of the MD, DO, podiatrist, or dentist. Again, you get in the definition of exactly what's anesthesia. So there's nobody I know uses collaborative practice in a nurse anesthesia environment. For us, it'd be impossible. We cover six hospitals. We have five full-time CRNAs, several part-time CRNAs. The, the math just wouldn't work in those situations anyway. And all we need to do is have the presence of the practitioner in the operating room. That part's not going to change. What's going to change is the, uh, the regulatory risk from interpretation of these, our, our ability to navigate these little zigzags of the convoluted regulations, and making sure we're doing everything we can to be compliant. Representative Stennett. 
So am I understanding that you're saying there's always a physician, podiatrist, or dentist throughout your administering of the anesthesia process? In a true, in an anesthetic in the operating room, that's correct. Because they're the people that are only allowed by CMS to do surgery. Okay. So there's never a point in time where you're with the patient and they aren't present either before they start the surgery or immediately during Immediately available is a common phrase, but we don't start a procedure until the surgeon's in the operating suite, so to speak. And they may be back out dictating, but they're going to come follow up on the patient. Again, we have a very cooperative environment with all our surgeons. We're very fortunate in that regard. So a protocol change would not be sufficient enough to address the issue that you talked about where a physician was at home, you needed to start, say, an epidural. I don't, I'm not an anesthesiologist, they, they can't so call, forgive me. They but, cannot call in a controlled medication order set. Okay. Uh, and if the patient comes in, in the middle of the night and they haven't got on the computer, because they would only do this on somebody they've already seen in clinics. If there's a what might call a walk-in, somebody from another town they've never seen, they would come in and see that patient directly. Um, but they can't. They would have to get on a computer to do an online order mm -hmm. for those situations. And it's not one. I, I give ephedrine for. Um, and labor epidural and low blood pressure. It's a blood pressure medication probably once every 20 or 30 or 40 epidurals. It's not common. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it gets back to the stuff. This is what I do every day, mm -hmm. multiple times. And I'm the only one in advanced practice without prescriptive authority to any degree. Sure. Okay, thanks. Further questions? If not, thank you very much thank for your you testimony. Thank you very much. We appreciate, appreciate it. Sean. Uh, let's see. Opposition. Okay. If we're through with opposition, opposition or in favor? Opposition. Okay. My name is Ryan DeBoof. I'm a registered lobbyist for the Missouri Association of Osteopathic Physicians and Surgeons. I certainly cannot add any more to the expertise you guys have heard tonight, but wanted to go on the record in opposition to the bill. Happy to answer any questions. Questions? If not, thank you. Thank Appreciate you. it. In uh, support, uh, apparently all the opposition is down in support. How many more have we got in support? Those rabbits are still going out there. All right, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Michael Burns. I'm here in support of uh, House Bill 329. Uh, just to introduce myself, I've been a CRNA in the state of Missouri for 22 years. I'm currently a professor of nurse anesthesia in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, prior to that, I did work in uh, rural Missouri for 20-plus years, uh, performing the various anesthetic tasks. Um, I'm definitely a proud member of the nursing profession. We certainly are not anti-anesthesiologists. I respect their profession and respect all their contributions as well, and I've enjoyed working with them throughout the years. Just to explain the nurse anesthesia education, uh, it's a four-year undergraduate degree. It's required prior to... Uh, applying to nurse anesthesia. They must have, uh, on average, one to four years of critical care experience as well. Um, that varies. Most, I think they gave you the average of four and a half years seems to be the average uh, experience. One of the concerns that I wanted to make sure I address that, let's say this bill passes tomorrow, uh, we can't take a lot of more applicants into the nurse anesthesia programs. And that's regulated by the Council of Accreditation of our national body up in Chicago. And so the number of CRNAs that are, you know, of the 26,000 RNs in the state of Missouri, we're only allowed to take less than 80 uh, CRNAs in the four programs in the state of Missouri. And so in order to increase that number, it would take quite the rigorous process for us to be able to increase that even just the slightest amount per program. So we do appreciate that uh, we do have a nursing shortage, and certainly by uh, increasing the um, – access to health care or decreasing the supervision, this would not take from the, the floor nurses and so forth within the state of Missouri. As far as uh, once they accept into the nurse anesthesia program, we have three years, 36 months of uh, doctorate prepared education. Uh, upon completion of that, uh, they've completed greater than 2,000 hours in the cockpit, if you will, and performing anesthesia. If you compare that to our commercial airline pilots of 1,500 hours, 
um, versus cargo of 2,000 hours, certainly uh, that has some appeal. If you add our ICU experience, we're going to need 8,000 or more hours of total in the clinical area. And we have a recertification process and reboarding. As far as the malpractice, I think we all presented studies that uh, you know, one group's really good, the other group's pretty good. I think really the, the proof's of the pudding that the malpractice insurance uh, rates have actually gone down. And I think both sides have alluded to anesthesia has become pretty safe as far as the medications, the monitoring devices, the advancement. So you have to have an enormous studies to show a little difference, uh, if any. Uh, but I've enjoyed, I've uh, been in this uh, for 22 years, but in three decades, the anesthesia premiums have actually gone down 36%. And if you do a, a cost for inflation, uh, it's around 74% reduction. <laughs> I, I wish all my other insurances would go down as far as my auto and my home and so forth. So, so I think both the anesthesiology world and the nurse anesthetist world, we've enjoyed a reduction in our malpractice uh, premiums. We certainly have a high-risk business, but I think both professions are truly dedicated to patient safety. And that has been shown that we don't have a lot of claims and therefore we have decreased liability insurance. So, you know, when you look at states that are opt-out, there's certainly a few of those. They happen to surround Missouri. I think a lot of our folks are wanting to go to those particular states and practice when they graduate the nurse anesthesia programs. But nonetheless, those malpractice insurance rates aren't elevated either. And uh, we, we checked with our national organization, and they do not change the premiums. The MedPro underwrites them. They also underwrite the uh, anesthesiology malpractice insurance rates as well. And so both groups of, again, our dedication to patient safety has, has reigned king. We actually have decreased claims in both groups, and certainly our insurance rates are uh, been shown to be reduced. Thank you for your time. Any questions? Questions? <clears throat> Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. That was very helpful on the malpractice. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, in support. Hi, my name is Morgan Roberts. I'm an OR nurse. Um, I've been working as an OR nurse in Columbia for the last five years. Um, so I work in a large hospital with CRNAs and anesthesiologists. Um, so I work in the operating room every single day. Um, and I just wanted to note, you know, I think we've covered a lot of the same thing over and over again, so I'll try to make it short. But I just want to note that the supervision that is that the anesthesiologists are giving to the CRNAs is not probably what you're thinking of as supervision. Um, the anesthesiologist typically will come in the room as the patient's going off to sleep, and then they'll leave the room, and the CRNA will stay uh, in the room with the patient for the rest of the procedure. So no one is guiding the CRNA throughout the entire case. They're doing that. Um, they're very, you know, capable of making those decisions of what med medications they need to give, how to adjust their anesthesia throughout the case. Um, and then at the end of the case, anesthesiologists will come in, sign off on the chart, and that's pretty much the extent of what the supervision is on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so that being said, if I'm having surgery or if a family member is having surgery, I will specifically request a CRNA for that care, um, just based on what I see in my everyday practice. That's all. Questions? <clears throat> thank you very much, and thank you for sticking with us as long as you have. Further opposition? Support. Support. I'm sorry, support. Uh, make sure everybody fills out their uh, their. Uh, Sheets, yeah, still, still, that, we all saw that where they all got out of the Volkswagen, they kept coming, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Jack Siegel. I'm the outreach manager for the Missouri Nurses Association, and I want to go on record in support of the bill on behalf of our nurse members uh, throughout the state. I don't want to repeat uh, much of the testimony that you've heard already. I'm sure it's been a very long hearing for everyone. Uh, what I will say is that um, supporting this bill would help uh, CRNAs continue providing health care in Missouri uh, to people who need it, especially in rural settings. It would remove restrictions and concerns over liability and put Missouri more in line with states that border it. Uh, I think all of those are good reasons, and I'm happy to try to answer any questions. Questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Come on up. <laughs> Make sure you fill out your forms, please. I have. Mr. Chairman, I, uh, I love the way that you say Missouri. 
That's the correct way to That's say it. That's the only way to say it. That's the only way. And I think I may be close to the last one, so we'll get out of here before midnight. Um, anyways, my name is Zach Smith. I grew up in the rural town of Clever, Missouri. My dad was a lineman for Ozark Electric, and my mom taught fourth grade Missouri State history, so I kind of know what's going on here. Um, I'm very happily married and have three beautiful daughters. After graduating from Mercy College in Springfield, Missouri with my nursing degree, I worked exclusively in the intensive care unit for seven years. Um, I've had the opportunity to serve in several of our Missouri hospitals from level one trauma centers all the way down to small community hospitals. I was admitted to Missouri State University's CRNA program where I'm currently a student nurse anesthetist and I will graduate in 2025, hopefully. Um, as a former ICU nurse, I was trained to be extremely vigilant in the care of my patients, and this carries over to my current education. When literal seconds matter, CRNA students are being trained on what to do, when to do it, and how to keep our patients safe and alive. Upon graduation, I will have approximately 2,400 hours of training on top of my 13,000 clinical hours as an ICU nurse. After speaking with my fellow students, um, many of them are here today, if they would raise their hands. Um, we are all struggling with the same dilemma. We all struggle with deciding where to work and where to raise our families after graduation. We have 43 other states to choose from that do not require burdensome supervision for the surgeon or restrictions on our future licenses. I wanted this testimony to be accurate and reflect some of the feelings of my fellow students. This was the response from a survey of CRNA, CRNA students in Missouri. 81% of the students in Missouri are Missouri residents. 73% of those students from Missouri have possible intentions to leave the state after graduation. 61 intend to leave so that they can have an unrestricted license and the ability to practice at the height of their education and training. I live with an easy driving distance of Arkansas, Oklahoma, and Kansas, three of the 43 states that have updated laws that reflect how anesthesia care is actually provided in the operating room. I do not want to serve the people of those states. I do not want to practice my skill outside of the state of Missouri. I love the idea of serving my family, friends, neighbors, and those in need of health care in rural Missouri. I have deep ties with my family and friends, and I'm actively involved in my community. I want nothing more than to work in the state of Missouri. But unless this law is changed, I have decided to move to a state that will embrace my training and expertise. Politicians always talk about wanting to make Missouri a great place to live, work, and raise your family. You now have the opportunity to do that for my family with this bill. I ask that you please support House Bill 329 so that myself and many of my fellow students that are here have the ability to stay in Missouri and serve in the communities, both big and small, that we all love. Thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Questions? Yes, sir. Oh, Keithley, <laughs> to inquire. Yeah, I, I counted. I counted about six Missouris. In the... I, you know, I said I love the. I, I said I love the way that he said. I love the fact that that's on the record. <laughs> that's fantastic. And I have no. That's it's Nix. It's Nixie. No it's not Nixa. Oh my goodness! You know Let's see. <laughs> You stirred him. I haven't had Listen, I've been studying this up. thing for like 24 hours. Nixon Clark. <laughs> yes, ma'am. It's the magic number, four. Mm, four. four. Uh, to inquire, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, so my question is, as a C CRNA, uh, what guidelines or what um, is set or training do they follow? Do they uh, mimic the... Uh, diagnosis or the or administer, administer the medicines based off of the anesthesia uh, anesthesia pathways that have been previously set, or how do they know um, how much to administer and when to administer? So, do they follow that pathway? Is my question. So that varies depending on the patient. You have to deal with patient age is a big factor. Patient sex is a big factor. Um, they're comorbidities, so what I may use on patient A, I may not use on patient B. Yeah, um, so I guess what my question is, um, previously, like if they have data that mm -hmm. says um, uh, a woman in labor gets this amount, mm -hmm. and, but where is that data coming from? Is it previously um, been proven by anesthesiologists that this is what, this is the, the tone that I is am set? not the one to ask that question. Okay. Uh, student, student. CRNA, so. <laughs> well, after, what, five and a half hours, I think I'm certified to become yeah, a CRNA pretty, now. <laughs> you can ask any question. I just may not answer it. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you so yes, much. Thank you very much. Uh, other questions? Representative Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, to inquire. Go ahead. 
Well, I just want to thank you for coming and um, your dedication and your education and coming here and sitting here for so many hours. I think your testimony was spot on. I think you wrapped this up uh, really, really nicely. Uh, we, I guess, speaking for myself, I certainly want to keep all of you all here in Missouri. Um, you know, we you've identified the workforce crisis we've had. We've talked about the healthcare crisis. You can go to any neighboring state. Um, so certainly we can... My goal is to get this across the finish line and keep you all here in Missouri or I Missouri. Would, I would love to stay. <laughs> I would absolutely love to stay, but they've got pretty good duck hunting in South Dakota. So, <laughs> Representative Greg. Well, I'm a little bit biased here, but uh, you are very uh, eloquent in your presentation. Again, I uh, personally would like to keep you here where you're at. Your mama and daddy raised you well, I can tell. Uh, he is one of my constituents. So, um, <laughs> No, um, Mad and for votes. <laughs> uh, wanted to beat that three minute. <laughs> there we go. Um, you, we sat down just the other day, real quick. Here, tell me, real quick, and I, I apologize here because it's late. You gave me a, a rundown of how you spend time with your patients. Can you really quick give us that, real quick? In regards to uh, as an ICU nurse or as uh, surgery, I think is what oh, we were so talking surgery. about. Yeah. Um, as, we do pre-op, and then as soon as I walk in there and I'm like, hey, I'm Zach, I'm going to be your student nurse today. I've got one week of training, you know, <laughs> yeah. along those lines. <laughs> um, I am with them until I send them off to pack you. So whether that be a 30-minute procedure, whether that be several hours, that patient's life is my sole responsibility. Once I per push certain medications, I have bought that airway. I am breathing for that patient. I'm making sure, making sure that they stay alive. Um, and I do that in a safe manner. I don't just arbitrarily look at a patient and say, I, I could probably give them this amount of drug. No, I'm thinking critically. Like I said, 13,000 hours where I managed drips that could potentially kill people. Your heart would explode. Your heart would stop. You just never wake up. Um, so I would like to think that although I'm not a medical doctor, I would like to think that that measly 13,000 hours accounts for something. So, Thank you very much. Further questions? If not, thank you, and we appreciate your time and effort and all your nursing colleagues. Is your mic on? I'd like to thank both CRNAs and anesthesiologists for their safe, quality, patient-centered care that we provide for all constituents in the state of Missouri. Uh, I also want to thank CRNAs and anesthesiologists for, uh, you know, their focus on, on, on research, continued education, and clinical excellence within the state of Missouri. There are a couple of points I'd like to clarify with the committee before we conclude our evening. Um, the first is the, the map or the handout uh, presented by the Missouri uh, Society of Anesthesiologists. It's the red and green map, I believe. And they discuss that 48 of the 50 states have language regarding supervision, medical direction, or physician involvement. And I just want to clarify and assure the committee that with the legislation as it's written, that will not change with this map. Uh, this bill has provisions regarding physician involvement of the podiatrist, surgeon, or dentist and again, we don't operate within a silo when we take care of patients. We all work together for a team to, again, provide that high-quality patient-centered care. Uh, and with that, are there any questions? Anybody have questions? If not, thank you very much for your testimony. Well, thank you all for your time. Is there anybody in opposition left? Is there anybody for uh, information only left? Is there anybody still out there? No. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. We appreciate your attention. Question? You bet. You can come up here. You have to fill out a form.
Okay, feel a lot to testimony, we appreciate it. <laughs> it for information only. If not, the uh, 329, the hearing on 329 is closed. Thank you very much.